Number sixty eight, author unknown. From All the Year Round, Volume Ten. This is recorded to celebrate the eighth anniversary of LibriVox. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The nine thirty p.m. train had left me on the platform of the Carlisle station. I was on my way to Glasgow and had resolved to break the journey by sleeping at the railway hotel because it had a convenient entrance from the platform. As I was seeing my luggage put on a truck, a middle-aged portly man of gentlemanlike manner and with a fine full voice came up to where I stood and commenced an elaborate search among the pile of baggage for a trunk he had lost a black trunk with white diamonds on it he expressed himself vexed and distressed at having lost it and seemed quite unable to determine what course to pursue i sympathized with him and went with him to the telegraph office where he telegraphed to dover for the lost luggage what hotel do you go to said the stranger in a deep rich comfortable voice i replied to the railway hotel as i leave by the six fifteen train in the morning for glasgow that is my train and my destination said the stranger so i will go to the same hotel he was a stout man standing above five feet seven neatly dressed in a dark frock coat lemon-coloured marsala waistcoat and black neckcloth he wore the sharp standing collars of the last fashion but one and carried an umbrella a telescope and an air cushion in one hand while the fingers of the other hand played with a heavy steel watch chain he was a man with large well-defined features bushy eyebrows and a rather coarse but humorous mouth when he lifted his hat i saw that he was rather bald and had a scar high up on his left temple beds said the lady at the hotel bar running her finger up and down a large black multiplication table covered with white figures with mysterious keys hanging below each of them like fruit on the stem while she was pursuing this task with the air of conferring a favour rather than of welcoming guests the stranger who had already introduced himself to me as mr thistlewood whispered in my ear do the custom-house officers take bribes i saw of course that he meant this as a joke and i laughed <laughs> of course not i said they'll pass our luggage directly mr thistlewood was evidently a born humorist for not the slightest returned smile dimpled his face as he replied well so i thought they'll search it more completely i suppose when we get to tibet excellent satirist he meant to ridicule our absurd custom-house restrictions and to glance incidentally at the speed of modern travelling as if carlyle were only the first station on some great and perilous journey we were about to undertake sixty-seven and sixty-eight john said the lady handing the keys to the porter who instantly shouldered my trunk and began to ascend the staircase would you order dinner sir he said as he let the portmanteau drop at the door of sixty seven dinner for two i answer glancing at my new friend and as soon as possible what'll you have sir soup a whiting or so and a roast fowl exactly said my friend uh, sorry sir said the porter to mr thistlewood that there's no glass in your room sir chambermaid broke it yesterday get you one directly sir no 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 said my companion rather irritably i never allow glass in my room bring a glass and i leave the house as he said this he smiled at me as much as to say this is a joke of mine to startle the porter oh of course not if you don't wish sir said the porter shutting me in sixty seven and leading mr thistlewood into number sixty eight to wash dress and put on slippers after a long journey is a great pleasure my room sixty seven had a side door opening into sixty eight and as my washing-stand stood near it 
I could not help hearing my eccentric friend talking to himself as he took off his boots. All that I could distinguish, however, were these remarkable words. The discrimination of logic by Jack Shepherd, as the homology of thought from psychology, as the phenomenology of mind, as Dr. Johnson very truly said to Tipu Saib, will not hold. Shalabala! This shalabala was shouted so loud that I thought it right to answer the humorist or actor or ventriloquist or professor or whatever he might be. I tapped at the door. How about Tibet now? replied a voice, and then there came a curious chuckling laugh, and the question, ho, 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 Do you understand conic fluxions? Not a bit, I answered, and what's more, I never even heard of them. No more did Hegel he replied, till the Bampton professor came and proved by arithmetic that Moses was wrong about the height of the pyramids. What inexhaustible fancy! There was a tap at my door. Dinner's ready, sir. All right, I replied. We'll be down directly. I was down first, and Thistlewood was not long after me. The soup came in, and my companion superintended the tureen. Soup? said he. I nodded in the affirmative. "'Do you profess ontology or dentology?' said he. "'For as I took off my boots just now, it seemed to me that you were one of those persons who would smile at the baseless dialectic of Plato and deride the irrational logic of Hegel. "'Waiter, you've forgotten the bread. Stale!' "'Pardon me, sir, but I am an enthusiast, as you have perhaps already guessed.' "'A great humorist,' I said, laughing, "'and a man of science, I am sure.' "'You're right, sir, you're right,' said my friend rather vociferously. "'Cayenne pepper, waiter. "'I have devoted years in my professor's rooms in St. B's "'to studying the solar spot and the causes of the sun's heat. I have also only yesterday discovered a clue. To what, do you think, sir? Tell the cook, waiter, there is too much salt in this soup. I really cannot guess. No, thank you, no more soup. Perpetual motion, that's all, said my eccentric friend coolly as he removed the cover of the fish. I'll explain it to you in a moment with pieces of bread. This crust is D. That is a rod fixed by one end to a beam supporter, while these bits of crumb, A, B, and C, this big one, C, are three pairs of levers forming a parallelopidon. This spoon is D, the piston rod attached to H, the salt cellar. This knife E is the hot water pump connected with the parallel motion at F. This fork... I suppose I looked rather wandering, for my new friend here took mercy on me. I see, he said. You don't follow my definitions. I will explain it better after dinner, with French plums on a clear table. Leg or wing? My friend was a mastermind, that was quite evident. How could I expect to follow the flights of such a mind? Potato? Thank you. It was I, he said who invented the Papin's digester, Arnott's stove, and the Argon lamp, but they've robbed me of them all. It was I who discovered the plan of watertight bulkheads, the paddle-box lifeboat, Ely's cartridges, and the percussion cap, but they robbed me, sir, of everything. Glory, three per cent, Real del Monte, Mexicans, everything. They'd burn me if they could, because I anticipated them with the sewing machine, the oyster opener, the screw boot jack, and the apple pip crusher. You're not the first inventor, I said, laughing at the eccentric variety of my friend's studies, who has been robbed of his due fame. Look at Galileo. 
i knew him said thistlewood he lived in st mary axe and sold stationery he was of a green complexion some more fowl sir the naivete of this remark made me laugh in spite of myself if you please a drumstick will do i presume from that remark you entertain some eccentric notions about transmigration of course i do i call all men who die divers they return but i know them again different names and professions but lord bless you the same faces and manners oh i've got my eye on the divers there's a butcher lives opposite me fat square face little eyes like a prize pig stands straddling at his door with his hands on his waist people call that man jackson of number thirty three whitechapel road who do you think he really is can't guess henry the eighth simply henry the eighth nero is a prize-fighter francis the first is on the stock exchange socrates keeps a cheese shop on ludgate hill tamerlane writes for a sunday paper marlborough is now an omnibus conductor oh i've got my eye on them i nearly fell off my chair laughing robespierre cuts hair louis the eleventh is a dissenting minister and bossuet edits hood's works oh i know them i know their faces they can't deceive me here the conversation dropped for the waiter brought in some sherry we had ordered when we had helped ourselves had nodded and sipped our wine this extraordinary man asked were you ever up in a balloon i never had that pleasure a pleasure indeed said the enthusiast but i once had a most remarkable escape some villain jealous of my fame substituted fulminating mercury for the sand usually used for ballast luckily i was taken ill the night before the man who went up in my place by a special providence when half a mile high just over lambeth was blown to a cinder his watch fell in a garden near norwood and was given me as a keepsake here it is you observe the dent on the right hand side that's where it struck a milkman who was walking up to the back door at the time i don't see the dent said i looking closely but here is the name of the maker that's dent mr thistlewood exploded with laughter oh you sharp fellow he said you see in a moment when i'm drawing the long bow pass the wine that insatiable tongue began to tire the day's excitement and the fatigues of the journey began to tell we both grew silent and sipped contemplatively first i yawned then my friend yawned and looked at the candles on the sideboard then we lighted up again about the american war about the wrongs of poland about mexico about the cruel amusements now in vogue about sensational books and other matters finally we went upstairs together and shook hands at my bedroom door i had blown out the light and was just tumbling into bed when my conscience smote me i had forgotten to wind up my watch i instantly opened my bedroom door and relighted my candle at the little blue jet of gas burning in the corridor then going back into my room and shutting the door i took down my coat and searched my pockets for my keys i dived and brought up bradshaw a pocket handkerchief and a rumpled ball of paper which being smoothed out revealed itself as an ill-treated copy of the times as it lay before me on the drawers just as i was bending down to blow out the candle my eye fell on an advertisement at the top of the second column seeing the words caution to hotel keepers it remained riveted there until i had devoured every syllable 
the terrible advertisement that seemed suddenly to turn my heart into a large lump of ice ran thus caution to hotel keepers an insane gentleman of middling stature stout rather bald black hair and bushy eyebrows dressed in black frock coat and marsala waistcoat carrying a few papers an air cushion and an umbrella is going about seeking accommodation with anybody who will trust him he has no means and is dangerous information leading to his discovery given to mr oxford newsagent clerkenwell shall be rewarded good heavens thought i as the paper dropped from my hands a dangerous maniac in the room next to me shall i alarm the house no that on second consideration i thought unadvisable for should i be mistaken in my companion's identity i should lay myself open to an action for defamation false imprisonment or some other horrible thing of that kind besides madmen were only dangerous i said to myself under provocation and on their special topics he might fancy himself emperor of china or a land turtle a washing basin or a cucumber but there was no great harm in that no i would shake off these fears perhaps after all utterly groundless lock the doors and sleep soundly until boots called me for the early train once away in the train i could easily cross-examine my companion in such a way as to elicit his insanity if it really existed and could then act accordingly i determined however before going to bed to reconnoitre so i quietly stole barefoot to the door of communication between the two bedrooms in order to listen i put my ear to a chink and could hear a drowsy voice as of a man almost asleep droning nonsense verses and weights and measures thus if a is to be what d is to see according to bones deductions then f is to me what o is to p that's my theory of conic fluxion then the voice stopped like clockwork run out a moment after it continued more drowsily ten gold it chippos equal ten gold copangs fifteen mass equal one it chippo one noban equal three copangs one kodama equal fifteen fifteen condarines one mana goga equal ten thousand ikma goga one tatami equal here the voice stopped and a tremendous sonorous snore followed the man was mad that was evident but he was harmless and he was asleep i felt in the darkness for i had blown out the candle for the key there was none so i contented myself with quietly placing two chairs in such a way as that no one could open the door without moving them and awaking me i then took out the key of my own bedroom door placed it under my pillow and jumped into bed for some twenty minutes i sat up listening to the heavy snoring of mr thistlewood I then lay down, fell asleep, and dreamed. Presently a low creaking noise awoke me, and I started up in bed. Yes, it was the maniac. There were the chairs moving slowly back, and there was the door opening wider and wider. Well, he might be restless and curious and yet mean no harm. He might be sleepwalking and yet be amiable and tractable my bed was far from the door so i turned my head towards the door rolled it in the bedclothes leaving only one eye clear and lay as still as a mummy the door opened and thistlewood entered on tiptoe 
he was in his long nightgown but there was nothing else spectral about him he had his boots on his face was red and his smile was as pleasant as ever it was just daybreak and the cold pure grey light showed him clearly to me as he pulled up the blinds and looked around with great curiosity but perfect composure he was talking to himself kepler he said you invented the pendulum bacon you discovered turtle soup rumford you invented the patent shaving box but you are all fools compared to me for i discovered the egg whipping machine the oyster opener the knife cleaner and betsy's brandy all of a sudden the reflection of himself in my pier-glass caught his eye and the sight of it seemed to drive him to fury he lifted his right foot and drove it through the glass which shivered it into a thousand pieces then in a moment he broke the legs off two chairs and shattered the second glass the washing-jug and the glass over the fireplace i know you he cried i know you you have been following me about for years you dog me everywhere i see you in the sunshine in the moonlight on the walls on the ceiling in the silver spoons in the aquarium in the shop windows everywhere and everywhere i will thus beat and smash you hell-born image of myself as he said this he pounded the fragments almost to dust danced on them and laughed as they splashed round him then seizing a huge hatchet-shaped fragment of plate glass he cried looking towards my bed but where is that wretch who denied last night that i invented perpetual motion it was he who filled this room with images to vex and dog me stop i'll go and get my razor it will do it cleaner the moment he darted into his own room i leapt out of bed rushed into the corridor and quietly locked my door on the outside then i tried the key in his and finding it fitted i locked his door too i heard him scream and howl drag down the bed curtains and rush at the door and kick and thump and cut at the wood with his razor as he cried forty days i have been in the wilderness newton let me out and bring me a boiled pelican kepler some brandy and water and tell the landlord flamstead there's a man run away here without paying for his bed cut his throat i tell you for he says i didn't discover perpetual motion i ran to the end of the corridor where some twenty bells hung i beat on them all till every person in the hotel came to my help landlord waiters chambermaids ostlers guests everybody i told them of my narrow escape and of the madman and we then arranged to secure him by flinging blankets over him when we opened the door and rushed in we did secure the man after a tremendous struggle for his strength was superhuman we then tied his hands behind him and sent for the police to put a straight waistcoat on him and take him into custody next day his keepers arrived and took charge of him it appeared that he was a professor of st bees a scientific inventor who had gone mad partly from overstudy but still more from being rejected by a lady ever since that rejection he had taken it into his head that he was so superhumanly hideous that no one male or female could bear to look at him and he had in consequence taken a marked hatred to all mirrors and looking-glasses which he made a rule of destroying wherever he found them end of number sixty eight author unknown Recorded by Ruth Golding Eight Brand New Bits of Christmas Cheer by John Kendrick Bangs This is recorded to celebrate the 8th anniversary of LibriVox. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org 1. Send me by Santa Claus one single smile and help me make it Christmas all the while. 2. 
I just can't see, to tell you true, how they spelt Christmas without you. For as for me, there is no doubt, it wouldn't be Christmas with you left out. 3. A New Year's Wish May the only shadows that you see before you be those caused by the sun of fortune shining upon your back, and your tears those only of joy and laughter. 4. May every hour of Christmas Day strew life's best gifts along your way, and when the new year comes, why then, may the supply begin again. 5. The golden argosy of my affection is sailing to you over the seas of life, and waits but on the Christmas tide to float it to the harbour of your heart. 6. If you would set my heart aglow, come stand beneath my mistletoe. I'll show you there, with all my powers, how bees sip honey from the flowers. 7. The air is not vast enough to carry my wireless wishes of joy to you, so take this card as a simple statement of your balance of love in the bank of my heart. 8. The best of crafts for Christmas tides is a friendship that will sure abide the storm and stress of life's troubled sea. Such is the craft that I send to thee. End of Eight Brand New Bits of Christmas Cheer by John Kendrick Bangs Read by Charlotte Duckett The Hunting of the Snark An Agony in Eight Fits by Lewis Carroll This is recorded to celebrate the eighth anniversary of LibriVox. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Inscribed to a dear child, in memory of golden summer hours and whispers of a summer sea. Girt with boyish garb for boyish task, eager she wields her spade, yet loves as well rest on a friendly knee, intent to ask the tale he loves to tell. Rude spirits of the seething outer strife, unmeet to read her pure and simple sprite. Deem, if you list, such hours a waste of life, empty of all delight. Chat on, sweet maid, and rescue from annoy hearts that by wiser folk are unbeguiled. Ah, happy he who owns that tenderest joy, the heart love of a child. Away, fond thoughts, and vex my soul no more. Work claims my wakeful nights, my busy days, albeit bright memories of that sunlit shore yet haunt my dreaming gaze. Preface If, and the thing is wildly possible, the charge of writing nonsense were ever brought against the author of this brief but instructive poem, it would be based, I feel convinced, on the line in page 18, then the bowsprit got mixed with the rudder sometimes. In view of this painful possibility, I will not, as I might, appeal indignantly to my other writings as a proof that I am incapable of such a deed. I will not, as I might, point to the strong moral purpose of this poem itself, to the arithmetical principles so cautiously inculcated in it, or to its noble teachings in natural history. I will take the more prosaic course of simply explaining how it happened. The bellman, who was almost morbidly sensitive about appearances, used to have the bowsprit unshipped once or twice a week to be revarnished, and it more than once happened when the time came for replacing it that no one on board could remember which end of the ship it belonged to. They knew it was not of the slightest use to appeal to the bellman about it, he would only refer to his naval code and read out in pathetic tones admiralty instructions which none of them had ever been able to understand. So it generally ended in its being fastened on, anyhow, across the rudder. The helmsman, footnote, this office was usually undertaken by the boots, who found in it a refuge from the baker's constant complaints about the insufficient blacking of his three pairs of boots. The helmsman used to stand by with tears in his eyes. He knew it was all wrong, but alas, Rule 42 of the Code, no one shall speak to the man at the helm, had been completed by the bellman himself with the words, and the man at the helm shall speak to no one. So remonstrance was impossible, 
and no steering could be done till the next varnishing day. During these bewildering intervals, the ship usually sailed backwards. As this poem is to some extent connected with the lay of the Jabberwock, let me take this opportunity of answering a question that has often been asked me. How to pronounce slithy toves? The I in slithy is long as in writhe, and toves is pronounced so as to rhyme with groves. Again, the first O in borogoves is pronounced like the O in borrow. I have heard people try to give it the sound of the O in worry. Such is human perversity. This also seems a fitting occasion to notice the other hard words in that poem. Humpty Dumpty's theory of two meanings packed into one word like a portmanteau seems to me the right explanation for all. For instance, take the two words fuming and furious. Make up your mind that you will say both words, but leave it unsettled which you will say first. Now open your mouth and speak. If your thoughts incline ever so little towards fuming, you will say fuming furious. If they turn by even a hair's breadth towards furious, you will say furious fuming. But if you have that rarest of gifts, a perfectly balanced mind, you will say frumious. Supposing that when Pistol uttered the well-known words, Under which king, Bazonian, speak or die? Justice Shallow had felt certain that it was either William or Richard, but had not been able to settle which, so that he could not possibly say either name before the other. Can it be doubted that rather than die, he would have gasped out, Rilchium! Fit the first, the landing. Just the place for a snark, the bellman cried, as he landed his crew with care, supporting each man on the top of the tide by a finger entwined in his hair. Just the place for a snark, I've said it twice, that alone should encourage the crew. Just the place for a snark, I've said it thrice, what I tell you three times is true. The crew was complete. It included a boots, a maker of bonnets and hoods, a barrister brought to arrange their disputes, and a broker to value their goods. A billiard marker, whose skill was immense, might perhaps have won more than his share, but a banker engaged at enormous expense had the whole of their cash in his care. There was also a beaver that paced on the deck, or would sit making lace in the bow, and had often, the bellman said, saved them from wreck, though none of the sailors knew how. There was one who was famed for the number of things he forgot when he entered the ship, his umbrella, his watch, all his jewels and rings, and the clothes he had brought for the trip. He had forty-two boxes, all carefully packed, with his name painted clearly on each, but since he omitted to mention the fact, they were all left behind on the beach. The loss of his clothes hardly mattered because he had seven coats on when he came, with three pair of boots, but the worst of it was, he had wholly forgotten his name. He would answer to hi, or to any loud cry, such as fry me, or fritter my wig, to what you may call him, or what was his name, but especially thingamajig. While for those who preferred a more forcible word, he had different names from these. His intimate friends called him Candle Ends, and his enemies Toasted Cheese. His form is ungainly, his intellect small, so the bellman would often remark, but his courage is perfect, and that, after all, is the thing that one needs with a snark. He would joke with hyenas, returning their stare with an impudent wag of the head, and he once went to walk, paw in paw with a bear, just to keep up its spirits, he said. He came as a baker, but owned when too late, and it drove the poor bellman half mad. He could only bake bride cake, for which, I may state, no materials were to be had. The last of the crew needs a special remark, though he looked an incredible dunce. He had just one idea, but that one being snark, the good bellman engaged him at once. He came as a butcher, 
but gravely declared when the ship had been sailing a week he could only kill beavers. The bellman looked scared, and was almost too frightened to speak. But at length he explained in a tremulous tone, there was only one beaver on board, and that was a tame one he had of his own, whose death would be deeply deplored. The beaver, who happened to hear the remark, protested with tears in its eyes, that not even the rapture of hunting the snark could atone for that dismal surprise. It strongly advised that the butcher should be conveyed in a separate ship, but the bellman declared that would never agree with the plans he had made for the trip. Navigation was always a difficult art, though with only one ship and one bell, and he feared he must really decline for his part, undertaking another as well. The beaver's best course was, no doubt, to procure a second-hand dagger-proof coat. So the baker advised it, and next, to ensure its life in some office of note. This the banker suggested, and offered for hire, on moderate terms, or for sale, two excellent policies, one against fire, and one against damage from hail. Yet still, ever after that sorrowful day, whenever the butcher was by, the beaver kept looking the opposite way, and appeared unaccountably shy. Fit the Second, The Bellman's Speech The bellman himself they all praised to the skies, such a carriage, such ease and such grace, such solemnity too, one could see he was wise, the moment one looked in his face. He had bought a large map representing the sea, without the least vestige of land, and the crew were much pleased when they found it to be, a map they could all understand. What's the good of Mercator's North Poles and Equators, tropic zones and meridian lines? So the bellman would cry, and the crew would reply, They are merely conventional signs. Other maps are such shapes with their islands and capes, but we've got our brave captain to thank. So the crew would protest that he's bought us the best, a perfect and absolute blank. This was charming, no doubt, but they shortly found out that the captain they trusted so well had only one notion for crossing the ocean, and that was to tingle his bell. He was thoughtful and grave, but the orders he gave were enough to bewilder a crew. When he cried, Steer to starboard, but keep ahead larboard. What on earth was the helmsman to do? Then the bowsprit got mixed with the rudder sometimes, a thing, as the bellman remarked, that frequently happens in tropical climes when a vessel is, so to speak, snarked. But the principal failing occurred in the sailing, and the bellman, perplexed and distressed, said he had hoped, at least, when the wind blew due east, that the ship would not travel due west. But the danger was past, they had landed at last, with their boxes, portmanteaus and bags. Yet at first sight the crew were not pleased with the view, which consisted of chasms and crags. The bellman perceived that their spirits were low, and repeated in musical tone some jokes he had kept for a season of woe, but the crew would do nothing but groan. He served out some grog with a liberal hand, and bade them sit down on the beach, and they could not but own that their captain looked grand as he stood and delivered his speech. Friends, Romans, and countrymen, lend me your ears. They were all of them fond of quotations. So they drank to his health and they gave him three cheers, while he served out additional rations. We have sailed many months, we have sailed many weeks. Four weeks to the month you may mark, but never as yet, tis your captain who speaks, have we caught the least glimpse of a snark. We have sailed many weeks, we have sailed many days, Seven days to the week, I allow, but a snark on the which we might lovingly gaze we have never beheld till now. Come listen, my men, while I tell you again the five unmistakable marks by which you may know, wheresoever you go, the warranted genuine snarks. Let us take them in order. The first is the taste, which is meagre and hollow, but crisp, like a coat that is rather too tight in the waist, with a flavour of will-o'-the-wisp. 
It's habit of getting up late, you'll agree, that it carries too far, when I say that it frequently breakfasts at five o'clock tea, and dines on the following day. The third is its slowness in taking a jest. Should you happen to venture on one, it will sigh like a thing that is deeply distressed, and it always looks grave at a pun. The fourth is its fondness for bathing machines, which it constantly carries about, and believes that they add to the beauty of scenes, a sentiment open to doubt. The fifth is ambition. It next will be right to describe each particular batch, distinguishing those that have feathers and bite from those that have whiskers and scratch. For although common snarks do no manner of harm, yet I feel it my duty to say, some are boojums. The bellman broke off in alarm, for the baker had fainted away. Fit the Third The Baker's Tale They roused him with muffins, they roused him with ice, they roused him with mustard and cress, they roused him with jam and judicious advice, they set him conundrums to guess. When at length he sat up and was able to speak, his sad story he offered to tell, and the bellman cried, Silence! Not even a shriek, and excitedly tingled his bell. There was silence supreme, not a shriek, not a scream, scarcely even a howl or a groan, as the man they called Ho told his story of woe in an antediluvian tone. My father and mother were honest, though poor. Skip all that, cried the bellman in haste. If it once becomes dark, there's no chance of a snark. We have hardly a minute to waste. I skip forty years, said the baker in tears, and proceed without further remark to the day when you took me aboard of your ship to help you in hunting the snark. A dear uncle of mine, after whom I was named, remarked when I bade him farewell. Oh, skip your dear uncle, the bellman exclaimed, as he angrily tingled his bell. He remarked to me then, said that mildest of men, if your snark be a snark, that is right. Fetch it home by all means. You may serve it with greens, and it's handy for striking a light. You may seek it with thimbles, and seek it with care. You may hunt it with forks and hope. You may threaten its life with a railway share. You may charm it with smiles and soap. That's exactly the method, the bellman bold in a hasty parenthesis cried. That's exactly the way I've always been told, that the capture of Snark should be tried. But, oh, beamish nephew, beware of the day, if your Snark be a boojum, for then you will softly and suddenly vanish away and never be met with again. It is this, it is this that oppresses my soul when I think of my uncle's last words, and my heart is like nothing so much as a bowl brimming over with quivering curds. It is this, it is this, we have had that before, the bellman indignantly said, and the baker replied, let me say it once more, it is this, it is this, that I dread. I engage with the snark every night after dark, in a dreamy delirious fight. I serve it with greens in those shadowy scenes, and I use it for striking a light. But if ever I meet with a boojum, that day, in a moment, of this I am sure, I shall softly and suddenly vanish away, and the notion I cannot endure. Fit the Fourth, The Hunting The bellman looked offish, and wrinkled his brow. If only he had spoken before, it's excessively awkward to mention it now, with the snark, so to speak, at the door. We should all of us grieve, as you may well believe, if you never were met with again. But surely, my man, when the voyage began, you might have suggested it then. It is excessively awkward to mention it now, as I think I've already remarked. And the man they called Hi replied with a sigh, I informed you the day we embarked. You may charge me with murder, or want of sense. We are all of us weak at times. 
but the slightest approach to a false pretense was never among my crimes. I said it in Hebrew, I said it in Dutch, I said it in German and Greek, but I wholly forgot, and it vexes me much, that English is what you speak. "'Tis a pitiful tale,' said the bellman, whose face had grown longer at every word. "'But now that you've stated the whole of your case, more debate would be simply absurd. "'The rest of my speech,' he explained to his men, "'you shall hear when I've leisure to speak it. "'But the snark is at hand. Let me tell you again, "'tis your glorious duty to seek it. "'To seek it with thimbles, to seek it with care, "'to pursue it with forks and hope.' to threaten its life with a railway share, to charm it with smiles and soap. For the snark's a peculiar creature that won't be caught in a commonplace way. Do all that you know, and try all that you don't. Not a chance must be wasted today. For England expects, I forbear to proceed, tis a maxim tremendous but trite, and you'd best be unpacking the things that you need. "'to rig yourselves out for the fight.' "'Then the banker endorsed a blank cheque, "'which he crossed, and changed his loose silver for notes. "'The baker, with care, combed his whiskers and hair, "'and shook the dust out of his coats. "'The boots and the broker were sharpening a spade, "'each working the grindstone in turn, "'but the beaver went on making lace "'and displayed no interest in the concern.' Though the barrister tried to appeal to its pride and vainly proceeded to cite a number of cases in which making laces had been proved an infringement of right. The maker of bonnets ferociously planned a novel arrangement of bows, while the billiard marker, with quivering hand, was chalking the tip of his nose. But the butcher turned nervous and dressed himself fine, with yellow kid gloves and a ruff said he felt it exactly like going to dine, which the bellman declared was all stuff. "'Introduce me now, there's a good fellow,' he said, "'if we happen to meet it together.' And the bellman, sagaciously nodding his head, said, "'That must depend on the weather.' The beaver went simply galumphing about at seeing the butcher so shy, and even the baker, though stupid and stout, made an effort to wink with one eye. "'Be a man,' said the bellman in wrath, as he heard the butcher beginning to sob. "'Should we meet with a jub-jub, that desperate bird? "'We shall need all our strength for the job.' Fit the Fifth, The Beaver's Lesson They sought it with thimbles, they sought it with care, They pursued it with forks and hope, They threatened its life with a railway share, They charmed it with smiles and soap. Then the butcher contrived an ingenious plan for making a separate sally, and had fixed on a spot unfrequented by man, a dismal and desolate valley. But the very same plan to the beaver occurred, it had chosen the very same place, yet neither betrayed, by a sign or a word, the disgust that appeared in his face. Each thought he was thinking of nothing but snark, and the glorious work of the day, and each tried to pretend that he did not remark that the other was going that way. But the valley grew narrower and narrower still, and the evening got darker and colder, till, merely from nervousness, not from goodwill, they marched along shoulder to shoulder. Then a scream, shrill and high, rent the shuddering sky, and they knew that some danger was near. The beaver turned pale to the tip of its tail, and even the butcher felt queer. He thought of his childhood, left far, far behind, that blissful and innocent state, the sound so exactly recalled to his mind, a pencil that squeaks on a slate. "'Tis the voice of the jub-jub,' he suddenly cried, this man that they used to call Dunce. "'As the bellman would tell you,' he added with pride, "'I have uttered that sentiment once.' "'Tis the note of the jub-jub. Keep count, I entreat. You will find I have told it you twice. "'Tis the song of the jub-jub. The proof is complete, if only I've stated it thrice.' The beaver had counted with scrupulous care, 
attending to every word, but it fairly lost heart and outgrabe in despair when the third repetition occurred. It felt that in spite of all possible pains it had somehow contrived to lose count, and the only thing now was to rack its poor brains by reckoning up the amount. Two added to one, if that could but be done, it said, with one's fingers and thumbs, recollecting with tears how, in earlier years, it had taken no pains with its sums. The thing can be done, said the butcher. I think the thing must be done, I am sure. The thing shall be done. Bring me paper and ink. The best there is time to procure. The beaver brought paper, portfolio, pens, and ink in unfailing supplies, while strange creepy creatures came out of their dens and watched them with wondering eyes. So engrossed was the butcher, he heeded them not, as he wrote with a pen in each hand, and explained all the while, in a popular style, which the beaver could well understand. Taking three as the subject to reason about, a convenient number to state, we add seven and ten, then multiply out by one thousand, diminished by eight. The result we proceed to divide, as you see, by nine hundred and ninety-two, then subtract seventeen, and the answer must be exactly and perfectly true, the method employed I would gladly explain, while I have it so clear in my head, if I had but the time, and you had but the brain, but much yet remains to be said. In one moment I have seen what has hitherto been enveloped in absolute mystery, and without extra charge I will give you at large a lesson in natural history. In his genial way he proceeded to say, forgetting all laws of propriety, and that giving instruction without introduction would have caused quite a thrill in society. As to temper, the jubjub's a desperate bird, since it lives in perpetual passion. Its taste in costume is entirely absurd. It is ages ahead of the fashion. But it knows any friend it has met once before. It never will look at a bribe, and in charity meetings it stands at the door and collects, though it does not subscribe. Its flavour when cooked is more exquisite far than mutton or oysters or eggs. Some think it keeps best in an ivory jar, and some in mahogany kegs. You boil it in sawdust, you salt it in glue, you condense it with locusts and tape, still keeping one principal object in view to preserve its symmetrical shape. The butcher would gladly have talked till next day, but he felt that the lesson must end and he wept with delight in attempting to say he considered the beaver his friend. While the beaver confessed, with affectionate looks, more eloquent even than tears, it had learned in ten minutes, far more than all books, would have taught it in seventy years. They returned hand in hand, and the bellman, unmanned, for a moment with noble emotion, said, This amply repays all the wearisome days, we have spent on the billowy ocean. Such friends as the beaver and butcher became have seldom, if ever, been known. In winter or summer, it was always the same. You could never meet either alone. And when quarrels arose, as one frequently finds, quarrels will, spite of every endeavour, the song of the jub-jub recurred to their minds and cemented their friendship for ever. Fit the Sixth, The Barrister's Dream They sought it with thimbles, they sought it with care, They pursued it with forks and hope, They threatened its life with a railway share, They charmed it with smiles and soap. But the barrister, weary of proving in vain That the beaver's lace-making was wrong, Fell asleep, and in dreams saw the creature quite plain, that his fancy had dwelt on so long. He dreamed that he stood in a shadowy court, where the snark with a glass in its eye, dressed in gown, bands and wig, was defending a pig on the charge of deserting its sty. The witnesses proved, without error or flaw, that the sty was deserted when found, and the judge kept explaining the state of the law in a soft undercurrent of sound. 
The indictment had never been clearly expressed, and it seemed that the snark had begun and spoken three hours before anyone guessed what the pig was supposed to have done. The jury had each formed a different view long before the indictment was read, and they all spoke at once so that none of them knew one word that the others had said. You must know, said the judge, but the snark exclaimed, Fudge! That statute is obsolete quite. Let me tell you, my friends, the whole question depends on an ancient manorial right. In the matter of treason, the pig would appear to have aided, but scarcely abetted. While the charge of insolvency fails, it is clear, if you grant the plea, never indebted. The fact of desertion I will not dispute, but its guilt, as I trust, is removed, so far as relates to the cost of this suit, by the alibi which has been proved. My poor client's fate now depends on your votes. Here the speaker sat down in his place, and directed the judge to refer to his notes, and briefly to sum up the case. But the judge said he never had summed up before, so the snark undertook it instead, and summed it so well that it came to far more than the witnesses ever had said. When the verdict was called for, the jury declined, as the word was so puzzling to spell, but they ventured to hope that the snark wouldn't mind undertaking that duty as well. So the snark found the verdict, although as it owned, it was spent with the toils of the day. When it said the word, Guilty! The jury all groaned, and some of them fainted away. Then the snark pronounced sentence, the judge being quite too nervous to utter a word. When it rose to its feet, there was silence like night, and the fall of a pin might be heard. Transportation for life! was the sentence it gave, and then, to be fined forty pound, the jury all cheered, though the judge said he feared that the phrase was not legally sound. But their wild exultation was suddenly checked, when the jailer informed them with tears. Such a sentence would have not the slightest effect, as the pig had been dead for some years. The judge left the court, looking deeply disgusted, but the snark, though a little aghast, as the lawyer to whom the defence was entrusted went bellowing on to the last. Thus the barrister dreamed, while the bellowing seemed to grow every moment more clear, till he woke to the knell of a furious bell, which the bellman rang close at his ear. Fit the Seventh, The Banker's Fate They sought it with thimbles, they sought it with care, they pursued it with forks and hope. They threatened its life with a railway share. They charmed it with smiles and soap. And the banker, inspired with a courage so new, it was matter for general remark, rushed madly ahead and was lost to their view in his zeal to discover the snark. But while he was seeking with thimbles and care, a bandersnatch swiftly drew nigh, and grabbed at the banker, who shrieked in despair, for he knew it was useless to fly. He offered large discount, he offered a cheque, drawn to bearer for seven pounds ten, but the bandersnatch merely extended its neck, and grabbed at the banker again. Without rest or pause, while those frumious jaws went savagely snapping around, he skipped and he hopped and he floundered and flopped, till fainting he fell to the ground. The bandersnatch fled as the others appeared, led on by that fear-stricken yell, and the bellman remarked, It's just as I feared, and solemnly tolled on his bell. He was black in the face, and they scarcely could trace the least likeness to what he had been, while so great was his fright that his waistcoat turned white, a wonderful thing to be seen. To the horror of all who were present that day, he uprose in full evening dress, and with senseless grimaces endeavoured to say what his tongue could no longer express. Down he sank in a chair, ran his hands through his hair, and chanted in mimsiest tones, words whose utter inanity proved his insanity while he rattled a couple of bones. 
Leave him here to his fate. It is getting so late, the bellman exclaimed in a fright. We have lost half the day. Any further delay, and we shan't catch a snark before night. Fit the Eighth The Vanishing They sought it with thimbles, they sought it with care, they pursued it with forks and hope, they threatened its life with a railway share. They charmed it with smiles and soap. They shuddered to think that the chase might fail, and the beaver, excited at last, went bounding along on the tip of its tail, for the daylight was nearly past. There is Thingam, Bob shouting, the bellman said. He is shouting like mad, only hark! He is waving his hands, he is wagging his head. He has certainly found a snark. They gazed in delight while the butcher exclaimed, He was always a desperate wag. They beheld him, their baker, their hero unnamed, On the top of a neighbouring crag. Erect and sublime for one moment of time, In the next, that wild figure they saw, As if stung by a spasm, plunge into a chasm, while they waited and listened in awe. "'It's a snark!' was the sound that first came to their ears, and seemed almost too good to be true. Then followed a torrent of laughter and cheers, then the ominous words, "'It's a boo!' Then silence. Some fancied they heard in the air a weary and wandering sigh, that sounded like chum, but the others declare it was only a breeze that went by. They hunted till darkness came on, but they found not a button or feather or mark by which they could tell that they stood on the ground where the baker had met with the snark. In the midst of the word he was trying to say, in the midst of his laughter and glee, he had softly and suddenly Vanished away, for the snark was a boojum, you see. End of The Hunting of the Snark An Agony in Eight Fits by Lewis Carroll Read by Phil Benson Sonnet 8 by William Shakespeare this is recorded to celebrate the eighth anniversary of LibriVox. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Sonnet 8 Music to hear. Why hearst thou music sadly? Sweets with sweets war not. Joy delights in joy. Why lovest thou that which thou receivest not gladly, or else receivest with pleasure thine annoy? If the true concord of well-tuned sounds, by unions married, do offend thine ear, they do but sweetly chide thee, who confounds in singleness the parts that thou shouldst bear. Mark how one string, sweet husband to another, strikes each in each by mutual ordering, resembling sire and child and happy mother, who, all in one, one pleasing note do sing, whose speechless song, being many, seeming one, sings this to thee, Thou single wilt prove none. End of Sonnet 8 by William Shakespeare Read by Eden Ray Hedrick Chapter 35 of The Eight Oared Victors by Lester Chadwick This is recorded to celebrate the 8th anniversary of LibriVox. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Here they come, boys, get ready, yelled Bean Perkins, wildly waving his megaphone. Here they come. Oh, wow, shouted Joe Jackson, for the love of Caesar, tell us who's ahead. It's hard to see from here, but I think. Oh, who cares what you think, interrupted a lad. Don't give us any false information. Get ready, boys, cried Bean again. The college cheer when they get opposite the old boathouse. And then the Conquer or Die song. We've got to pull them on. All was excitement. A hundred voices mingled in expressions of hopes and fears. The rival college tears blended into one riotous conglomeration of sound. 
the three shells were sweeping on to victory. Victory for just one. Oh, Madge, cried Ruth. I daren't look. Here, you take the field glasses and tell me who's ahead. Her own college colors slipped from her dress unheeded, and there was disclosed the tiny knot of Randall's maroon and yellow. Ruth, expostulated Mabel, as she pointed to the traitorous hues. I don't care, replied Ruth, as her hand went to where her restored brooch was at her throat. Who's ahead? demanded Helen Newton, as Madge peered through the glasses. Fairview! What? She is! She is! Oh, girls! Fairview is going to win! Who? Who is second? demanded Mabel. Randall! came the reply. Then there was silence. The girls looked at one another. What they thought, who shall say? On came the three shells. The cheers increased. There was a din of horns and rattles. The band played madly. No one knew what the tune was and cared less. Steady all, cried Jerry, as he noticed a tendency to quicken. Steady all! On came the Randall shell. Just a little to her rear was Boxer Hall, struggling desperately and with breaking hearts to offset the disadvantage of overtraining and overconfidence. For that is just what it amounted to. It looked hopeless for them now. As for Fairview, she had maintained the lead she had unexpectedly gained over Randall, and the eager, almost bursting hearts in the boat hoped that the coeducational college could row it out onto the end. But there was no disguising the fact to themselves that they were rowing against such a rival as they had never before met. For a moment after Jerry had given the word to increase the stroke, his chums thought that he would keep them on that for a hundred yards or so, and then hit up the pace still faster. But he did not. Instead, coolly and calmly, he glanced critically at the Fairview shell, and kept on at the same rate. Hang it all, why doesn't he give the word to spurt, thought Frank, as his broad back rose and fell to the measured rhythm. We can do it. But Jerry was a wise little coxswain. Not for nothing had he spied out the course, so that he knew every foot of it, and by marks previously noted, he could tell exactly how far they were from the finish mark. Nearer and nearer to it came the eight-oared shells. Boxer Hall was struggling hard to pull up, but for once she had met her match. Two, in fact, for it was easy now to see that the race, barring accidents, lay between Randall and Fairview. And, oh, may we win, prayed Tom and his chums. And they could not understand why Jerry would not put them at their limit. True, their hearts were pumping at an abnormal rate, their muscles strained as they never had before, and their breath came labored and went out gaspingly. And then, when Cox and Jerry, with his eager eyes, saw a certain old gnarled tree on the river bank, and when he had noted that Fairview had added another stroke per minute, then, and not until then, did he give the word. He had slid down into his seat, feeling the tiller lines as a horseman feels with the reins the mouth of his pet racer. Gently, as if the shell were some delicate machine, did Jerry guide her on course. Now the time had come. Up he sat, like one electrified. Through the megaphone strapped to his mouth came the words, Row, boys! Row as you have never rowed before! Put all you can to the stroke! I call for thirty-five! Give it to him! Give it to him! It seemed as though the Randall shell was suddenly galvanized into action. Reaching forward over their toes, eight sturdy backs bent for the stroke. Then it came. A pull that seemed to lift the frail shell from the water. A pull that strained on the outriggers. A pull that made the stout oars creak and bend. A stroke that sent the water swirling aft in rings, circles, whirlpools, and a smother of foam. A stroke that told. Row! Row! screamed Jerry. Daring another glance, Frank, at stroke, saw the Fairview boat seemingly at a standstill. But it was not so. It was that Randall had shot up to her. From the shores, from the boathouse, from the other craft, came a riot of sound. Shouts, yells, the tooting of horns, the clatter of rattles. There was a veritable flower garden of waving colors. The shrill voices of the girls mingled with the hoarser shouts of the men and boys. Whistles blew, and dogs barked to add to the din. Row! Row! Jerry fairly screamed. Pick it up, boys! pleaded the Fairview coxswain. He had not thought that his rivals had the spurt in them. Can't you do it? Can't you get up to them? begged Pinky Davenport of his boxer lads, and there were unashamed tears in his eyes as he made his last appeal. But boxer was all in. Now, boys, now! shouted Jerry. This is your last chance. A hundred yards more, only three hundred feet. Row! Row! We must win! Don't let them pass us! came from the Fairview coxswain. A few strokes, only a few more! The boats were even. Pandemonium had now broken loose. The band was drowned out by shouts. 
Ruth found herself hammering Madge on the back and shouting she knew not what in her ear. Madge was crying. She did not know why. As for the Randall lads, they were mere machines. There was no thought left in them. They saw nothing, but each man in front of him viewed his foreman's back. Frank could not see the face of Jackson, but he could hear his rasping voice. Row! Row! How Frank heaved, how he dug at the giving water at the end of his blade as though he would tear it from the river and fling it aloft in a rainbow arc. And how Bricktop Molly took up the stroke, his honest Irish face wet with sweat, his red hair plastered down on his forehead. Back and forth he bent. After him came Holly Cross, picking up the stroke masterfully. And then Kidlings, good old Kidlings, with something of the fire of his name and his dirty muscles. Then Hausenlager, all the desire for horseplay gone from him. Then Sid, who had been shifted back to number three almost at the last moment. Then Phil, then Tom. And how they rode. Surely the ancient gods, surely even Hercules at his twelve labors, never toiled more titanically than these eight rowers. No galley slave chained to the oar, with the vessel on fire above him, with the shrieks of the dying in his ears, the stench of Greek fire in his nostrils, ever rowed more desperately. Row! Row! screamed Jerry. Row! Row! echoed Roger Barnes. The finish line was about a hundred feet away. Slowly, oh, so slowly, did the Randall boat creep up on her rival. Now she was past. Another electric thrill went through Jerry. Row! Row! He screamed, and his voice was hoarse. His hands, tense and gripped, were clasped so tightly on the tiller ropes that afterwards they had to loosen them for him. The muscles had gone dead, but he steered with the skill of a veteran. It grew black before Tom's eyes. He felt that his lungs were bursting. Frank knew that if he dipped the oar in the water again, he would not have the strength to pull it out. But somehow he did. And then, with one last spurt, a spurt that seemed to wrench the very roots of their hearts, a pull that seemed to tear their very muscles loose. The lads in the Randall shell sent their boat over the finish line, a winner. A winner by half a length, a winner. They were the eight oared victors. And as they realized this, as it came to them, their eyes that saw not lighted up, their faces, seamed and lined with the contracted muscles, broke into smiles. And then Tom toppled over on his oar, and Frank fell weakly back on Malloy. Easy there, me lad, easy panted Bricktop. It's all over. You collapsed at the right minute. Oh, wow, but I'm thirsty. Jerry Jackson was struggling with the tiller lines wound around his nerveless hands. Ready chums loosened them and helped him from the shell onto a boat, the crew having recovered sufficiently to put their broad blades out into the water to steady the shell. And then, following the hush that came after the hysterical outburst which greeted the winners, came floating over the heads of the great throng. Out vincere! Out more! But Randall had conquered, though she had nearly died. End of The Eight Ord Victors by Leslie Chadwick Read by Todd Chapters 14 and 15 of Book 3 of Pieces of Eight by Richard Le Gallienet. This is recorded to celebrate the 8th anniversary of LibriVox. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 14, in which I lose my way. I stood a full minute with the astonishing paper in my hand, too stunned to speak or move. It seemed too incredible an outrage to realize. Then a torrent of feeling swept over me. Wild fear for her I loved an impotent fury against the miscreant who had dared even to conceive so foul a sacrilege. To think of her beauty subject to such a coarse ruffianism. I pictured her bound and gagged and carried along through the brush in the bestial grasp of filthy negroes, and it seemed as though my brain would burst at the thought. The audacity of the fellow, exclaimed the king, who was the first to recover. But Calypso, I cried. The king laid his hand on my shoulder reassuringly. Don't be afraid for her, he said. I know my daughter. But I love her, I cried, thus blurting out in my anguish what I had designed to reveal in some tranquil chosen hour. I've loved her for twenty years, said the king, exasperatingly calm. Jack Harkaway can take care of himself. I was not even astonished at the time. But something must be done, I cried. I will go to the commandant at once and rouse the settlement. Give me a lantern. I called to one of the negroes, who by this time had come up to us, and were standing around in a terrified group. I waited only for it to be lit, and then, without a word, dashed wildly into the forest. Hadn't you better take someone with you? I heard the king call after me. 
but I was too distraught to reply, plunging head foremost through the tangled darkness, my brain boiling like a cauldron with anger and a thousand fears, and my heart stung, too, with wild, unreasoning remorse. After all, it was my doing. To think, to think, to think, I cried aloud, leaving the rest unspoken. I meant that it had all come of my insensate pursuit of that filthy treasure, when all the time the only treasure I coveted was Calypso herself. Poor old ignorant Tom had been right, after all. Nothing good came of such enterprises. There was a curse upon them from the beginning. And then, as I thought of Tobias, my body shook so that I could hardly keep on walking. And the next minute my hatred of him so nerved me up again that I ran on through the brush, like a madman, my clothes clutched at by the devilish vines and torn at every yard. I fled past the scene of our excavations, looking more haunted than ever in the flashing gleam of the lantern. With an oath I left them behind, as the accursed cause of all this evil. But I cannot have gone by them many yards, when suddenly I felt the ground giving way beneath me with a violent jerk. My arms went up in a wild effort to save myself, and then, in a panic of fright, I felt myself shooting downwards as one might fall down the shaft of a mine. Vainly I clutched at rocky walls as I sped down in the earth-smelling darkness. I seemed to be falling forever, and for a moment my head cleared and I had time to think of the crash that was coming at the end of my fall. A crash which, I said to myself, must mean death. It came with sudden crunching pain, a swift tightening round my heart as though black ropes were being lashed tightly about it, squeezing out my breath. That entire blackness engulfed me, and I knew no more. How long I lay there in the darkness I cannot tell. All I remember is my suddenly opening my eyes on intense blackness, and vaguely wondering where I was. My head felt strangely clear and alive, but for a moment I could remember nothing. I was conscious only of a strong earthy smell, and my eyes felt so keen that, as the phrase goes, they seemed to make the darkness visible. They seemed, too, to see themselves as rings of light in the darkness. My head, too, seemed entirely detached from my body, of which, so far, I was unconscious. But presently the realization of it returned, and involuntarily I tried to move, to find, with a sort of indifferent mild surprise, that it was impossible. So there I lay, oddly content, in the dark, the pungent smell of the earth my only sensation, and my head uselessly clear. Then, bit by bit, it all came back to me, like returning circulation in a numbed limb, but as yet dreamily, as something long ago and far away. Then I found myself partly risen, leaning on my elbow, and looking about, in the nothingness. Then feeling seemed slowly to be coming back to the rest of me. My head was no longer isolated. It was part of a heavy something that lay inert on the ground, and was beginning to feel numbly, to ache dully. Then I found that I could move one of my legs, then the other. And eventually, with a mighty effort, I could almost raise myself. But, for a moment, I had to fall back. The remembrance of what had happened began to grow in force and keenness, and of a sudden the thought of Calypso smote me like a sword. Spurred to desperate effort, I stood up on the instant and leaned against a rocky wall. Miracle of miracles, I could stand! I was not dead after all. I was not, indeed, so far as I could tell, seriously hurt. Badly bruised, of course, but no bones broken. It seemed incredible, but it was so. The realization made me feel weak again and I sat down with my back propped up against the rock, and waited for more strength. Slowly my thoughts fumbled around the situation. Then, as by force of habit, my hand went to my pocket. God be praised! I had matches! And I cried with thankfulness out of very weakness. But I still sat on in the dark for a while. I felt very tired. After thinking about it for a long time, I took out my precious matchbox, which unconsciously I had been hugging with my hand, and struck a light, looking about me in a dazed fashion. The match burnt down to my fingers, and I threw it away as the flame stung me. I had seen something of my surroundings, enough to last my tired brain for a minute or two. I was at the bottom of a sort of crevasse, a narrow cleft in the rocks which continued on in a slanting downward chasm into the darkness. It was a natural corridor, with a floor of white sand. The sand had accounted for my coming off without any broken bones. After another minute or two, I struck another match, and lo, another miracle! There was my lantern lying beside me. The glass of it was broken, but that was of no matter. As I lit the wick, my hopes leapt up with the flame. At the worst, I had light. Lux in tenebris. I seemed to hear the voice of the king, inextinguishably gay, 
and at the thought of him, my inertia passed. What could he be thinking? His daughter spirited away, and now I, too, mysteriously vanished. What was happening up there all this time? Up there? How far was it to up there? How far had I fallen? All about me was so terribly still and shut away, I could believe myself at the very center of the earth, and it seemed ages ago, eons of time since I had last seen the king. What time was it? I felt from my watch. I found nothing but the wreck of it. It was the only thing that had suffered. It was smashed to smithereens. Then I moved myself again, and taking up the lantern, raised it aloft. But the chasm down which I had fallen went up and up in a slanting direction, and lost itself in darkness. Bringing the lantern down to the level again, I examined the rock corridor. Behind me, as before me, it continued, a long, deep fissure splitting its way through the earth. I limped my way along some yards of the section that lay before me, but it seemed to me that it was growing narrower as it went on, as though it were coming to an end, and indeed, after a while, I came to a place too narrow for me to pass. I swung my lantern aloft, seeking the possibilities of a climb, but everywhere it was sheer, without a ledge or protuberance of any kind to take advantage of, and it was utterly devoid of vegetation, not a sign of a friendly shrub or root to hold by. So I turned back to try my luck in the other direction. But first I shouted and shouted with all my might. I could not be far away from the ruins, and there was a chance of someone hearing me. However, I had little faith in my effort, and was too tired to keep it up, so I turned with my lantern towards the other end of the corridor. And here it was easy going, along a gently graded descent, covered, as I have said, with white sand, in which shells were here and there embedded. My heart beat wildly. Perhaps I had only to walk on a little further to come out on the sea, for certainly the sea had been once, whether or not it came up there any more. Vain hope. For when I had followed the corridor some fifty yards or so, it suddenly widened out for a few yards into something of a cavern, and then it suddenly narrowed into a mere slit, and so came to an end. The deadening of my spark of hope weakened me. I slid down with my back against the rock, and gave way to despair. As I looked up at the smooth and placable walls that imprisoned me, I felt like some poor insect clinging to the side of a bowl partly filled with water. How frantically the poor creature claws and claws the polished sides, at each effort slipping nearer and nearer to the fatal flood. I had sense enough to know that I was too tired to think profitably and drowsiness coming over me told me that an hour or two sleep would give me the strength I needed to renew, with a will, and more chance of success, my efforts to escape. Light was too precious to waste, so I blew out my lantern, and curling up on the sand almost instantly fell asleep. But before I lapsed into unconsciousness, I had clutched hold of one sustaining thought in the darkness, the assurance of Calypso's safety, so confidently announced by her father. Don't be afraid for her, I know my daughter. But before I lapsed into unconsciousness, I had clutched hold of one sustaining thought in the darkness, the assurance of Calypso's safety, so confidently announced by her father. Don't be afraid for her, I know my daughter. Whatever happened to me, she would come out all right. As her brave shape flashed before my mind's eye, down there under the earth I could have no doubt of that. Chapter 15, in which I pursue my studies as a troglodyte. My instinct had been right in giving way to my drowsiness, for I woke up from my sleep a new man. How long I had been there, of course, I had no means of knowing, but I fancy I must have slept a good while, for I felt so refreshed and full of determination to tackle my escape in good earnest. It is remarkable how rest sharpens one's perceptions. When we are weary, we only half see what we look at, and the very thing we are desperately seeking may be right under our nose, and we quite unaware. So I had hardly relit my lantern when its rays revealed something which it seemed impossible for anyone with eyes, however weary, to have overlooked. In the right-hand corner of the little cavern, Five or six feet above my head was a dark hole, like the entrance to a tunnel, or, more properly speaking, a good-sized burrow, for it was scarcely more than a yard in diameter. It seemed to be something more than a mere cavity in the rock, for, when I flashed my lantern up into it, I could see no end. To climb up to it, at first, seemed difficult, but providentially I had a stout clasp-knife in my pocket, and with this I cut a step or two in the porous rock, and so managed it. Lying flat on my stomach, I looked in. It was, as I had thought, a narrow natural tunnel, snaking through the rocks, as often happens in those curious fantastic coral formations, for all the world indeed as if it had been made ages ago by some monstrous primeval serpent, a giant wormhole no less, leading, heaven alone knew where. There was just room to crawl along it on all fours, so I started cautiously, 
making sure I had my precious matches and my jackknife all safe. After all, I said to myself, I was no worse off than thousands of poor devils in mines. I had myself snaked through just such passages in coal mines. Still, I confess that the choking sense of being shut in this earth-smelling tube like a fox in a drain, and the sudden realization of the appalling tonnage of superincumbent earth above me, liable at any moment to loosen, and, as with a giant thumb, press out my poor little insect existence, made the sweat pour from me, and my heart stand still. I had to shut my eyes for a moment and command myself back to calmness and courage before I could go on. Above all things, I had to blindfold my imagination, the last companion for such a situation. After this first flurry of fear, I went on crawling in a methodical way, allowing no thought to enter my mind that did not concern the yard or two of earth immediately ahead of me. So I progressed, I should say, for some twenty or thirty yards, when, to my inexpressible relief, I came out, still on all fours, onto a spreading floor. Then, standing up, I perceived that I was in a cave of considerable loftiness, and some forty feet or so across. It was good to breathe again such comparatively free air. Yet, as I looked about and made the circuit of the walls, I saw that I had but exchanged one prison for another. There was this difference, however, whereas there had only been one passageway from the cave I had just left. There were several similar outlets from that in which I now stood. Two or three of them proved to be nothing but alcoves that ran a few yards and then stopped. But there were two close by each other which seemed to continue on. There was not much choice between them, but, as both made in the same direction, as far as I could judge the direction in which I had so far progressed, I decided to take the larger one. It proved to be a passage much like the tunnel I had already traversed, only a little roomier, and therefore it was easier going, and it, too, brought me out, as had the other, on another cavern, but one considerably larger in extent. Here, however, I speedily perceived that it was not a case of one cavern, but several, opening out by natural archways, one into another. I walked eagerly through them, scanning their ceilings for sign of some outlet into the upper air, but in vain. Still, after the strangling embrace of those tunnels, it was good to have so much space to breathe and walk about in. In fact, I had stumbled on something like a Monte Cristo suite of underground apartments. And here, for a moment, I released my imagination from her blinders, and allowed her to play around these strange halls. And in one of her suggestions, there was some comfort. It was hardly likely that caverns of such extent had waited for me to discover them. They must surely have been known to teach, or whatever buccaneer it was, who had occupied the ruined mansion not so very far above ground. What better place could be conceived for his business? It was even likely, more than likely, almost certain, that there was some secret passageway connecting this series of caves with the old house, if one could only find it. And so the dear creature prattled on to me, until I thought it was time to blindfold her again, and return to business. Still, there was something in what she had said, and I sat about them more carefully to examine every nook and corner. And if I didn't find anything so splendid as she had dreamt, I did presently find evidence that, as she had said, I was not the first human being to stand where now I stood. Two iron staples embedded in one of the walls, with rusting chains and manacles attached, were melancholy proof of one of the uses to which the place had once been put. Melancholy for certain unhappy souls, long since free of all mortal chains. But for me, need I say it? exceedingly joyous. For if there had been a way to bring prisoners here, it was none the less evident that there had been a way to take them out. But how and where? Again I searched every nook and cranny. There was no sign of entrance anywhere. Then a thought occurred to me. What if the entrance were after the manner of a medieval oubliette, through the ceiling? There was a thought indeed to send one's hope soaring. I ran in my eagerness through one cavern after another, holding my lantern aloft. That must be the solution. There could be no other way. I sought and sought, but alas, it was a false hope, and I threw myself down in a corner in despair, deciding that the prisoners must have been forced to crawl in as I had, though it was hardly like jailers to put themselves to such inconvenience. I leaned back against the wall and gazed listlessly upwards. Next moment I had bounded to my feet again. Surely I had seen some short regular lines running up the face of the rock like a ladder. I raised my lantern. Sure enough, there were iron rounds set in the face of the rock, and they mounted up till I lost them in the obscurity, for the cave here must have been forty feet high. Blessed heaven! I was saved! But alas, they did not begin till some six feet above my head, and the wall was sheer. How was I to reach the lowest rung? The rock was too sheer for me to cut steps in, as I had done further back. I looked about me. Again the luck was with me. 
In one of the caves I had noticed some broken pieces of fallen rock. They were terribly heavy, but despair lent me strength, and after an hour or two's work I had managed to roll several of them to the foot of the ladder, and, with an effort of which I would not have believed myself capable, had been able to build them one on top of another against the wall. So I found myself able to grasp the lowest rung with my hands. Then, fastening the lantern round my neck with my necktie, I prepared to mount. The climb was not difficult once I had managed to get my feet on the first rung of the ladder, but there was always the chance that one of the rungs might be rusted loose with time, in which case, of course, it would have given way in my grasp and I should have been precipitated backwards to certain death below. However, the man who had mortised them had done an honest piece of work, and they proved as firm as on the day they were placed there. Up and up I went, till I must have been forty feet above the floor, and then, as I neared the roof, instead of coming to a trap door as I had conjectured, I found that the ladder came to an end at the edge of a narrow ledge, running along the ceiling much as a celestory runs near the roof in some old churches. On to this I managed to climb. It was barely a yard wide, and the impending roof did not permit of one standing erect. It was a dizzy situation, and it seemed safest to crawl along on all fours, holding the lantern in front of me. Presently it brought me up sharp in a narrow recess. It had come to an end. Yes! But imagine my joy! It had come to an end at a low archway rudely cut in the rock. Deeply set in the archway was a stout wooden door. My first thought was that I was trapped again. But then, to my infinite surprise and gratitude, it proved to be slightly ajar, and a vigorous push than it grinding back on its hinges. What next, I wondered? At all events, I was no longer lost in the bowels of the earth. Step by step, I was coming nearer to the frontiers of humanity but I was certainly not prepared for what next met my eyes as I pushed through the low doorway with my lantern and looked around. Yes, indeed, man had certainly been here, man, too, very purposeful and businesslike. I was in a sort of long, narrow gallery, some forty feet long, to which the arching rock made a crypt-like ceiling. At my first glance, I saw that there was another door at the far end, similar to the one I had entered by, and on the left side of the gallery, built of rough stones from the low ceiling to the floor, was a series of compartments, each with locked wooden door. They were strong and grim-looking, and might have been taken for prison cells, or family vaults, or possibly wine bins. The massive locks were red with rust, and there was plainly no possibility of my opening them. On the other side of the gallery there was a litter of old chains, and some boards, probably left over from the doors. Yes, and there were two old flintlock guns, and several cutlasses, all eaten away with rust, also a rough seaman's chest open and falling to pieces. At the sight of that a wild thought flashed through my brain. What if, good God, what if this was John Teach's treasury behind those grim doors? I threw myself with all my force against one of them and then the other. For the moment I forgot that my paramount business was to escape, but I might as well have hurled myself against the solid rock. And at that moment I noticed that the place was darker than it had been. My lantern was going out. In a moment or two I should be in the pitch dark, and I had discovered that the door at the end of the gallery was as solid as the others. I was to be trapped, after all, and I pictured myself slowly dying there of hunger, the pangs of which I was already beginning to feel, and someone, years hence, finding me there, a moldering skeleton, someone who would break open those doors, discover those gleaming hordes, and moralize on the irony of my end, condemned to die there of starvation with the treasure I had so long sought on the other side of those unyielding doors. Old Tom's words suddenly flashed over me, and I could feel my hair literally beginning to rise. There never was a buried treasure yet that didn't claim its victim. Great God, and I was to be the ghost, and keep guard in this terrible tomb till the next dead man came along to relieve me of my sentry duty. Frantically I turned up the wick of my lantern at the thought, but it was of no use. It was plainly going out. I examined my matchbox. I still had a dozen or so matches left, and then my eye fell on that shattered chest. There were those boards, too. At all events, I could build a fire and make torches of slivers of wood, so long as the wood lasted. Then I had an idea. Why not make the fire against the door at the end of the gallery, and so burn my way through? Bravo! My spirits rose at the thought, and I set to at once splitting some small kindling with my knife. In a few minutes I had quite a sprightly little fire going at the bottom of the door, but I saw that I should have to be extravagant with my wood if the fire was to be effective. However, it was neck or nothing, so I piled on beams and boards till my fire roared like a furnace, and presently I had the joy of seeing it begin to take hold of the door, which, after a short time, began to crackle and splutter in a very cheering fashion. Whatever lay beyond, it was evident that I should soon be able to break my way through the obstacle. And indeed, so it proved. 
for presently I used one of the boards as a battering ram, and to my inexpressible joy it went crashing through with a shower of sparks, and it was but the work of a few more minutes before the whole door fell flaming down, and I was able to leap through the doorway into the darkness on the other side. As I stood there, peering ahead and holding aloft a burning stick, which proved, however, a poor substitute for my lantern, a wonderful sound smote my ears. I could not believe it, and my knees shook beneath me. It was the sound of the sea. Yes! It was no illusion. It was the sound that the sea makes, singing and echoing through hollow caves, the sound I heard that night as I stood in the moonlight door of Calypso's cavern, and saw that vision which my heart nearly broke to remember. Calypso! Oh, Calypso, where was she at this moment? Pray God that she was indeed safe, as her father had said. But I had to will her from my mind, to keep from going mad. And my poor torch had gone out, having, however, given me light enough to see that the door which I had just burnt through led out onto a narrow platform on the side of a rock that went slanting down into a chasm of blackness, through which, as in a great shell, boomed that murmuring of the sea. It had a perilous, ugly look, and it was plain that it would be foolhardy to attempt it at that moment without a light, and my fire was dying down. Besides, I was beginning to feel light-headed and worn out, partly from lack of food, no doubt. As there was no food to be had, I recalled the old French proverb, He eats who sleeps, or something to that effect, and I determined to husband my strength once more with a brief rest. However, as I turned to throw some more wood on my fire, preparing to indulge myself with a little campfire cheerfulness as I dozed off, my eyes fell once more upon that grim line of locked doors, and my curiosity and an idea made me wakeful again. I had burned down one door. Why not another? Why not indeed? So I raked over my fire to the family vault nearest to me, and presently had it roaring and licking against the stout door. It was, apparently, not so solid as the gallery door had been. At all events, it kindled more easily, and it was not long before I had the satisfaction of battering that down too. As I did so, I caught sight of something in the interior that made me laugh aloud, and behave generally like a madman. Of course, I didn't believe my eyes, but they persisted in declaring, nevertheless, that there in front of me was a great iron-bound oaken chest to begin with. It might not, of course, contain anything but bones, but it might. The thing was too absurd. I must have fallen asleep, must be already dreaming. But no, I was laboring with all my strength to open it with one of the rusty cutlasses. It was a tough job, but my strength was as the strength of ten, for the old treasure-hunting lust was upon me, and I had forgotten everything else in the world. At last, with a great wooden groan, as though its heart were breaking at having to give up its secret at last, it crashed open. I fell upon my knees as though I had been struck by lightning, for it was literally brimming over with silver and gold pieces, doubloons and pieces of eight, English and French coins too, guineas and louis d'or, all, as Tobias's manuscript had said, all good money. For a while I knelt over it, dazed and blinded, lost. Then I slowly plunged my hands into it and let the pieces pour and pour through them, literally bathing them in gold and silver as I had read of misers doing. Meanwhile, I talked insanely to myself, made all sorts of inarticulate noises, sang shreds of old songs. Rising at length, I capered up and down the gallery, talking aloud to the king as though he had been there, and anon breaking out again into absurd song, roaring into the top of my voice, laughing and war between. There was chest on chest of Spanish gold, with a ton of plate in the middle hold, and the cabin's riot of loot untold. Then suddenly I broke out into an Irish jig, never having any notion of doing such a thing before. In fact, I behaved as I have read of men doing, whom a sudden fortune has bereft of reason. For the time, at all events, I was a gibbering madman. Certainly there was to be no sleep for me that night. But in the full tide of my frenzy, I suddenly noticed something that brought me up sharp. Out beyond the doorway, it was growing light. It was only a dim, tremulous effusion of it, indeed. But it was real daylight, oozing in from somewhere or other, the blessed, blessed daylight. God be praised. End of chapters 14 and 15 from Book 3 of Pieces of Eight by Richard Le Gallienne. Recording by Todd. Eight or Nine Wise Words About Letter Writing by Lewis Carroll. This is recorded to celebrate the eighth anniversary of LibriVox. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 1. On Stamp Cases Some American writer has said, The snakes in this district may be divided into one species, the venomous. The same principle applies here. 
postage stamp cases may be divided into one species, the Wonderland. Imitations of it will soon appear, no doubt, but they cannot include the two pictorial surprises which are copyright. You don't see why I call them surprises? Well, take the case in your left hand and regard it attentively. You see Alice nursing the Duchess's baby? An entirely new combination, by the way. It doesn't occur in the book. Now, with your right hand and forefinger, lay hold of the little book and suddenly pull it out. The baby has turned into a pig. If that doesn't surprise you, why, I suppose you wouldn't be surprised if your own mother-in-law suddenly turned into a gyroscope. This case is not intended to carry about in your pocket. Far from it. People seldom want any other stamps on an emergency than penny stamps for letters, six-penny stamps for telegrams, and a bit of stamp edging for cut fingers. It makes capital sticking plaster, and will stand three or four washings, cautiously conducted. And all these are easily carried in a purse or pocketbook. No, this is meant to haunt your envelope case, or wherever you keep your writing materials. What made me invent it was the constantly wanting stamps of other values for foreign letters, parcel post, etc., and finding it very bothersome to get at the kind I wanted in a hurry. Since I have possessed a Wonderland stamp case, life has been bright and peaceful, and I have used no other. I believe the Queen's Laundress uses no other. Each of the pockets will hold six stamps comfortably. I would recommend you to arrange the six before putting them in, something like a bouquet, making them lean to the right and a little to the left alternately. Thus there will always be a free corner to get hold of, so as to take them out quickly and easily, one by one. Otherwise you will find them apt to come out two or three at a time. According to my experience, the five-penny, nine-penny, and one-shilling stamps are hardly ever wanted though I have constantly to replenish all the other pockets. If your experience agrees with mine, you may find it convenient to keep only a couple, say, of each of these three kinds in the one-shilling pocket, and fill the other two pockets with extra one-penny stamps. 2. How to begin a letter If the letter is to be an answer to another, begin by getting out that other letter and reading it through, in order to refresh your memory, as to what it is you have to answer and as to your correspondent's present address. Otherwise you would be sending your letter to his regular address in London, though he has been careful in writing to give you his Torquay address in full. Next, address and stamp the envelope. What? Before writing the letter? Most certainly. And I'll tell you what will happen if you don't. You will go on writing to the last moment, and just in the middle of the last sentence you will be aware that time's up. Then comes the hurried wind-up, the wildly scrawled signature, the hastily fastened envelope which comes open in the post, the address, a mere hieroglyphic, the horrible discovery that you've forgotten to replenish your stamp case, the frantic appeal to everyone in the house to lend you a stamp, the headlong rush to the post office, arriving hot and gasping, just after the box has closed. And finally, a week afterwards, the return of the letter from the dead letter office marked Address Illegible. Next, put your own address, in full, at the top of the note sheet. It is an aggravating thing, I speak from bitter experience, when a friend, staying at some new address, heads his letter Dover, simply, assuming that you can get the rest of the address from his previous letter, which perhaps you have destroyed. Next, put the date in full. It is another aggravating thing, when you wish, years afterwards, to arrange a series of letters to find them dated Feb 17, Aug 2, without any year to guide you as to which comes first. And never, never, dear madam, note bien, this remark is addressed to ladies only. No man would ever do such a thing. Put Wednesday simply as the date. That way madness lies. 3. How to go on with a letter. Here is a golden rule to begin with. Write legibly. The average temper of the human race would be perceptibly sweetened if everybody obeyed this rule. A great deal of the bad writing in the world comes simply from writing too quickly. Of course you reply, I do it to save time. A very good object, no doubt, but what right have you to do it at your friend's expense? Isn't his time as valuable as yours? Years ago, I used to receive letters from a friend, and very interesting letters too, written in one of the most atrocious hands ever invented. 
It generally took me about a week to read one of his letters. I used to carry it about in my pocket and take it out at leisure times to puzzle over the riddles which composed it, holding it in different positions and at different distances, till at last the meaning of some hopeless scrawl would flash upon me, when I at once wrote down the English under it. And when several had been thus guessed, the context would help one with the others, till at last the whole series of hieroglyphics was deciphered. If all one's friends wrote like that, life would be entirely spent in reading their letters. This rule applies, specially, to names of people or places, and most specially to foreign names. I got a letter once containing some Russian names written in the same hasty scrabble with which people often write yours sincerely. The context, of course, didn't help in the least, and one spelling was just as likely as another so far as I knew. It was necessary to write and tell my friend that I couldn't read any of them. My second rule is, don't fill more than a page and a half with apologies for not having written sooner. The best subject to begin with is your friend's last letter. Write with the letter open before you, answer his questions, and make any remarks his letter suggests. Then go on to what you want to say yourself. This arrangement is more courteous and pleasanter for the reader than to fill the letter with your own invaluable remarks and then hastily answer your friend's questions in a postscript. Your friend is much more likely to enjoy your wit after his own anxiety for information has been satisfied. In referring to anything your friend has said in his letter, it is best to quote the exact words, and not to give a summary of them in your words. A's impression of what B has said, expressed in A's words, will never convey to B the meaning of his own words. This is specially necessary where some point has arisen to which the two correspondents do not quite agree. There ought to be no opening for such writing as, You are quite mistaken in thinking I said so and so. It was not in the least my meaning, etc., etc., which tends to make a correspondence last for a lifetime. A few more rules may fitly be given here for correspondence that has unfortunately become controversial. One is, don't repeat yourself. When once you have said your say, fully and clearly on a certain point, and have failed to convince your friend, drop that subject. To repeat your arguments all over again will simply lead to his doing the same, and so you will go on like a circulating decimal. Do you ever know a circulating decimal come to an end? Another rule is, when you have written a letter that you feel may possibly irritate your friend, however necessary you may have felt it to express yourself so, put it aside until the next day. Then read it over again, and fancy it addressed to yourself. This will often lead to your writing it all over again, taking out a lot of the vinegar and pepper, and putting in honey instead, and thus making a much more palatable dish of it. If, when you have done your best to write inoffensively, you still feel that it will probably lead to further controversy, keep a copy of it. There is very little use, months afterwards, in pleading, I am almost sure I never expressed myself as you say, to the best of my recollection I said so and so. Far better to be able to write, I did not express myself so. These are the words I used. My fifth rule is, if your friend makes a severe remark, either leave it unnoticed, or make your reply distinctly less severe. And if he makes a friendly remark, tending towards making up the little difference that has arisen between you, let your reply be distinctly more friendly. If, in picking a quarrel, each party declined to go more than three-eighths of the way, and if, in making friends, each was ready to go five-eighths of the way, why, there would be more reconciliations than quarrels, which is like the Irishman's remonstrance to his gadabout daughter. Sure! You're always going out. You go out three times for once that you come in. My sixth rule, and my last remark about controversial correspondence, is don't try to have the last word. How many a controversy would be nipped in the bud if each was anxious to let the other have the last word? Never mind how telling a rejoinder you leave unuttered. Never mind your friends supposing that you are silent from lack of anything to say. Let the thing drop as soon as it is possible without discourtesy. Remember, speech is silvern, but silence is golden. Note bien. If you are a gentleman, and your friend is a lady, this rule is superfluous. You won't get the last word. My seventh rule is, if it should ever occur to you to write jestingly, in dispraise of your friend, be sure you exaggerate enough to make the jesting obvious. A word spoken in jest, but taken as earnest, 
may lead to very serious consequences. I have known it to lead to the breaking off of a friendship. Suppose, for instance, you wish to remind your friend of a sovereign you have lent him, which he has forgotten to repay. You might quite mean the words, I mention it, as you seem to have a conveniently bad memory for debts, in jest. Yet there would be nothing to wonder at if he took offense at that way of putting it. But suppose you wrote, Long observation of your career as a pickpocket and a burglar has convinced me that my one lingering hope for recovering that sovereign I lent you is to say, Pay up or I summons you. He would indeed be a matter-of-fact friend if he took that as seriously meant. My Eighth Rule when you say in your letter, I enclose check for five pounds, or I enclose John's letter for you to see, leave off writing for a moment, go and get the document referred to, and put it into the envelope. Otherwise you are pretty certain to find it lying about after the post has gone. My ninth rule. When you get to the end of a note sheet, and find you have more to say, take another piece of paper, a whole sheet, or a scrap, as the case may demand, but whatever you do, don't cross. Remember the old proverb, cross writing makes cross reading. The old proverb, you say inquiringly? How old? Well, not so very ancient, I must confess. In fact, I'm afraid I invented it while writing this paragraph. Still, you know, old is a comparative term. I think you would be quite justified in addressing a chicken just out of the shell, as old boy, when compared with another chicken that was only half out. 4. How to End a Letter If doubtful whether to end with yours faithfully, or yours truly, or yours most truly, etc., there are at least a dozen varieties before you reach yours affectionately, refer to your correspondent's last letter and make your winding up at least as friendly as his. In fact, even a shade more friendly. It will do no harm. A postscript is a very useful invention, but it is not meant, as so many ladies suppose, to contain the real gist of the letter. It serves rather to throw into the shade any little matter we do not wish to make a fuss about. For example, your friend had promised to execute a commission for you in town, but forgot it, thereby putting you to great inconvenience, and he now writes to apologize for his negligence. It would be cruel, and needlessly crushing, to make it the main subject of your reply. How much more gracefully it comes in thus. P.S. Don't distress yourself any more about having omitted that little matter in town. I won't deny that it did put my plans out a little at the time. But it's all right now. I often forget things myself. And those who live in glass houses mustn't throw stones, you know. When you take your letters to the post, carry them in your hand. If you put them in your pocket, you will take a long country walk. I speak from experience passing the post office twice, going and returning, and when you get home, you will find them still in your pocket. 5. On Registering Correspondence Let me recommend you to keep a record of letters received and sent. I have kept one for many years, and have found it of the greatest possible service in many ways. It secures my answering letters, however long they have to wait. It enables me to refer, for my own guidance, to the details of previous correspondence, the actual letters may have been destroyed long ago. And the most valuable feature of all, if any difficulty arises years afterwards in connection with a half-forgotten correspondence, it enables me to say with confidence, I did not tell you that he was an invaluable servant in every way, and that you couldn't trust him too much. I have a precy of my letter. What I said was, he is a valuable servant in many ways, but don't trust him too much. So if he's cheated you, you really must not hold me responsible for it. I will now give you a few simple rules for making and keeping a letter register. Get a blank book containing, say, 200 leaves, about 4 inches wide and 7 high. It should be well fastened into its cover, as it will have to be opened and shut hundreds of times. Have a line ruled in red ink down each margin of every page an inch off the edge. The margin should be wide enough to contain a number of five digits easily. I manage with a three-quarter inch margin, but unless you write very small you will find an inch more comfortable. Write a precy of each letter received or sent in chronological order. Let the entry of a received letter reach from the left-hand edge to the right-hand margin line, and the entry of a sent letter from the left-hand margin line to the right-hand edge. Thus the two kinds will be quite distinct, and you can easily hunt through the received letters by themselves without being bothered with the sent letters, and vice versa. 
use the right-hand pages only. And when you come to the end of a book, turn it upside down and begin at the other end, still using the right-hand pages. You will find this much more comfortable than using the left-hand pages. You will find it convenient to write, at the top of every sheet of a received letter, its register number in full. I will now give a few ideal specimen pages of my letter register and make a few remarks on them, after which I think you will find it easy enough to manage one for yourself. I begin each page by putting, at the top left-hand corner, the next entry number I am going to use, in full. The last three digits of each entry number are enough afterwards. And I put the date of the year at the top in the center. I begin each entry with the last three digits of the entry number, enclosed in an oval. This is difficult to reproduce in print, so I have had to put round parentheses here. Then, for the first entry in each page, I put the day of the month and the day of the week. Afterwards, D.O., is enough for the month day till it changes. I do not repeat the weekday. Next, if the entry is not a letter, I put a symbol for parcel, or telegram, as the case may be. Next, the name of the person, underlined. If an entry needs special further attention, I put bracket at the end, and when it has been attended to, I fill in the appropriate symbol. For example, in number 218, it showed that the bill had to be paid, in number 222, that an answer was really needed. The X means attended to. In number 234, that I owed the old lady a visit. In number 235, that the item had to be entered in my account book. In number 236, that I must not forget to write. In number 239, that the address had to be entered in my address book. In number 243, that the book had to be returned. I give each entry the space of two lines, whether it fills them or not, in order to have room for references. And at the foot of each page I leave two or three lines blank, often useful afterwards for entering omitted letters, and miss one or two numbers before I begin the next page. At any odd moments of leisure I make up the entry book in various ways as follows. 1. I draw a second line at the right-hand edge of the received entries, and at the left-hand edge of the sent entries. This I usually do pretty well up to date. In my register the first line is red, the second blue. 2. Beginning with the last entry, and going backwards, I read over the names till I recognize one as having occurred already. I then link the two entries together by giving the one that comes first in chronological order a foot reference. I do not keep this up to date, but leave it till there are four or five pages to be done. I work back till I come among entries that are all supplied with foot references, when I once more glance through the last few pages to see if there are any entries that are not yet supplied with head references. Their predecessors may need a special search. If an entry is connected, in subject, with another under a different name, I link them by cross-references, distinguished from the head and foot references by being written further from the margin line. When two consecutive entries have the same name, and are both of the same kind, that is, both received or both sent, I bracket them. If of different kinds, I link them with the symbols used for number 219 and 220. 3. Beginning at the earliest entry not yet done with, and going forwards, I cross out every entry that has got a head and foot reference, and is done with, by continuing the extra line through it. Thus, whenever a break occurs in the extra line, it shows there is some matter still needing attention. I do not keep this anything like up to date, but leave it until there are 30 or 40 pages to look through at a time. When the first page in the volume is thus completely crossed out, I put a mark at the foot of the page to indicate this, and so with pages 2, 3, etc. Hence, whenever I do this part of the making up, I need not begin at the beginning of the volume, but only at the earliest page which has not got this mark. All this looks very complicated when stated at full length, but you will find it perfectly simple when you have had a little practice, and will come to regard the making up as a pleasant occupation for a rainy day, or at any time that you feel disinclined for more severe mental work. In the game of whist, Hoyle gives us one golden rule. When in doubt, win the trick. I find this rule admirable for real life. When in doubt what to do, I make up my letter register. The End End of Eight or Nine Wise Words About Letter Writing by Lewis Carroll Read by Todd Eight Bad Men and True by Ralph Bergengren this is recorded to celebrate the eighth anniversary of LibriVox. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, 
please visit LibriVox.org. In a low groggery, where the eagle above the bar looked as if it had died of delirium tremens and been stuffed for fun by an intoxicated taxidermist, eight fashionably dressed men smoked, drank, and fidgeted in a stew of impatience around a rum-stained table. It was a tough place. There was nothing tougher in the 1820s along the New York waterfront and to any acute observer these fretful men were the toughest things in it. It is enough to say that all the regular frequenters eyed them admiringly and kept at a safe distance. They were, in fact, pirates, and their curly-brimmed beavers, their excellently tailored but somewhat ill-fitting swallowtail coats, their satin neckwear and their gold-headed canes testified oh horror to the exquisite taste of gentlemen passengers robbed and murdered at sea on their way from london whatever else they might seem no ordinary policeman would have guessed the briny nature of their lawless occupation but the awed whisper of it had gone round the stuck pig oyster palace even there at that period it was a rare treat to see eight real pirates together the way i looks at it messmates one of this brutal but interesting group was saying be as we've waited day arter day for billy slant eye till it ain't much use to wear out shoe leather a lookin or pants a sittin he was a burly creature whose tanned nose jutted from between his fine red whiskers like a gnarled log just going over the brink of a raging waterfall. As the pooty motter says it, together we stands up and separate we falls over. If slant I had a listen to me instead of histin his anchor and settin sail up town all by hisself, we'd all be aboard the Polly this minute and maybe a chasin of a cute little packet smoke filtered moodily through his whiskers and beside him a lank sunburnt devil-may-care companion in a dove-coloured swallow-tail nervously wrapped his front teeth with the rim of his large brass nose-ring for my part gentlemen all he remarked between wrappings I'm getting sick and tired of waiting and watching. What I want now be to put to sea and rest my feet and eyes shivering. If he axes me, Whisker, drawled a tall, graceful miscreant, graceful in a snake-like way, absently drawing a neat, wet, geometrical design on the table with the end of his long, handsome yellow moustaches dipped for the purpose in his rum and water i'd say as a week ashore be the best we can do for him lost he be poor feller and nothing left for us but to pipe a little shanty and all hands aboard ship it was a sensible suggestion ungrateful as pirates usually were every cruel eye looked him a thank ye and every heartless head nodded approval salt water deep under keel the untamable wind, the flying quarry, the blood-dabbled deck, and the indescribable pleasure of dividing other people's personal property, these were their natural element. As for the stuck pig oyster palace, it was all right in its way, but one tough place is very much like another. When you've seen one, you've seen all of them. A week was enough of it but they knew also that every sodden eye in the pig was looking at them, and that pirates were expected to burst at intervals into wild and roaring ditties. The snake-like beauty dried his moustaches carefully on a delicate lace handkerchief with somebody else's initials, and they all cleared their throats with gurgling swallows of rum and water and began to roar good-naturedly let the good ship roll like a tortured soul on the devil's frying pan as we drag on deck by the scruff of his neck the timid gentleman as we hauls by the heels a dame has squealed oh oh please let me go we will we remarks to feed the shark 
sticks in the tossing deep below. Oh, you better dollar, the more they holler, the more they kick and fuss. As pair by pair they walks on air, the more of a lark for us. It was a fine, satisfying, saltish ditty. A stranger who had just entered waited politely until they had finished, and then crossed the sanded floor of the palace. He also was dressed like a gentleman, albeit rather a seedy one, and he carried himself with the erectness of a man who is afraid that sooner or later the weight of his stomach will tip him over. "'Red whisker,' said the stranger politely, "'yellow moustaches, nose-ring. I think I am not mistaken.' He felt in his pocket. Instantly eight pirates were on their feet, and eight hands had vanished simultaneously under as many coat-tails. Had the fellow produced anything less innocent than a card-case, he would have been shot before he knew it in eight different places. He hummed Yankee Doodle, so might Daniel have hummed a popular Babylonian tune in the Den of Lions, as he extracted a card and laid it on the driest spot of the table. One after another the pirate studied it. Any schoolboy could have made a bluff at reading Hubert Irvington Hubertson, Attorney at Law, Innocence Protected at Reasonable Rates. But these were no schoolboys. None of them knew from what peaceful, cultivated homes the remote, insistent call of the sea might have lured the others, but they had all heard and answered too early to enjoy the enforced advantages of a public school education. Most of us, fortunately, are compelled to go to school, but these men had escaped it. Words of one syllable were their limit, and perhaps Mr. Hubertson knew it, for he smiled understandingly. "'My friend and client, Billy Slantye,' continued Hubertson, carefully exploring another pocket, "'told me I would probably find you at the stuck pig.' Fortunately, events justify prophecy. I have a letter from him. Unfortunately, he is now occupying, temporarily, I hope, cell 42 in the city prison. No diplomatist could have presented his credentials better. The number of the cell was immaterial, but the place was exactly where their missing comrade might naturally have landed, and this cool, corpulent, helpful-looking stranger was evidently his friend and confidant. He found the letter, drew up a chair, and resumed his rendition of Yankee Doodle, as Red Whisker slowly deciphered their mate's message. Dear friends and good messmates all, I take my pen in hand to tell you that this fine fat fellow is my at or knee. That means he is an expert at the law, but do not fear him for that. He is the kind of expert who knows how to defeat the law, and that is what we need now. Yes, my dear friends, I am in a cell. My door is barred. I broke my one chair, and so I must sit all day on my tiny bed, my head in my hands and my eyes on my feet. Now and then a tear will trickle down in my mouth and make me think of when I was free and swum with you all in the great salt sea. I think the sea is like a big tear shed by all the poor men who weep in jails. This is how I got in jail. I was in a crowd before a window, when a thief near me stole the watch and chain from an old man. The old man almost caught the thief. Then, to my great surprise, the thief gave me the watch and chain quick and ran out of the crowd. But I kept my head. I put the watch and chain down my neck and ran too. 
but alas the pole ease caught me before i could get to the stuck pig and they took me to jail my friends i was like a wild boar with rage the first thing i did was to take my chair in hand and wait for the turnkey when he came to give me food when he came i whirled my chair round my head and got him good and hard just where your backbone stops at your neck that is the place to hit a man with a chair he fell with a short sick sob his neck was broken so was my chair if i had thought of that i would have hit him with my little washstand you need a chair so much more than you do a washstand my hat or knee heard of the watch and chain and came to help me out when he heard of the turnkey he said oh dear oh dear this is worse and worse then he thought long and said was you alone when you did this crime i said yes alone with the turnkey then he said in that case i might get you off with my expert skill but i fear it would cost more than you could pay to save your neck this time then i told him the kind of men we are and how all we need to do for cash is to dig some up so here he is and that is how it is with me i will die game if i must but you are just as dead if you die game as if you break down and kick and sob and tear your hair he says he can get me off with your help so trust him and do as he says and all may yet be well with your sad but hopeful friend bill slant i p s i am too brave to fear but oh i hate to be hung i am too young i am too young b s e any way they looked at it it was a pitiful letter exuding something of the cold damp atmosphere in which it was written they almost saw him sitting on his tiny bed and composing it painfully on his little washstand stealing of a watch and killing of a turnkey said red whisker thoughtfully and ye think mister as ye're smart enough to get him off in it mr hubertson tried unsuccessfully to cross one leg over the other i don't boast gentlemen he replied with a simplicity that inspired confidence but it was the misfortune of cain that he couldn't have me for his attorney two in the court tense with the accumulated suspense of a capital trial lawyer hubertson was nearing the eloquent end of his address to an intelligent jury of four incorruptible citizens and eight pirates spectators packed like human sardines in the oil of morbid curiosity held their breath as they listened the quill pens of the press scratched in chorus and the eight pirates fresh from deep water and unused to jury duty scuffed their feet nervously juries in those days were rather carelessly chosen of the thirty-six citizens who had been summoned for this trial eight had changed hats coats and identities with as many total strangers outside the courthouse pirate gold and the expert skill of mr hubertson did it and twenty-four had agreed to sit silent during the impanelling of the jury until these total strangers answering for the first eight of them had filed to the jury box it was bull luck for the prosecution that the remaining four places went to the four citizens whom mr hubertson had found absolutely incorruptible among the witnesses the old gentleman whose watch had been stolen mopped his face with a silk bandana and shook his head weakly like a victim of senile dementia but few spectators pitied him their sympathy was for the poor man in the dock as mr hubertson had well said 
a saint who looks like a criminal is far more to be pitied than a criminal who happens to look like a saint the defence mr hubertson was saying does not deny that this old man at some period of his useless life may have owned a watch you have heard him testify that his father gave him one i believe it his father is dead one must believe something you have heard him confess with a reluctance that has not been without its significance that he lost that watch and you have followed my conscientious efforts to elicit from him beyond a reasonable doubt when how and where he obtained another he has forgotten he does not know he does not remember he is by no means certain he refuses to answer driven at last into a corner he snarls that he still believes the watch in this case to be his personal property why gentlemen he does not even know the number eleven four nine seven a child would remember it of the timepiece he has the unblushing effrontery to come here and testify was stolen from him by this defendant mr hubertson paused took a drink of water and let the significant facts sink slowly into his hearers even without pirates on the jury it would have been a remarkable trial for the energy imagination and acumen of mr hubertson had exploded bomb after bomb in the camp of a district attorney who had made the natural mistake of not taking the case with sufficient seriousness the facts were too obvious the prisoner had no witnesses he had been caught with the watch nobody else could have killed the turnkey press and public were indifferent to him the first day of the trial had been almost without spectators mr hubertson would delay justice lose his case and pocket a fee for doing so the court knew him as a petty criminal lawyer of rather flamboyant imagination what it did not suspect was that for the first time in his career mr hubertson was properly financed the legal record familiar to students of law as nine puff new york one three four five people versus toad hunter believes to this day that slant eyes real name was obadiah toad hunter that he had come to new york from violet dale new hampshire that he enjoyed chewing a straw and that the rusty camphor smelling black coat and high uncomfortable collar in which his attorney presented him to the jury were the best clothes and this in itself was pathetic worn hitherto only at weddings funerals corn huskings and other innocent village dissipations there was then no telegraph from new york to prove that there was no violet dale in new hampshire nor any system of police communication by which a startled district attorney could quickly locate the real township from which mr hubertson had produced the quaint old country folk who now sat timidly together on the yellow settee reserved for witnesses no witnesses for the prisoner these were his witnesses and they were real country people there shone the genius of hubert hubertson anywhere you might have seen it the group would have been touchingly venerable except for obadiah's girlish sweetheart priscilla eton and miss eton would have made any man who was a man feel like taking her in his arms and comforting her the very presence of these old folks from home had jumped the case into the public eye and heart and crowded the court on the second morning as the evening gazette had said in an editorial justice must be blind the innocent must suffer with the guilty yet we should esteem ourselves less than human if we did not hope that the tender instinct of these fine old violet dalians will be justified and that evidence may yet be forthcoming to refute testimony that is so far largely circumstantial no case in short could have been going better for the defence 
and nothing clouded the satisfaction of Mr. Hubertson except the behaviour of his eight pirates. Like all born orators, Mr. Hubertson was keenly sensitive to the mood of his audience. He liked to feel his hearers following his thought like sunflowers following the sun, and nothing is more distressing to such a mind than an audience that scowls, whispers, and scuffs with its feet. Of course they knew he was lying, but that should have made them all the more appreciative of the grand style in which he was doing it. And now, gentlemen, went on Mr. Hubertson, who, I ask you, does remember the number of this watch? The defendant's white-haired father, who gave it to him on his twenty-first birthday. His gentle aged mother, who helped pick it out. The venerable men to whom he showed it, pointing to the number with that natural pride that we all feel in our first watch. And to whom did this good young man show it? To no tavern companions, but to the fine old clergyman who had baptised him Obadiah in the Second Baptist Church of Violetdale, and to the stern, gentle, time-worn doctor who had saved him from measles and whooping cough, childish distempers from which we have all suffered. You will say, he added with a contemptuous glance at the district attorney, that Miss Eaton did not remember it. I grant you that. Yes, I grant you that. I make no charges. I only state without hesitation, as these gentlemen will state in the sacred seclusion of their incorruptible jury, that I or you, Mr. District Attorney, or any one of us, being a stranger in New York and feeling alien fingers, old or young, tugging at his watch chain, would drop his watch down his neck and hurry from such a dangerous neighbourhood. Which don't hide from me, whispered Juryman Red Whisker to Juryman Yellow Moustaches as it were, the old feller's watch to start with. And now, gentlemen, resumed Mr. Hubertson, I might make a joke and say that I turn from watch to turnkey. An accursed poor specimen, now you got it out, muttered Juryman Yellow Moustaches. But this is no time for humour. It's time for a drink whispered Juryman Nosering to his next neighbour, and a long time over. You will no doubt argue that any one of us thrown into a gloomy cell on the absurd charge of stealing his own watch would lose his temper and assault the turnkey, fatally if possible. But you will decide also whether such an assault was actually committed. There was no witness. I cannot summon the turnkey before you. I am not Gabriel. And a putty one ye'd make, cuss ye, muttered Juryman Yellow Moustaches. If I were Gabriel, I would blow my trump, call that unfortunate official to the witness stand, and ask him one question. Did you, or did you not, on entering this defendant's cell, trip? Fall and strike your head fatally against a chair. It was a pertinent, surprising question, and the way he put it made most of his hearers see him, a fat, side-whiskered Gabriel, white-robed and blowing. In the jury box, Tarbosh, Sullivan, Doodleberg and Wheat, the four incorruptible citizens sat rigid with conscientious attention. But it jarred Mr. Hubertson to see that the rest of the jury fidgeted even in the presence of Gabriel. Glad as he was to have them there, he again wished heartily that they were either not so nervous or would be polite enough to conceal it. Nothing had completely held their attention but the testimony of the old folks from home, 
and especially Miss Eaton's prissily bashful relation of her engagement to Obadiah. Probably, thought Mr. Hubertson, they had no taste for oratory, as some men have no real feeling for the cornet. But the least they could do was to look a little more as if they believed what he was saying. The important thing, however, was that Tarbosch, Sullivan, Doodleberg, and Weeks hung on his words with a flattering attention. "'My learned brother,' he resumed with an indignant glance at the pirates that at least stopped their whispering, "'smiles to think that this conclusive evidence is impossible. Let him not be too certain.' You, gentlemen, can summon that witness not by the discredited arts of the magician, but by sheer intellect. You, gentlemen, can evoke that scene as it must have happened with a toad-hunter, not as it might have happened had I, for example, been the prisoner. You know, for you have heard this wise old physician testify, that Obadiah Toad-Hunter could not bear the sight of blood. He fainted if he cut his finger. And you have heard this aged father testify that he could not beat. I repeat his own words, spoken with what sincerity of remorseful tears we have all witnessed. He could not beat, thrash, pummel, or otherwise persuade his tender-hearted son into killing a potato-buck. Obadiah Toad-Hunter could not kill potato-bucks. Does it need a miracle, gentlemen, to convince you, beyond reasonable doubt, that he could not kill turnkeys? Or do you need the turnkey to tell you how, on that fatal evening in the half-light of that gloomy cell, he tripped and fell, breaking the chair, breaking his neck, and, except for you, breaking the life of this fine young husbandman, his aged father and mother, his oldest friends, and last but not least, this sweet girl, graduate of Violet Dale High School, who I see has again swooned from the excess of her natural emotions. He sat down, visibly overcome by his own emotion, and Judge Bean, rising behind his desk, cleared his throat preparatory to charging the jury. 3. In the smoky jury-room, twelve stern men, sternness was about the only quality they had in common, agreed to consider the turnkey first and the watch afterward. On this count, Judge Bean had charged them with his usual dry judicial common sense. The prosecution, he said, claimed that Toad Hunter had waited, chair in hand, for his victim. If they believed the prosecution, they would find Toad Hunter guilty. The defence, he added, said the turnkey had tripped, fallen, and broken his own neck. If they believed that, they would find Toad Hunter innocent. And now the jury had been out five hours. Nineteen ballots, each obstinately repeating, guilty, eight, not guilty, four, had already been taken. There they stuck, four incorruptible citizens on one side and eight pirates on the other. As Yellow Moustaches characteristically put it, What in the... the... <sighs> were they going to do next? I'll sit here and die of thirst, said Juryman Red Whisker doggedly, for I'll toddle back in that courtroom and be made a laughing stock. Any fool can see a slant I told on her killed the turnkey. And as for his silly family, what you seems to think so much on, Mr. Tabosh, you take it from me as they'll be better off without him. They don't think so, said Mr. Tarbosh, an honest man with a thin beard and an indomitable obstinacy. 
but the important fact to me is that toad hunter's father couldn't make him kill the potato bugs you can't get round it as the twig is bent gentlemen so is the tree inclined nothing will ever convince me that that man could commit murder you take it from me tabosh said the juryman nosering keenly if the cuss wouldn't kill potato bugs it weren't because his heart stopped him it were his stomach maybe it made him feel sick like to see the little fellers go squash and he blew six triumphant puffs of smoke straight through his pendant nose ornament truly it was a scene and situation quite unlike what mr hubertson had anticipated and yet he was directly responsible skilfully as he might forecast the effect of violet dale and oratory on incorruptible citizens yet men with hearts in their bosoms mr hubertson had never before addressed a jury of pirates men without hearts in their bosoms proud of it and likely if anything to be repelled and disgusted by any obvious appeal to that flabby centre of feminising emotion from his point of view eight jurors were safely accounted for at the worst disagreement was certain and he had so to speak spit on the palms of eloquence and gone hot foot after tarbosh sullivan doodleburg and weeks to make sure of acquittal he had convinced tarbosh sullivan doodleburg and weeks but he had also up to a certain point convinced red whisker yellow moustaches and their evil associates if you have no heart there are your eyes ears and keen native intelligence he had convinced them almost from the beginning that they were a remarkably brainy and patriotic jury he had convinced them that slant eye's real name was obadiah toad hunter they had known nothing of slant eye's youth or antecedents his name might easily enough have been toad hunter and they had been uninformed of mr hubertson's intentions almost before they knew it they had swallowed the old folks from violet dale swallowed miss eton swallowed the potato bugs and in proportion as they digested these morsels they had lost slant eye whom they had known and loved for his bloodthirsty and unsentimental character in a toad hunter who frankly made them extremely tired the one thing they had not swallowed was that obadiah toad hunter had not killed the turnkey there they knew better and every mushy effort of mr hubertson to make them believe the contrary for they forgot completely that he was not really addressing them had insulted their new-born self-respect as jurymen and increased their hostility to his straw-chewing client so here we sit twelve uncommonly brainy men snarled a short stout pirate whose irregular brown face and small knobby nose gave him an almost comic resemblance to the chosen prey of the insect under discussion and what i axes is be we a tryin of this cussed assassin for a killin a potato bug or be we a tryin of him for a killin a turnkey we are not trying of him at all said mr tarbosh with coldly sarcastic emphasis we are examining evidence and when his own father testifies that he couldn't it was a hopeless discussion it went round and round like a happy child on the flying horses and came back each time just where it started it accomplished nothing but to make a man thirsty red whisker yellow moustaches nose ring and the wretch whose appearance suggested a cruel but intelligent potato looked again at their watches muttered between their teeth and glanced with savage despair at the door and windows the four other pirates had sensibly gone to sleep sarcastically leaving instructions to call them in time for the next ballot a locked door barred windows although they had tarbosh sullivan doodleburg and weeks right there in the room with them they knew better face to face as they had just been with the grim and awful majesty of a judge sitting on a bench 
than to yield to natural impulse, spring upon their fellow jurymen and tear their incorruptible limbs from their incorruptible bodies. No way out of it but to make them see by peaceful persuasion that Toad Hunter deserved hanging. After that they might get a chance at Hubertson, who had said nothing whatever about this absurd practice of locking men up to talk things over, and with nothing to drink but water. When I was with Jackson at New Orleans, said Mr. Sullivan suddenly, perhaps remembering that it was at least twenty minutes since he had modestly mentioned his war record, one of our men fell out of a window and broke his neck. I put the fact forward for what it is worth. Mr. Weeks drummed on the table to attract attention. He leaned forward. He had something so important to say that, command himself as he might, he could hardly say it. It strikes me as worth a good deal, he exclaimed forcibly. Follow me now closely. Putting together what this gentleman has suggested about squashing potato bugs, and what this gentleman tells us of his personal observation of a man breaking his neck from a fall, I don't see really how we can escape two conclusions. First, the prisoner might have killed the turnkey. Second, the turnkey might have killed himself. Gentlemen, I think we are getting nearer a solution. Red Whisker spat out a bitter and complicated oath perhaps the most shocking that has ever before or since been heard in a jury-room. His quick, resourceful mind saw clearly that they were not getting nearer a solution, were, if anything, farther away than ever. He grasped his passions in one strong hand and rubbed his head violently with the other. Tarbosh, Sullivan, Doodleberg, Weeks! He studied them savagely through half-closed eyelids. Nothing, evidently, would convince the numbskulls but some tangible proof, the inevitable conviction of an eye-witness. Well, they should have it. He laid his pipe carefully on the table, pushed back his chair with a hideous squeak that awoke his sleeping companions, dragged his chair across the room and stood it up forcibly in the corner. Then, grinding his teeth steadily behind his quivering whiskers, he paced six paces from the chair and marked the place with a guilty ballot. Then he stopped grinding his teeth long enough to articulate. "'There's the chair,' he said briskly, "'and there's the door of the cell where they locked the cuss up. If any gentleman in this room can fall over that ballot and manage to break his neck a hitting that chair, I'll vote not guilty. And what's more, he added, as no one rose eagerly to try the experiment, I'll show ye myself as it ain't possible. At that tense moment, as often happens when twelve intelligent men strive to penetrate through a fog of conflicting evidence to the lighthouse of truth, not one of them thought of Obadiah Toadhunter. He had become a case. He had no aged parents, no girlish sweetheart. He had never been baptised by one venerable man and saved from measles and whooping cough by another. The whole grave problem discussed, as it were, in the very shadow of the gallows, simmered down to one practical question. Would or would not this forceful juryman break his neck? The seven pirates looked worried, but well they knew that no human power could stop their comrade as he backed slowly to the far end of the jury-room. The conscientious faces of Tarbosh, Sullivan, Doodleberg, and Weeks beamed already with the ineffable expression of men who told you so. "'Here I goes, gentlemen,' cried Red Whisker warningly, and added with fine sarcasm, "'If I breaks my neck, I points Mr. Tabosh to throw my little vote at the next election.' Without another word he hurled himself chairward. Truly had Mr. Hubertson said that by sheer intellect they would be able to summon the turnkey into their jury-room. 
he reached the ballot, he left the floor, for what seemed a long time they saw the twin soles of his shoes supported like a modern aeroplane only by the speed of his indomitable propeller, and then, at last, the shocking thud of a falling body and the crash of splintered furniture. Even Mr. Tarbosh had to admit beyond a reasonable doubt that no turnkey could have hit a chair harder. 4. Everybody in the court stood up like one man and woman. Twilight was falling. Here and there a lamp had been lighted, and Judge Bean was again taking his place on the bench. He was a small, dignified justice, his bench presumably hidden somewhere behind his high desk, and when he sat down on it he looked, from some parts of the courtroom, exactly like a human head cut off and left on the desk until somebody should call for it. Opposite this legal head, and beyond the legal furniture where the clerk of the court shuffled his papers and the district attorney consulted with his assistants, Mr. Hubertson chatted with his client, doubtless consoling him for the absence of Mr. and Mrs. Toadhunter, Miss Eaton, the Reverend Mr. Hopkins, and good old Dr. Hooper. Spectators whispered to each other that no wonder the old folks from home were unable to bear the strain of hearing the verdict. Poor dears, they had been through enough already. Yet it was rather a pity they were not present. Without them something would be lacking of the supreme emotion that the pale expectant audience had been waiting all day to experience. Little they guessed that Mr. Hubertson was humming Yankee Doodle under his breath, perfectly certain that the return of the jury at this hour could mean nothing short of acquittal. Nor did they imagine, how could they, the mental ditty to which Obadiah Toadhunter was complacently chewing his straw. The first time as ye kills a man, it makes ye kinder ill. Ye feel so hot ye needs a fan, and then ye has a chill. The second one, he ain't so bad, although he's painful too. For a killin' all is makes ye sad until ye've killed a few. But when ye've killed a score o' men, ye're gettin' used to it. The twenty-first ye slaughters then don't bother ye a bit. And arter that, it's pooty time, he hardly stops to think, for a killin' man is just the same as taking of a drink. The unconcern of the man Toad Hunter, writes Judge Bean in his interesting chapter, My Experience with the Criminal Toad Hunter, an Explanation. See Memories of Bench and Bar, J. Q. Bean. Interested me greatly. He was genuinely cheerful. He seemed actually to regard the forthcoming verdict as something amusing. As I have said already, in a long experience with depraved and criminal types, Toad Hunter was the most evil-looking man, with the possible exception of seven or eight of the jury, that I had ever seen in the dock. I disliked him immensely. He was a murderer, if ever I saw one, wide-jawed, frowsy-headed, and with a Mongolian cast of countenance strongly emphasised by the oblique position of the cruellest eyes I have ever looked into. When those eyes were on me, I confessed to feeling like a mouse under the surveillance of a cat, or, to be more exact, as such a mouse might feel if endowed with my own keen critical intelligence. During the trial he eyed me with increasing malice, as was proved afterward that the ignorant fellow held me personally responsible for his unpleasant predicament. A door at the right opened, the jury filed to their places. Anybody could see that the conscientious men had been having a hard time of it. Four were pallid with their awful responsibility, seven as pallid as their tan permitted. The twelfth, his complexion hidden by his magnificent red whiskers, showed a black and blue lump about the size of a small egg on his forehead, 
which he fingered delicately to find out whether it was still swelling. It had been a hard bump, but it had done the business, convinced Tarbosh, Sullivan, Doodleberg, and Weeks, upset the nice-laid plans of Mr. Hubertson, and was about to hang Obadiah Toadhunter. Altogether the eight pirates glanced with grim satisfaction at their former comrade. And from the dock Slant-Eye smiled back at them, a confident, joyous, happy, contented, come and let us murder and rob together again smile that brushed away every Hubertsonian cobweb and revealed him to them the same old Slant-Eye a worse man if possible and a better pirate than when he had been arrested one after another so rapidly that the result was instantaneous their wicked minds reverted to the time before the trial and horror consternation and despair spread like warm butter over every sin-toasted countenance what after all did his parents matter they saw him in swift imagination hanging like so much bacon and nothing under him but hundreds of smiling upturned interested faces and it was they who had done it with their little ballots the clerk of the court was speaking putting the formal question was obadiah toadhunter guilty or was he not somewhere somebody dropped a pin and everybody else heard it. Guilty, said Foreman Doodleberg. The word issued reluctantly from his pale, firm lips, rose to the ceiling, circled the courtroom, fluttered into the very corners, a black word followed by a profound and seemingly eternal silence. "'And so say you all, gentlemen of the jury?' asked the clerk solemnly. To an amazement from which he never fully recovered, eight of them answered at the same moment. "'Him guilty?' sneered Yellow Moustaches contemptuously. "'You bet we don't, old fella!' shouted Nosering defiantly. "'No such cussed fools as that!' howled the human potato. Doddlebug's a liar, bellowed the juryman with the bump. What we agreed were as he's as innocent as a nothing lamb, poor feller. And with his bump still throbbing, he caught Foreman Doodleberg by his conscientious neck and began shaking him with all the fury of his accumulated desire for rum and water. Rarely, if ever, in a court of justice has a jury experienced a change of heart so soon after bringing in a verdict, and still more rarely has two-thirds of the jury started in to pummel and shake the remaining jurymen. They had long wanted to get their strong, anxious hands on Tarbosh, Sullivan, Doodleberg, and Weeks. Now they would satisfy that lust whatever happened— and they did it so thoroughly that no one else for the moment dared get within reach of them. The scene focused attention on the jury box. On the crowded benches a lady spectator hysterically giggled herself off into a dead faint, and sat senseless and, what was worse, unseeing between two others so interested in the jury that they didn't even know she had fainted. Lawyers, court officials, policemen hovered around the jury box, the space between judge and prisoner was completely emptied. On three sides of the prisoner the cage rose higher than his head, but it was only waist-high on the side nearest the bench, and at the moment when he fully grasped Mr. Doodleberg's verdict, Obadiah Toadhunter, unnoticed in the succeeding excitement, had begun climbing over this insufficient barrier. I had been watching the prisoner closely, writes Judge Bean, at the moment when the jury returned its verdict. His jocose expression instantly vanished. He paid no attention whatever to the surprising riot that ensued among the jurors. His eyes were on me, and he instantly threw one leg menacingly over the rail in front of him. 
although i promptly called attention to what he was doing the court officers busy with the disgraceful scene now going forward in the jury-box paid no attention it was evident that i must deal with toad-hunter myself i spoke to him quietly but with authority go back into the dock toad-hunter i said firmly go back go back 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 this command i emphasized by looking at him steadily back i repeated back 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 i could see that my bearing affected him for i have considerable will-power nevertheless he continued to advance steadily i say steadily the reader must remember that these events took place faster than the calm pen of retrospection can now chronicle their indelible impression quick as a wink as the saying is toad hunter was out of his cage and across the space that separated us my own desk was quite high i had counted upon it to hold him until my voice and will combined to drive him back conquered to his place in the dock unfortunately the man was remarkably agile and acrobatic i had hardly commanded him a dozen times to go back when he rose like a sky-rocket from the other side of the desk and came down on all fours directly in front of me evidently i had miscalculated the time necessary to get him under complete control and now the dignity of my position forbade me to grapple with the fellow in physical combat i remembered that there was usually a policeman at the court-house entrance and i decided to decoy toad hunter in that direction therefore i reversed my formula come on come on i said as i extricated my person from my coat left the garment in the hands of the prisoner and vaulted nimbly over the fairly high rail at the right of the bench the witness-stand was before me i cleared it in the manner of children when they play leapfrog and ran lightly into the judge's corridor still repeating come on come on i led him swiftly along the corridor down the stairs and so to the entrance but i was disappointed to find that the policeman had stepped away for a few moments practically considered the time between red whiskers assault on mr doodleberg and slant eyes arrival on judge bean's desk could have been only a few seconds certainly less than half a minute but busy as he was the resourceful red whisker saw what had happened and passed a quick word to his equally busy companions hardly had judge bean leapfrogged the witness-stand hardly had obadiah toadhunter leapfrogged it after him before red whisker had given mr doodleberg a complicated and painful farewell shake and was over the jury rail nose ring followed yellow moustaches pursued nose ring it was like the circus when the entire company jump over the elephants except that here none of the performers turned somersaults the air of the court in a bee-line from the jury-box to the judge's corridor was full of jurymen it was the only available exit from that crowded courtroom and yet for a moment no observer could guess what they were doing or why they were doing it the corridor swallowed them five three hours later in the cabin of a small rakish-looking schooner steadily holding a seaward course down the harbour nine wicked but cheerful men sat cosily at dinner and maybe the luckiest thing of all said red whisker contentedly were a slant i told hunter recognised the little wagon as they totes you off to jail in there she were a waitin for us when we chases of the judge out of the courthouse and nothin to do but pile aboard lively 
tickle the driver in the ribs business like and tell him to keep the fog bell a goin and point for the arbor end of eight bad men and true by ralph bergengren recording by ruth golding The Rochdale Twenty Eight by Anonymous. This is recorded to celebrate the eighth anniversary of LibriVox. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Rochdale Twenty Eight. Yes, I am one of the Twenty Eight, I am proud to say. We were pioneers, for we cut down the jungle of monopoly, broke up the boulders of high profits and cleared the road for ourselves and our children of not a little roguery. See how many armies of cooperatives are marching triumphantly in our wake. We, the Rochdale Twenty-Eight, were pioneers, made the path for them, as the British engineers made the road to Senefe. Twenty-eight of us met together, exactly twenty-three years ago, and thought we might as well put in our own pockets the profits made by stiff butchers, uncivil grocers, and pitiless tallymen. So we clubbed together, and made up a pound a man, twenty-eight pounds in all, and began to sell tea, sugar, and coffee, in a small shop in a back street. Of course we were laughed at. Our fellow workmen called us the twenty-eight merchant princes, but we persevered, and sold our two ounces of tea and half pounds of sugar cheerfully. One of our number took it in turn to attend three days each week, at breakfast and dinner hour, to sell. At first a penny passbook did for a ledger, as we kept no accounts, we never went in debt, and we gave no credit. In two or three years our fellow workmen found their laugh was on the wrong side. Our business became a thriving one, and the lads and lasses came in crowds to take shares and become their own merchants. We are an institution now, sir, a great English institution, with our well-paid managers, clerks, buyers, shopkeepers, and unpaid committee men. Our books are always open to inspection, and every member learns once a quarter how his capital is growing. We began, I said, with twenty-eight members. There are very nearly seven thousand of us now in this one society. If you want the exact numbers, you can have them. They were, on the 1st of January, 1868, precisely six thousand eight hundred and twenty-three. We are more now than we were this time last year, by five hundred and seventy-seven. That proves how we are getting on. Here is our grand sheet almanac for 1868. We publish an almanac every year now, which our members fix up at home and point to as an authentic record of our progress. You see by the director's report for 1867, contained in the first column, that we don't do business in a back street now. How much money do you think we received last year across the counter for goods? Here it is. Money received for goods sold, £284,910. There is a trade for you. I wonder what the twenty-eight original pioneers would say, if they looked out of the window of the back street shop, and saw this almanac today. You will find we did more business by £34,789 in 1867 than in 1866. Of course, we made money. Why shouldn't we, with such a roaring trade as that? Well, we cleared, after deducting all costs of management, rent, etc., exactly £41,619. I would like to show that entry to the twenty-eight originals. But how they would stare if I read out to them the statement of our accumulated capital. We possess, sir, a capital today of one hundred and twenty-eight thousand four hundred and thirty-five pounds, and that is something for equitable pioneers to boast of. Yet we do not hesitate to invest money in permanent improvements. You see our almanac is illustrated with a handsome engraving, in the legitimate way of old established almanacs. That, sir, is our new central store, of cut stone, four stories high, built, as our architect Mr. Cheatham tells us, in Byzantine Gothic style. The great clock in front, you see, is surmounted by a beehive, for all are gathering honey within. We spent fifteen thousand five hundred pounds on that edifice, and it is, I do not fear to say, a very handsome ornament to the good town of Rochdale. Then we have erected a giant bake-house, to supply pure and wholesome bread to those who may not be able to bake for themselves, and who object to the use of potato flour, ground rice, whiting, or alum in their loaf. We are investing, too, 
ten thousand pounds in building a good class of cottage houses in the town, just the thing required for steady workmen who like a comfortable pleasant home and a bright fireside. We have bought also a piece of the Larkfield estate, the name reminds one of the bird that sings near heaven's gate, and we are preparing plans for laying the ground out to the best advantage. Still our capital amounts to one hundred and twenty-eight thousand four hundred and thirty-five pounds, and we are considering how we may safely employ a portion of it. Parliament last year removed all restrictions but one upon the action of cooperative societies. We can enter upon any business we please now, but that of banking, and Overend, Gurney and Co. are a caution to us not to wish to turn our money in that direction. Yes, there are withdrawals from our society, and that to the tune of thirty-eight thousand nine hundred and eighty-two pounds. Workmen may wish to purchase a cottage, to portion a daughter, to extend or open in business, to help a son on in the world, or to meet, if Providence so wills, the cost of sickness. The shareholders can get their money at any time, with five per cent, up to the hour of withdrawal. So we pioneers offer greater advantages than savings banks. But notwithstanding these withdrawals, we have now twenty-eight thousand four hundred and forty-six pounds more capital than we possessed this time last year. You want to know what we do with the profits? This almanac will tell you. We divide our profits quarterly. First of all, we allow interest at five per cent per annum on all paid-up shares. That in itself is no despicable dividend these times. Then we allow ten per cent as depreciation for all fixed stock. A proportion rather in excess, you will say, but it is better to err on the right side. Thirdly, we deduct two and a half percent off the whole net profits for educational purposes. That is a proper rule for pioneers to adopt. And when we have provided for all these items, we divide the remainder among the members in proportion to the money expended by them with the society. Last year, each member received two shillings and seven pence back out of every pound he spent on purchases at our stores. That profit, and the five percent, and two and a half percent for educational purposes, would have gone elsewhere, without the slightest benefit to the consumers, only for the equitable pioneers. You are curious to know what we mean by educational purposes. Well, again, the almanac must tell you. We don't profess to teach reading, writing, and arithmetic. We mean education for the social life of youth and manhood. We have, you see, a library of about 7,000 volumes of good and useful books, adapted to all classes and ages of readers. The pioneers are of no party in literature. We seek good everywhere. Moreover, we have a very useful institution, called a reference library, always open, in which there are 150 volumes of first-class works, well adapted for giving immediate information on subjects which concern all classes of the community. Then there are large globes, maps, atlases, and a telescope in every reading room for the use of members. We know down in Rochdale all about the march of our army in Abyssinia. We have eleven newsrooms, all airy, cheerful apartments, well warmed and lighted, with comfortable seats and reading desks. The newsrooms are situated in those parts of Rochdale where the working men chiefly live. They have not to walk far from home to the pleasant reading room, where they will find laid out for them daily and weekly newspapers, periodicals, monthly magazines and quarterly reviews, representing all shades of politics, religion and social systems. I had almost forgotten to tell you that if a working man wishes to borrow a microscope to examine fine work, or insects, or flowers gathered in his walks afield, or an opera glass to scan the features of some distinguished lecturer or speaker, or a stereoscope to amuse and instruct the children, he can obtain the loan of them for a trifling fee. We sell the old newspapers and periodicals every three months, and then a mechanic can procure a set of a valuable periodical for a sum almost nominal. The twenty-eight began trade with a very limited stock of groceries. Everybody would want tea, coffee, and sugar, and the trade could be carried on with comparatively little trouble or expense. But under the name groceries, we now include an immense variety of articles. Our object, too, is to save time and trouble, and we think it an equitable thing that the artisan's wife or daughter should be able to purchase all she wants for the week's consumption, or, as to that matter, for half a year's wear, at the one shop. We have ten depots besides this grand central store, which figures in our almanac. At each of these stores a child can buy the general groceries for the household, sure of getting the best articles and full weight. Where she buys the groceries, she can procure all kinds of butcher's meat. We purchase our own fat cattle and prime weather mutton now, sir. We pioneers are rather proud 
when we see a drove of sleek-skinned, bright-eyed, fat bullocks driven down the street, and know they will give juicy joints and rich soups to our wives and children. We make contracts, too, with breeders in the country, who send us up the carcasses by rail. Our experience is not only that we get the best meat at a reasonable price, but more of it, somehow, to the pound weight. The lump of tallow never sticks at the bottom of the purchaser's scale in equitable shops, and our beams are of the same length on either side of the tongue. It would do your heart good on a Friday evening to see poor people, not members, making their little purchases. They know they won't be cheated, and that what they get, little or much, is good. No, we don't sell drapery at all the stores. A gown or shawl, sir, is a matter requiring some consideration and due forethought. Our wives can afford a little walk for such a serious matter as the purchase of a bonnet or a cloak. We have four depots for drapery, and what a world of articles is included under that name! The wives like to bring their husbands with them to these depots. Women, you know, sir, fancy a man's taste in the matter of dress, and if they do consult our taste, sir, we must be a little generous. A single store, but it is a large one, supplies the wants of the pioneers in tailoring. But we have three depots for the sale of boots and shoes, and noisy but serviceable clogs. At all the stores, orders for coal are received, and the housewife gets the best Gilcrow or Whitehaven laid down comfortably in her coal bunk without trouble. We like the half-holiday movement, too, and we close all our houses of business on Tuesdays at two o'clock. That breaks the week. I said we were pioneers, and that a multitude of cooperatives followed in our wake. Just glance at this return from the Rochdale Cooperative Corn Mill Society. The members possess a capital of £89,000, and they did a trade, last year, of £356,440. They have not totted up their profit and loss account for sixty-seven, but they made £18,163 in 1866, on a cash business of £224,122. They deliver, every week, 1,480 sacks of unadulterated flour, 128 loads of oatmeal, and 892 loads of malt and other goods. The members are now laying out £10,000 in erecting malt kilns, for the artisan requires good sound beer or ale, and there will be no cocculus indicus in a cooperative store. No, we cooperatives are not altogether free from losses. We must expect now and then to meet with a rub, and we have suffered somewhat heavily in the matter of cotton. You see, the American Civil War upset the cotton trade for a while altogether, and when the war ended, and cotton came from a hundred different sources, we met a loss amongst the rest by a sudden fall in the raw material. They say the cotton brokers rigged the market, but I don't pretend to know the rights of it. We are working this cooperative manufacturing society at a profit now, but we lost thirteen thousand and thirty-four pounds in the last three years. We comfort ourselves with the thought that we cleared twenty-six thousand four hundred and sixty-one pounds since 1857, so the general balance of profit and loss is in our favour, to the amount of thirteen thousand four hundred pounds, and we are doing a business of one hundred and fifty thousand pounds a year, on a capital of one hundred and eighteen thousand nine hundred and ninety pounds. We have, moreover, a cooperative building society, paying five per cent, and a provident sick and burial society, which has not incurred the animadversion of Mr. Tid Pratt. We have, too, a wholesale society, for the supply of cooperative stores, with a capital of twenty-four thousand two hundred and eight pounds, doing a business of two hundred and fifty-five thousand seven hundred and seventy-nine pounds. But being a wholesale concern, managed by a few, we are satisfied with a profit of only three thousand four hundred and fifty-two pounds yearly. A merchant, with the same amount of capital, would be content with a similar proportion of gain. Then there is a cooperative insurance company, just commencing to work. And as our means increase, there is no knowing what business we may yet undertake. Only we are all determined to proceed with care and caution, and not to risk what we have already won, by rash speculation. I think our almanac, single sheet as it is, gives us twenty-eight some reason to feel proud in being equitable pioneers. End of The Rochdale Twenty-Eight by Anonymous Read by Jason Mills ご一緒を飲んだやっちゃん、有島武雄。リブリボックスの創設8周年を祝って録音されました。リブリボックスの録音はすべてパブリックドメインです。ボランティアについてなど詳しくはサイトをご覧ください。URL、リブリボックス
ドットオーグ。やっちゃんが、黒い石も白い石も、みんな一人で両手で取って、ももの下に入れてしまおうとするから、僕は怒ってやったんだ。やっちゃん、それは僕んだよ。と言っても、やっちゃんは目ばかりくりくりさせて、僕の石までひったくり続けるから、僕は構わずに取り返してやった。そうしたらやっちゃんが生意気に僕のほっぺたをひっかいた。お母さんがいくらやっちゃんは弟だから可愛がるんだとおっしゃったって、やっちゃんがほっぺたをひっかけば僕だって悔しいから、僕も力任せにやっちゃんのちっぽけな鼻のところをひっかいてやった。指の先が目に触った時には、ひっかきながらもちょっと心配だった。ひっかいたらすぐ泣くだろうと思った。そうしたら、いい気持ちだろうと思って引っかいてやった。やっちゃんは泣かないで僕にかかってきた。投げ出していた足を折り曲げて、尻を浮かして、両手を引っかく形にして、黙ったままでかかってきたから、僕は隙を狙って、もう一度、やっちゃんの団子花のところを引っかいてやった。そうしたらやっちゃんは、しばらく顔中をヘンチクリンにしていたが、いきなり尻をドンとついて、僕の胸のところがドキンとするような大きな声で泣き出した。僕はいい気味で、もう一つやっちゃんのほっぺたを投げりつけておいて、やっちゃんの足元に転げているご一緒を大急ぎでひったくってやった。そうしたら、部屋の向こうにひなたぼっこしながら着物を縫っていたばあやが、眼鏡をかけた顔をこちらに向けて、上目でにらみつけながら、また泣かせて、兄さん悪いじゃありませんか。年重のくせに。と言ったが、やっちゃんが足をバタバタやって死にそうに泣くものだから、いきなり立ってきてやっちゃんを抱き上げた。ばあやはやっちゃんにお乳を飲ませているものだから、いつでもやっちゃんの火星をするんだ。そして、おうおう、かわいそうにどこを。本当に悪い兄さんですね。あらこんなに目の下を耳ずばれにして兄さん。ごめんなさいとおっしゃいましおっしゃらないとお母さんに言いつけますよさあ誰がやっちゃんなんかにごめんなさいするもんかはじめって言えばやっちゃんが悪いんだ僕は黙ったままでバーヤをにらみつけてやったバーヤはわーわー泣くやっちゃんの背中を抱いたまま平手でそっと叩きながらやっちゃんをなだめたり僕になんだか小言を言い続けていたが僕がどうしても謝ってやらなかったら、とうとう。それじゃあ、ようござんす。やっちゃん、あとでばあやがお母さんにみんな言いつけてあげますからね。もう泣くんじゃありませんよ。いい子ね。やっちゃんはばあやのごひぞっこ。兄さんと遊ばずにばあやのそばにいらっしゃい。嫌な兄さんだこと。と言って、僕が大急ぎで一塊に集めた碁石のところに手を出して、一つかみつかもうとした。僕は大急ぎで両手で蓋をしたけれども、バーヤは構わずに少しばかり石を拾って、バーヤの座っているところに持って行ってしまった。普段なら僕はバーヤを追いかけて行って、バーヤが何と言ってもそれを取り返してくるんだけれども、やっちゃんの顔に耳ずばれができていると、バーヤの言ったのが気がかりで、もしかするとお母さんにも叱られるだろうと思うと、少しぐらい誤手は取られても我慢する気になった。何しろ、やっちゃんよりは、ずっとたくさんこっちにごしがあるんだから、僕は、威張っていいと思った。そして、部屋の真ん中に陣取って、その石を、黒と白とに分けて、畳の上にきれいに並べ始めた。やっちゃんは、ばあやの膝に抱かれながら、まだ悔しそうに泣き続けていた。ばあやが、父をあてがっても、飲もうとしなかった。時々思い出しては、大きな声を出した。しまいにはその泣き声が少し気になりだして、僕はやっちゃんと喧嘩しなければよかったなぁと思い始めた。さっきやっちゃんがニコニコ笑いながら小さな手に碁石をいっぱい握って、僕がいらないと言ったのも僕は思い出した。その小さな握り拳が僕の目の前でひょっこりひょっこりと動いた。そのうちにばあやが畳の上に握っていた碁石をばらゆと巻くと、泣きじゃくりしていたやっちゃんは急に泣きやんでバーヤの膝から滑り降りて
、それをおもちゃにし始めた。バーヤはそれを見ると、そうそう、そうやって大人に遊びなさいよ。バーヤは、やっちゃんのおちゃんちゃんを急いで縫い上げますからね。と言いながら、せっせと縫い物を始めた。僕はその時、白い石でうさぎを、黒い石で神を作ろうとした。神の方はできたけれども、うさぎの方はあんまり大きく作ったので、片方の耳の先が足りなかった。もう十ほどあればうまく出来上がるんだけれども、やっちゃんが持って行ってしまったんだから仕方がない。やっちゃん、銃だけ白いしくれないと言おうとして、ふっとやっちゃんの方に顔を向けたが、縁側の方に向いて、ご一緒をおもちゃにしているやっちゃんを見たら、口を聞くのが変になった。今、喧嘩したばかりだから、僕から何か言い出してはいけなかった。だから仕方なしに僕はうさぎを崩してしまってもう少し小さく作り直そうとした。でもそうすると亀の方が大きくなりすぎてうさぎが居眠りしないでも亀の方がかけっこに勝ちそうだった。だから困っちゃった。僕はどうしてもやっちゃんに足らない合衆をくれろと言いたくなった。やっちゃんはまだ三つですぐ忘れるからそう言ったらさっきのように丸い握り拳だけうんと手を伸ばしてくれるかもしれないと思った。やっちゃん、と言おうとして、僕はその方を見た。そうしたら、やっちゃんは、バーヤのお尻のところで遊んでいたが、真っ赤な顔になって、目にいっぱい涙をためて、口を大きく開いて、手と足とを一生懸命にバタバタと動かしていた。僕ははじめ、聖子公様にいる、カッタイの小敷が、お金をねだる真似をしているのかと思った。それでも、あのおしゃべりのやっちゃんが、口をきかないのが変だった。おまけに見ていると、両手を口のところに持っていって、無理に口の中に入れようとしたりした。なんだか、ふざけているのではなく、本気の本気らしくなってきた。しまいには、目を白くしたり、黒くしたりして、ゲーゲーと吐き始めた。僕は、君が悪くなってきた。やっちゃんが急に怖い病気になったんだと思い出した。僕は大きな声で、ばあや、ばあや、やっちゃんが病気になったよ、と怒鳴ってしまった。そうしたらばあやはすぐ自分のお尻の方を振り向いたが、やっちゃんの肩に手をかけて自分の方に向けて、急に慌てて後ろからやっちゃんを抱いて、あら、やっちゃん、どうしたんです。口を開けてごらんなさい。口をですよ。こっちを。明るい方を向いて、ああ、ご一緒を飲んだじゃないのと言うと、握り拳を固めて、やっちゃんの背中を続け様に叩きつけた。さあ、カーッと言ってお吐きなさい。それもう一度、どうしようね。やっちゃん、吐くんですよ。バーヤは、やっちゃんをかっきり膝の上に抱き上げて、また背中を叩いた。僕はいつ来たとも知らぬうちに、バーヤのそばに来て立ったままで、やっちゃんの顔を見下ろしていた。やっちゃんの顔は血が出るほど赤くなっていた。バーヤはどもりながら、兄さんあなた、早く行って水を一杯。僕は皆まで聞かずに縁側に飛び出して台所の方にかけていった。水を飲ませさえすれば、やっちゃんの病気は治るに違いないと思った。そうしたらバーヤが後ろからまた呼びかけた。兄さん水は、早くお母さんのところに行って、早く来てくださいと。僕は台所の方に行くのをやめて、今度は一生懸命でお茶の間の方に走った。お母さんも障子を開け放して、ひなたぼっこをしながら静かに縫い物をしていらしった。そのそばで鉄瓶のお湯がいい音を立てて煮えていた。僕にはそこがそんなに静かなのが変に思えた。やっちゃんの病気はもう治っているのかもしれないと思った。けれども、心の内は、かけっこをしているときみたいに、ドキンドキンしていて、うまく口が聞けなかった。お母さん、お母さん、やっちゃんがね、こうやっているんですよ。ばあやが、早く来てって、と言って、やっちゃんの下通るの真似を立ちながらしてみせた。お母さんは、少しだるそうな目をして、ニコニコしながら僕を見たが、僕を見ると、急に二つに折っていた背中を、まっすぐになさった。やっちゃんがどうかしたの僕は一生懸命真面目になって、うん、と思い切り
頭を前の方にこくりとやった。うん、やっちゃんがこうやって病気になったの。僕はもう一度前と同じ真似をした。お母さんは僕を見ていて思わず笑おうとなさったが、すぐ心配そうな顔になって、大急ぎで頭に刺していた針を抜いて、針刺しに刺して、慌てて立ち上がって、前掛けの糸くずを両手ではたきながら、僕の後から、ばあやのいる方にかけていらしった。ばあや、どうしたのお母さんは、僕を押しのけて、ばあやのそばに来て、こうおっしゃった。やっちゃんがあなた、ご意地でもお飲みになったんでしょうか。お飲みになったんでしようかもないもんじゃないか。お母さんの声は、怒った時の声だった。そして、いきなりばあやから、ひったくるようにやっちゃんを抱き取って、自分が、苦しくてたまらないような顔をしながら、バタバタ手足を動かしているやっちゃんをよく見ていらした。象牙のお箸を持ってまいりましょうか。それで喉を撫でますと、ばあやがそう言うか言わぬに、トゲが刺さったんじゃあるまいし、兄さんあなた早く行って水を持っていらっしゃい。と僕の方をご覧になった。ばあやはそれを聞くと立ち上がったが、僕はばあやがやっちゃんをそんなにしたように思ったし、要は僕が言いつかったのだから、バーヤの走るのを突き抜けて台所に駆けつけた。けれども茶碗を探して、それに水を入れるのはバーヤの方が早かった。僕は悔しくなってバーヤにかぶりついた。水は僕が持ってくんだい。お母さんは僕に水を。それどころじゃありませんよ。とバーヤは怒ったような声を出して、僕がかかっていくのを茶碗を持っていない方の手で振り払って、やっちゃんの方に行ってしまった。僕はばあやがあんなに力があるとは思わなかった。僕は、僕だい、僕だい、水は僕が持って行くんだい、と泣きそうに怒って追っかけたけれども、ばあやがそれをお母さんの手に渡すまで、ばあやに追いつくことはできなかった。僕はばあやが水をこぼさないで、それほど早くかけられるとは思わなかった。お母さんはばあやから茶碗を受け取ると、やっちゃんの口のところに持っていった。半分ほど襟首に水がこぼれたけれども、それでもやっちゃんは水が飲めた。やっちゃんはむせて苦しがって、両手で胸のところを引っかくようにした。懐のところに僕が畳んでやった、だまかし船が半分顔を出していた。僕はやっちゃんが本当にかわいそうでたまらなくなった。あんなに苦しめば、きっと死ぬに違いないと思った。死んじゃいけないけれども、きっと死ぬに違いないと思った。今まで悔しがっていた僕は、急に悲しくなった。お母さんの顔が真っ青で、手がブルブル震えて、やっちゃんの顔が真っ赤で、ちっともやっちゃんの顔みたいでないのを見たら、一りぼっちになってしまったようで、我慢のしようもなく涙が出た。お母さんは、僕はベソをかき始めたのに気もつかないで、夢中になってやっちゃんの世話をしていなさった。バーヤは膝をついたなりで、覗き込むように、お母さんとやっちゃんの顔とのくっつき合っているのを見下ろしていた。そのうちに、やっちゃんが胸にあてがっていた手を離して、驚いたような顔をしたと思ったら、いきなりいつもの通りな大きな声を出して、わっと泣き出した。お母さんは、夢中になってやっちゃんを抱きつくめた。バーヤはせき込んで、通りましたね。まあよかったこと。と言った。きっと碁石がお腹の中に入ってしまったのだろう。お母さんも少し安心なさったようだった。僕は泣きながらもお母さんを見たらその目に涙がいっぱい溜まっていた。その時になってお母さんは急に思い出したようにばあやにお医者さんに駆けつけるようにとおっしゃった。ばあやはぴょこぴょこと幾度も頭を下げて前台で顔をふきふき立っていった。泣きわめいているやっちゃんをあやしながら、お母さんはきつい目をして、僕に早く合衆をしまえとおっしゃった。僕は叱られたような、悪いことをしていたような気がして、大急ぎで合衆を、白も黒も構わず、入れ物にしまってしまった。やっちゃんは、寝床の上に寝かされた。どこも痛くはないと見えて、泣くのを予想としては、また急に何か思い出したように、わーっと泣き出した。そして、さあ、もういいのよ、やっちゃん。どこも痛くはありませんわ。弱いこと、そんなに泣いちゃ。母ちゃんが
。おさすりしてあげますからね。泣くんじゃないの。あの兄さん。と言って、僕をみなすったが、僕はしくしくと泣いているのに気がつくと、まあ兄さんも弱虫ね。と言いながら、お母さんも泣き出しなさった。それなのに、泣くのを僕に隠して、泣かないような風をなさるんだ。兄さん、泣いてなんぞいないで。お座布団をここに一つ持ってきてちょうだい、とおっしゃった。僕は、お母さんが泣くので、泣くのを隠すので、なおやっちゃんが死ぬんではないかと心配になって、お母さんのおっしゃる通りにしたら、ひょっとしてやっちゃんが助かるんではないかと思って、すぐ座布団を取りに行ってきた。お医者さんは、白いひげの方のではない、金縁の眼鏡をかけた方のだった。その若いお医者さんが、やっちゃんのお腹をさすったり、手首を握ったりしながら、心配そうな顔をして、お母さんと小さな声でお話をしていた。お医者の帰った時には、やっちゃんは泣き疲れに疲れて、よく寝てしまった。お母さんは、そのそばにじっと座っていた。やっちゃんは、時々怖い夢でも見ると見えて、急に泣き出したりした。その晩は、僕はばあやと寝た。そしてお母さんは、やっちゃんのそばに寝なさった。ばあやが時々起きて、やっちゃんの方に行くので、せっかく眠りかけた僕は、幾度も目を覚ました。やっちゃんがどんなになったかと思うと、僕は本当に寂しく悲しかった。時計が9つ打っても、僕は寝られなかった。寝られないなぁと思っているうちに、ふっと気がついたら、もう朝になっていた。いつの間に寝てしまったんだろう。兄さん目が覚めて、そういう優しい声が僕の耳元でした。お母さんの声を聞くと、僕の体は温かになる。僕は目をパッチリ開いて嬉しくって、思わず寝返りを打って声のする方に向いた。そこにお母さんがちゃんと着替えをして、頭をきれいにいって、ニコニコとして僕を見つめていらしった。お喜び、やっちゃんがね、すっかり良くなってよ。夜中にお通じがあったから、合子が出てきたのよ。でも本当に怖いから、これから兄さんも、合子だけはおもちゃにしないでちょうだいね。兄さん、やっちゃんが悪かったとき、兄さんは泣いていたのね。もう泣かないでもいいことになったのよ。今日こそあなた方に、一番好きなお菓子をあげましょうね。さあ、大きい。と言って、僕の両脇に手を入れて、抱き起こそうとなさった。僕は、くすぐったくって、たまらないから、大きな声を出して、あはは、あはは、と笑った。やっちゃんが、目を覚ましますよ。そんな大きな声をすると。と言って、お母さんはちょっと真面目な顔をなさったが、すぐその後から、ニコニコして、僕の寝巻きを着替えさせてくださった。ごいしを飲んだやっちゃん、有島滝を終わり。この録音は、パブリックドメインです。Excerpts from Punch or the London s h a r a v e r i Volume 108, June 8, 1895, by various authors. Read by Bev Stevens. Robert on the Thames. Me and some of the gents of the London County Council, as they c a l l s theirselves, Has had some considerable differences of opinion lately, but I don't suppose as it will come to much. It seems as some on em has got theirselves elected into the Thames Conservancy gents, and nothing as is done quite satisfies em unless they has the best places on board the crack steamers as takes em either up the river or down the river as the case may be. In course, they all wants the wery best heatables and drinkables and plenty on em. But if the water happens to be jest a little rough, the one thing as they all scrambles for is plenty to heat and plenty to drink and a nice quiet seat in the saloon all the way home. I heard tell the other day as how as some of the Thames Conservancy gents had a reg'lar quarrel with. Some of the county council gents, 
all because of the difference that some on em wants to make in the way in which things is conducted on board when a-goin on their way home it most certainly must make a great difference whether it is a nice brilliant sunny day and all happy on board or whether it is a dull dark rainy day and not room enough for half the company i don't find as how as the two parties in the corporation agrees with one another more than they used to when they used to quarrel so much about everything in fact they seems just as much opposed to each other as ever and i for my part most truly hopes as how as they will continue in the same noble spirit and then they will hate each other with the same cordial hatred as so distinguished them in days gone by i don't know a greater treat myself than spending an hour or two with the county councillors at charing cross they can lay the stingers about in splendid style and both sides of the question much alike in force and very much alike in quality but the very finest sight of all i should think would be to see a thoroughly good set to between a picked set of the thames conservancy and another of the county councillors from what i hears of the former i should think their chance would be grand indeed and from what i have heard of their reckless perseverance i should think their loss almost incredible the thames is the river for me and long may it remain so robert roundabout readings terrible things have been happening in newcastle if any one doubts this statement let him read the following extract from one of the local papers though it is a good while observes a leader writer since it could be said with justice that the trade of the country was advancing by leaps and bounds the observation may with absolute accuracy be made with respect to our newcastle rates they have stolen along with woollen feet and are now about to strike with iron hands i bow to the ground in awe-struck admiration before this picture of rates stealing along on woollen feet and raising iron hands for a deadly blow at the unfortunate ratepayers of newcastle there is something fell and savage in the mere contemplation of it prose is quite inadequate to it it demands rhyme and must have it consider newcastle its pitiful case where the rates have a habit of stealing tis a way they are prone to in many a place and they do it without any feeling they move without noise and they thus get the pull like a cab with a new rubber tire on for their feet it is said are a compound of wool though the hands that they strike with are iron the vision appalls me one glimpse is enough with terror my bosom is heaving yet i venture the hint do not treat it as stuff that steel were more suited for thieving something always appears to be wrong with the streets of bristol i had to notice the melancholy case of christmas street last week the epidemic has now extended to old market street here the pitching is so dangerous that horses fall and break their legs and ladies die from falls on easter mondays a correspondent who calls attention to this matter says that it is quite annoying on a busy day to have to ask customers two three or even four times what they require i scarcely see what this has to do with the pavement but personally i have always found it more than annoying to be asked four times as much as i require even when my requirements are small as they usually are it is gratifying to find that in old market street at any rate the shopkeeper who asks has an equal share of annoyance then again conduit place lower ashley road is not only badly lighted but its name is practically unknown 
even shopkeepers in the neighbourhood and policemen on the beat do not seem to know of it and sometimes lead people astray in consequence this however is not to be wondered at as another difficulty is the numbering of the houses although only about thirty in the road they are divided into five terraces with different sets of numbers which causes endless confusion increase not wanderer the policeman's load ask not the sight of lower ashley road inquire not eagerly for conduit place but start unasking on thy terraced chase these places to policemen are unknown so shall the pride of finding be thine own go forth go forth itinerary pundit and find the place that takes its name from conduit thy journey after many a turn and twist will land thee at lower ashley road in bristol then pause and having raised a thankful voice take midst five terraces thy doubtful choice and envied by policemen on their beats return a lexicon of bristol streets but the badness of the streets and the ignorance of policemen as to their whereabout is nothing to the annoyance caused by the salvation army bands near st clement's church in newfoundland road on ascension day the vicar writes our service was completely stopped for several minutes as the preacher who had a bad cold was unable to shout above the din of the passing drum i shudder to imagine what would have been the plight of the congregation if the preacher had been free from cold and capable of shouting down a drum rowing and cricket are more closely connected than many people suppose in an account of the oxford eight-oared bumping races i read that new college started at a tremendous bat this of course accounts for the bawling on the bank by which these races are always accompanied further on it is stated that new college finished at forty all out which seems rather a small score i commend the brevity of the mayor of cambridge mr hyde hills who being obviously above hyde park does not condescend to the verbosity of the spouters who on sundays congregate in that locality the other day mr hyde hills was elected to be an alderman and all he said was i thank you this is optimi exempli especially for aldermen lately i came across the following touching appeal of an impecunious son to his father sir i have piles of bills regular miles of bills my banking accounts in a hash all on the debtor side naught on the better side the balance you'd hardly call cash tis terrible when you're reduced thus to penury even if that's nothing new hope can i dream of it yes there's a gleam of it my quarter's allowance is due at the big market in newcastle was recently held what a local paper describes as a demonstration in favour of temperance reform demonstration is a delightful word it seems to express in the most compact form enthusiasm and strong language a question of police a few days since liverpool set another lesson to london no doubt with the consent of the Liverpudlians, inclusive of the dangerous classes, the local police force had a grand field day. To quote our excellent contemporary, the Courier, those who witnessed the police's steady march through the streets in three battalions and their effectively performed manoeuvres in Sefton Park would hardly realise what the turnout meant to most of the men they were on duty through the night and had very little rest before they had to parade for inspection with the march out and review and the weather being warm the display involved fatigue so that the refreshments provided were very welcome 
yes and no doubt well deserved but why should london wait why should not we have something of the same kind we might have a grand police review in hyde park all that would be necessary would be to arrange that the metropolitan thieves should keep the ground proverbial parliamentary economy or short commons for upper house don't spare the black rod and then you won't have to spoil the upper housemaid notes from a patient's diary music is a serious therapeutic agent which exercises a genuine and considerable influence over bodily functions the lancet monday feel rather out of sorts slight touch of influenza i fancy send round for doctor he shakes his head gravely and produces stethoscope i protest that there's nothing wrong with my lungs and this is therefore unnecessary but he explains that he treats all his patients by music nowadays supposed stethoscope turns out to be a cornet on which he performs selections from il trovatore for my benefit asks me if i feel better and in order to get rid of him i pretend that i do later on in the day a small musical box arrives labelled to be taken twice a day find it only plays one tune out of rigoletto pitch it out of window tuesday no better consult another doctor who's just taken his degree in music at oxford and is supposed to be very clever he feels my pulse and looks solemn then he asks if i've been giving way to italian opera lately and appears coldly sceptical when i explain that i have been taking it by medical advice prescribes essence of wagner to be taken at short intervals begin by attending a richter concert dr richter's practice is said to be enormous and every part of st james's hall is thronged by his patients wednesday better receive a large number of patent medicine circulars this kind of thing try our indigestion waltzes warranted to cure all headache giddiness and faintness removed at first time of hearing here's another dentists superseded all sufferers from toothache should attend herr boskowski's course of dental piano recitals worth a guinea a stall i also learn that the hirsutine symphony cures baldness and that the pink bavarian band may be engaged to play slumber songs to sufferers from insomnia thursday am aroused by five barrel organs performing simultaneously under my next door neighbor's window send a note round suggesting they should be dispersed answer sorry to cause annoyance but our youngest child is suffering from chicken pox and has been ordered street music every three hours go out to buy an air gun later in the day happening to take up the lancet at the club i find in it a long article on the treatment of pleurisy by beethoven's fifth symphony in c minor friday two seedy-looking men suddenly appear in the drawing-room after dinner to-night discover that they are the brothers tittlebat from the abracadabra music hall and that my wife has engaged them by her doctor's orders to sing comic songs every evening for a fortnight in order to cure the depression of spirits from which she believes herself to be suffering the brothers tittlebat seem to be suffering themselves from elevation of spirits gin to judge by the smell kick them out and decide to emigrate to-morrow sport speculation and counsel's opinion 
so many letters have reached me during the past week begging for my opinion upon the legality of what may be termed sporting financial speculation that i scarcely apologize for asking the hospitality of the columns of the leading law paper to give my response no doubt the inquiry has to some extent been fostered by the report that i was seen taking part in the hippodramatic revels of the derby day it is true that i certainly visited epsom on the occasion in question but only in a semi-official capacity i have the honour to be consulting assessor of the diamond mine salting syndicate limited and in that desirable position have frequently attended the meetings of the directors on occasions so to speak outside the boardroom it is true that my experience as one learned in the law is seldom required at such seasons still the directors as fiduciaries are to be applauded for neglecting no opportunity of availing themselves of my services having satisfactorily explained how it came that i was on the downs when by a not unnatural coincidence the derby was decided i proceed to consider the question that has been propounded to me is sporting speculative finance illegal it is not a matter that can be decided off-hand one must be careful not to interfere with the policy of trade and do nothing to impede the development of honest industry i am asked by a correspondent who dates from sheffield if there is anything undignified in his appearing as a bookie in a pink velvet coat a yellow slouch hat with blue feathers and black leather knickerbockers i can see no objection to a tradesman wearing any costume he determines to select it would perhaps be as well not to attempt to disguise his features as the operation might savour of secrecy the chief element of fraud this limitation of course does not apply to an auctioneer who having his name and address displayed on a board hanging on the rostrum he occupies can legally carry on his business if it so pleases him in a false nose a comic wig and a pair of green spectacles but really a consideration of the costume of the bookie merely reaches the fringe of the subject the real point at issue is this is betting legal or illegal it is hard to say that a bet made on the racecourse is recoverable is questionable suppose that a is prepared to give odds against the earl's choice the favourite quoted officially at two to one at the rate of five shillings against one thousand pounds sterling presume that b agrees to the wager and the earl's choice wins b naturally asks for the immediate payment by a of one thousand pounds sterling a declines has b any remedy against a i am afraid that the court although allowing costs on the higher scale would not assist the plaintiff in making good his claim however it would be possible for b to represent to the other side that the conduct of a was of a character warranting chronic detention in a lunatic asylum if this suggestion were adopted with the necessary discretion i have no doubt that a compromise satisfactory to b would eventually be the outcome of the negotiations however although i am a little uncertain about other bets i have no doubt in my own mind that coach sweepstakes under certain circumstances should be discouraged i do not wish to rely upon case law but would rather appeal to that honest manly feeling that is so i have been given to understand the birthright of every englishman when all nature is smiling and man smoking a three shilling cigar is at rest why trouble about mounts and starters and blanks i have in my mind at this moment the drawing of a certain sweepstakes an eminent counsel i will not mention his name was present and drew a blank on his behalf i appeal for a revision a reversal of judgment do not let there be a mixture of the glories of nature with the ups and downs of sporting speculative practice let those who took part in that sweep winners and losers alike return their stakes i will hold them on the general behalf then when i have received the cash as trustee 
I will find out that eminent counsel and place the money in his hands. I have nothing more to add save to set forth as a guarantee of good faith my signature warranted by my address. A. Briefless, Jr. Pump Handle Court, June 1, 1895. O oh, my prophetic soul, my Punchius! Punch made a great hit in his last cartoon, A Doubtful Stare, and will probably take credit to himself for having been one of the very few who tipped Sir Visto for the Derby. Leads Mercury. Thanks, Mercury, thanks. Acclaim from all ranks, declares Mr. Punch is the prophet to follow. The public rejoices, and Mercury voices the popular praise due to Punchius Apollo. The oracular god, with a genial nod, admits that he knew it, foresaw it, and said it. But, oh, deary, deary, his pen it would weary if, for all his successful straight tips, he took credit. At Delphi of old they sometimes hit the gold, Punch's oracles not to equivocal missed O. Oh. No riddle or rebus contents the new Phoebus, so all wise men twigged when he tipped em Sir Visto. Our Booking Office The particular Baronites to whom the Baron handed over the Holy Estate, a novel in three volumes by two authors, W. H. Wilkins and Frank Thatcher, published by Hutchinson and Company, says that in explanation it is called by its authors a study in morals, but where the morals come in or come out it would be difficult to say. Apparently, in the majority of the characters there is a singular lack of any virtuous quality. A young innocent girl marries a gay soldier and goes out to India. Here she finds herself placed in a land where principles are decidedly at a discount. Her husband turns out, to put it mildly, a blackguard with a big, big B, and his friends are of the same fascinating type. In a typical melodramatic Adelphi villain, there is something almost wholesome as compared with the modern bad man of yellow book fiction, who is simply revolting. By the way, interpolates the Baron, the latest yellow book is comparatively quite decorous, and without an Aubrey Beardsley illustration. Of course, the hero and heroine of the Holy Estate have to pass through the fiery ordeal of Indian society. How they come out of it, the reader may discover. But as pessimism is the artistic order of the day, they are not allowed to finish well and live happy ever afterwards. My Baronitis adds, with a frown, It cannot be called pleasant reading, nor is there in it any sign of the genius of a Doudet or a Zola, which might be accepted as, in some sort, a literary excuse for its being brought into existence. Signed, The Baron de Bookworms. As Broad as Long First Critic Shortness now rules in novel and in song, which, like men's clothes, are cut and made to order. Second critic, it may be tail and lay are now less long, but they make up for it by growing broader. Sporting Paradox Rosebery was more of a favourite when he was an outsider. Perhaps, like his Sir Visto, when an outsider again, which he seems likely soon to be, he will be safer to back for a place, if not for an absolute win. Best solution of ministerial difficulties? Dissolution. A fortiori. Mama. Not asleep yet, George? George. No, I can't get to sleep because Jack says he's got crumbs in his bed. He couldn't make more fuss if it was the whole loaf. Do day. An old comic song resung for the benefit of a French critic. As for English women, their looks and their dress, the less said the better. They have, in M. Doudet's opinion, neither beauty nor taste. The Times correspondent in Paris. 
air duda o alphonse gallantry befits your race do day do day can you look hereafter in an englishwoman's face do day do day say you must have snoozed all night you must have blinked all day have been blind pro tempore to beauty's light do day do day say is every englishwoman then a grundy or a gamp do day do day did you play diogenes without his lamp do day do day say have you joined the pessimist churls who of nothing good can say that you slight our women and insult our girls do day do day say o oh, dan seems empty and beersheba bare do day do day and there's nothing tasteful and there's no one fair do day do day say to the saffron skin of france english rose tints must give way at our british beauties did you get a glance do day do day say you laud male britons whilst you poor dispraise do day do day on our girls and matrons tis a traveller's craze do day do day say the frank abroad is frank from the bells of france away he is doubtless homesick but he need not turn crank do day do day say the less said the better well that's true no doubt do day do day but the little that you have said is all sneer and flout do day do day say the maids of france are fair are the men fair too ah nay not if you're a specimen my debonair do day do day say neither taste nor beauty oh you must have been bad do day do day the mal de mer all the time you must have had do day do day say the jaundice worked its will upon you all the way try again after swallowing a big blue pill do day do day say sands and sea by a harrow boy who was ploughed at exam ploughing the sands has been shown in a letter to the times to be in some cases a productive operation if the sands are well ploughed and well sown then may a fine crop be expected when ploughing the sands is no longer remunerative then let all hands be summoned aboard and the government vessel in search of general election island may plough the sea and come safely into port what is successful ploughing to them will be harrowing to the opposition oh such a day was never seen mr justice day is always a bright never a dull day his judicial utterances are like the sea around the isle of man clear and profound rarely does he miss a good point yet so it was the other day when in a trial of leg verses a heap of people not involving any question of leg bail mr justice day observed i find now very high rank held by doctors in the army there are captain surgeons colonel surgeons and i am not sure there are not generals laughter not sure mr justice why tis as clear as day there is another and a higher grade viz general practitioner a really big purchase by a private individual at a very moderate figure for two hundred and sixty guineas mr w agnew purchased lambeth palace in the distance it is no distance to speak of as tuppence more will take the purchaser by steamboat from almost any landing stage across the river to lambeth it should perhaps be added so as not to frighten the archbishop of canterbury that in the purchase were included old westminster bridge a view of with state barges and boats the whole thames water colour having been painted in oil by scott this lot by great scott went as above mentioned musical exercise for bicyclists try wagner's cycle wants to know 
dear sir i saw a paragraph in the times quite recently headed a confirmed pickpocket i am all for the religious improvement of the dangerous classes and what i want to know is firstly was the lad a pickpocket before he was confirmed secondly or did he become a pickpocket after confirmation thirdly what bishop or curate was responsible for his confirmation other questions arise out of this case but these are enough for the present yours a female searcher from our own small scholar that's where i should like to be sighed sam sucker minimus as in his geography lesson he read the name of orange free state fancy oranges free a model remodeled the revised edition probably to style it the revised version would savor too much of the biblical committee room of an artist's model now removed to the lyric is occasionally funny though not absolutely without being occasionally vulgar its weakest point is its story but as the plot only occasionally obtrudes itself upon the audience the weakest point is therefore not worth mentioning only its strong points which consist in marie tempest's singing but not in what she has to sing and in miss letty lynn's mild warbling and charming dancing which latter thoroughly deserves the hearty encores she obtains as does also mr farcourt's capital rendering of an otherwise not particularly brilliant french laughing song mr eric lewis and mr w blakely attain great distinction by their clever rendering of nothing in particular mr hayden coffin appears depressed but comic relief to his sentimental sadness is given by both lawrence d'orsay with as much of the traditional d'orsay courtliness that is left of it and mr farron soutar worthy inheritor of a double talent lyrics of h greenbank neat as they always are but the compositions of mr sidney jones will probably keep the stage as it is impossible at one hearing at all events to carry any of it away with you the house on this occasion excellent far better than the piece joseph's coat there is a chinese regiment which enjoys the terrible and glorious appellation of the tiger braves they are dressed in coats covered with spots to resemble the skin of the animal from which they take their name the government are a regiment of tiger braves mr chamberlain at birmingham joe who should know all about beasts and caves now calls his willem colleagues tiger braves well his own coat bears strange new party blots he is a leopard who has changed his spots delightful program we see that mr charles reddy advertises a morning concert for june eleven at prince's hall the audience will be there and he will be always ready ay ready exhausted after playing he will reappear and be ready vivus and in fact there is a perfect store of puns on his name which must have frequently occurred to himself as a ready-witted person that he is to be assisted by monsieur emile sore on the violin no one will be sore to hear and that william shakespeare gives his name and presence on this occasion will make the concert ever memorable concert under direction of ubiquitous daniel mayer in himself mayor and corporation of musical world city intelligence in view of the french president's accepting an invitation from the lord mayor the common councillors are daily practising a bacchanalian chorus in harmony of which the words are for he's a jolly good fellow and so say all of us lyceum advertisement king arthur sir henry irving 
nightly performance motto for earl's court exhibition open for wheel or woe combined display of all arms a soiree dansante during the season waters waters everywhere one of the reasons for the popularity of apollinaris water mentioned the other day at a meeting of the waters was that men generally soon become on such intimate terms with this water nymph as to be able to speak of her familiarly as polly whisky and polly seemed to go so well together as to be suggestive of a round dance in which the admirer of polly was whiskying her round the ballroom the gradual rise of johannes in public opinion delayed of course in the first place by politeness on the part of johnny who must cede the pa to polly is due to the fact that the aerated water drinkers had not made up their minds as to whether johannes was to be addressed as joe or johnny we believe that johnny is now the accepted appellation whether johnny and polly are on the best terms this deponent knoweth not nor is he aware that during the season the bishop of bath and wells or the bishop of soder water and man will bless the union of johnny and polly though at one time there was a report to that effect to alter the title of the old semi-nautical drama paul and partner joe of which the second hero was a waterman paul and her partner johnny ought to get on well together after whitsuntide brown you're looking extremely well jones never fitter brown took a run to paris eh jones no saw french play though brown went to seaside or river eh jones no can't stand expensive discomfort i had some decent boating though brown went for inland scenery jones no although i sauntered under noble trees and got some magnificent views brown switzerland italy jones no time for long journeys i enjoyed fine air and walked twenty miles a day studied fine old masters and enjoyed a stroll in a museum which has no equal brown really then in the name of wonder where have you been staying jones in london farewells exchanged and exeunt a knight of the willow or why not sir w g grace dr w g grace whose name has been everywhere of late except where it might well have been on the birthday honours list times why not great scott the play's the thing before the footlights round the ring at lords it little matters easily first is easily first just fancy what a glorious burst from throats aglow with zeal and thirst would hail the knight of batters they've shouted for him many a time whose mellow age is still his prime and others youth surpasses but how they'd make the welkin split if honours donors had the wit to knight this hero of the hit and favourite of the masses the play's the thing sir henry irving sounds well who'll question his deserving when midst the knights they place it but here's a player just as great in his own field why should he wait however high be knighthood's state the name of grace will grace it what greater joy to crowds affords than the announcement grace at lords what lots of lords and graces do less than england's w g to furnish genuine sport and glee to thousands 
who still throng to see how well he times and places true thunderer true he stands the test unmatched unchallengeable best at our best game requite him for thirty years to hold first place and still unpassed keep up the pace pleases a stout sport-loving race by jove sir william gilbert grace sounds splendid punch says knight him in the name of prophet togs it seems that the uniform of the shazada worn by his highness on state occasions in england was designed by a briton and consequently is not included in the official garb of the afghan army presumably the same sartorial artist was responsible for nasrullah's get-up at the derby the son of our ally appeared on that memorable occasion in a harmony in grey grey frock coat waistcoat and trousers with grey fez turban to match no doubt the headdress was relieved with a diamond worth one million pounds or something of the sort just to show that our guest was of eastern origin the following suggestion for complete outfits may be found useful yachting suit of blue serge covered with rubies and diamonds straw hat made of golden wire encrusted with emeralds tan shoes studded with brilliance shirt of silver tissue with collar and cuffs of virgin gold telescope of turquoise with sling of linked queen anne's guineas shooting suit of dittos of gold tissue shoulder guard of diamonds deer stalker of birds of paradise breast feathers boots of young crocodile leather embroidered with lapis lazuli private dinners gold coat and trousers silver shirt and waistcoat diamond opera hat and overcoat of various precious stones handkerchief of woven brilliance necktie of antediluvian aluminium at five hundred and twenty pounds ten shillings fourpence a grain tartarin sur la tamise monsieur alphonse Doudet has gone back to his own country he is pleased with us on the whole we have learnt his language and read his books we are not so clever or intelligent as the french but we are more stable of purpose and despise ridicule and keep ourselves well informed about other countries l'enfant d'ivray peut-être our women however are inferior to french women as they lack either beauty or taste and the less said about their looks and dress the better toujours galant le petit chose picaré tartarin has surpassed himself and if he manages to persuade his fair compatriots that he is sincere in this il aura bien merite de la patrie and will recover all his old popularity nothing will remain for him but to prove that we lost the battle of waterloo and that the lord mayor is a more important person than queen victoria after that o grand homme de la france la patrie reconnaissante the latest edition of the chronicles of holinshed written by john of that ilk honest john is outspoken his motto is the truth and nothing but the truth as far as he can recollect it his memory appears to be good john is frank dramatic temporary proverb adapted for garrick theatre when the hare is away the willard will play regrets to wish is folly to regret absurd that i went out in my new hat and light summer clothes and did not take my umbrella the only day within the last fortnight when there was an hour's rain that i had already accepted an invitation when one to a party that would have been infinitely more pleasant all round subsequently arrived that i took that champagne last night 
and some other things that i left off my winter things before summer had set in that i returned to my winter things just when summer weather did set in that i went out to supper and supped heartily that i didn't have that tooth out when it first pained me that my dentist should take a four days holiday just when i wanted him badly that I put into five sweeps and drew blank. That I lent a man half a sovereign. That I didn't back the winner. Commercial and Nautical Two city men, twin brothers and partners, in character the very reverse of Charles Dickens's kind and generous Cheerybles, are known as the Twin Screws. Whitsuntide don't stop in i'll take you out if you'll only come as the dentist said to the tooth essence of parliament extracted from the diary of toby m p house of commons monday may twenty seven ritchie back to-day after long absence changed address from tower hamlets to croydon waiting to be called to table by speaker had opportunity of hearing long debate round bill promoted by London County Council. Ritchie, as President of Local Government Board in last ministry, made London County Council possible. Happy thought to play him in, as it were, with County Council debate. Been out of it nearly three years now, Toby, said Ritchie, when, one of a score of old members, I went to shake hands and bid him welcome just the same old place perhaps a little duller at the moment what they want is new blood or perhaps better still a reinfusion of old blood can't give them a new county council bill must try and make them somehow sit up these thoughts pressed upon him as he stood at table signing a roll of parliament after having been sworn in brought his hat with him as new members do since as yet they have no peg to hang it on placed it on table whilst he signed the roll passing on to be introduced to speaker observed with a start that there were two hats on the table odd was sure he had brought only one blessed is the man who makes two blades of grass grow where formerly only one peeped forth possibly an algus benison for a man who planting one hat down on a table looks and behold there are two happy omen make the most of it wouldn't do to go off with two hats house sure to remark it besides how could he shake hands with the speaker holding a hat in either hand next best thing to select the newest did so with pretty air of abstraction advanced one step between table and treasury bench on way to speaker's chair when he felt firm grip on his elbow and a well-known voice in his ear give me neither riches nor poverty but do leave me my hat it was the voice of the squire of malwood oh i beg your pardon how d'ye do said ritchie hurriedly returning the squire's sunday hat and taking up his own which had suffered the rigours of a wet and windy nomination day house cheered and laughed natchbull huggison gravely shook his head that's all very well said he but a man who would pander to the lowest instincts of humanity by clearing the way for parish councils would do anything business done another night's talk round welsh disestablishment bill tuesday prospect of hearing john william move adjournment of house over derby day and john lang reply on other side sufficed to crowd benches such encounter of wits rarely delights mankind these degenerate days such lightness of touch such gleaming attack such brilliant defence in short such badinage such persiflage old members recall earlier conflicts in same field 
young members look back on clever speech made by elko in moving adjournment one year capped by equally brilliant speech when in the following session he seconded wilfred lawson on the negative course this and all else would be excelled when john william began to jest and leng made light reply this was natural expectation from reputation of these famous wits in dreary conversation that followed there was one solitary flicker of humour it was discovered by anxious searcher in the circumstance that the whole business was utterly hopelessly prosaic there wasn't a laugh in it from beginning to end house begins to think it has had enough of this elaborate annual tourney of humour next year if motion for adjournment over derby day is made it will be better to have question put forthwith and so divide another experience like the exceedingly bad half hour endured this afternoon is more than should fall to the lot of a single generation business done house agreed by two hundred and twenty one votes against one hundred and seventy four that it could not afford to take a holiday straightway proceeded to waste remainder of sitting in vain repetition of argument round clauses of welsh disestablishment bill thursday well for prince arthur he chanced to be absent to-night when captain tommy bowles hauled alongside silomio and raked him fore and aft kenyon who knows more than you think when you hear him speak tells me it is pretty certain when the next government is formed silomio will have his choice of succeeding either edward gray or sydney buxton neither office is of cabinet rank but with the chief in the lords a statesman of silomio's ability and sagacity can make and keep a position equal in importance and influence to some more highly placed no one will deny that the promotion will have been well earned the sheffield knight has perhaps been more prominently associated with the conduct of colonial affairs than with those nominally directed by lord kimberley with the assistance of edward gray this is a view strengthened by the circumstance of the honourable title conferred upon him by the emissaries from swaziland actually silomio knows quite as much of foreign affairs as he does of colonial to-night on vote on account he concentrated his attention on the action of the foreign office surveying its operations from china to peru he was constrained unreservedly to condemn them everywhere the british minister had truckled to the foreigner the flag of england which the emigrants in the mayflower proudly carried with them even in their exile was dragged through every gutter of foreign capitals there never was a time said silomio when this country was so isolated among the nations of europe this grand speech echoed through nearly empty house prince arthur and his colleagues on front opposition bench as usual paid their distinguished colleague the highest compliment they knew he would say the right thing in the right way at the right time whilst he kept the gate no traitor could pass no harm befall a beloved country so with one accord they went off leaving cassia bianca silomio to tread alone the deck burning with his eloquence on the benches behind sat only tomlinson who sometimes wishes prince arthur had a little more of silomio's go natchbull huggison who doesn't think the knight is quite the model of a country gentleman but likes to hear him shout at the government and captain tommy bowles wearing his best sunday ducks in honour of a sultry day that reminds him faintly of breathless moments spent in the forties in the bite of bedin Salomeo sat down and mopped the shining top of his patriotic head with a handkerchief hemmed in germany the captain catching the chairman's eye with the hook that serves in place of the strong right hand cut off by the flashing blade of the moor whose felucca tommy was boarding under the impression it was a ferry-boat 
sprang to his feet unthinking diatribes he called Salomio's noble speech lamented the effect upon foreign powers of its delivery by a responsible leader of the party and said much else that would have shocked the house had members chanced to be present prince arthur who so acutely felt and so bitterly resented george russell's recent sneer at the patriot knight was spared the anguish of the moment by that carefully concerted movement which happily calls Salomio's colleagues off the front bench when he is about to discourse on foreign affairs. Business done, vote on account agreed to. Friday. House met to wind up business previous to Whitson recess. Alpheus Cleophas, always considerate, been thinking over ways of enjoying the holiday struck him nothing would be nicer than free admission for m p s and their friends to witness process of vivisection put the matter before home secretary in his genial way asquith very sorry but has no power to give the desired admission alpheus cleophas a little depressed but went off with the consciousness that he had at least done his best there is no enterprise in these people toby he complained we in london are much behind the age we haven't here what in paris is i believe called the morgue a nice quiet place to turn into when you are out holiday-making i have my own resources when house is shut and i can't go about the basement and cellars smelling out the oil lamps i sit on edge of fountain in trafalgar square and sniff its balmy waters every one not equally independent if we had only about the parks and in the thoroughfares places open to the respectable public where they might see vivisection going on we should be a happier nation business done house adjourned for the whitson recess back again june ten wail of the wire puller oh dear what can the matter be raspberry doesn't seem hearty tis very well winning the derby blue ribbon but that will not bind up our party nasrullah khan on the sunday immediately following his uncommonly fatiguing first day in town the shazada was requested to visit the zoo wire from porcupine who on account of his splendid set of quills acts as secretary to the zoo society ran thus will khan visit zoo exhausted receivers reply brief but to the point exhibiting fine mastery of english language khan can't classic title for dr grace the centurion end of excerpts from punch or the london charivari volume 108 june 8 1895 by various authors eight o'clock by sarah teasdale this is recorded to celebrate the eighth anniversary of librivox all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Supper comes at five o'clock. At six the evening star. My lover comes at eight o'clock. But eight o'clock is far. How could I bear my pain all day unless I watched to see the clock hands laboring to bring eight o'clock to me? End of Eight O'Clock by Sarah Teasdale Read by Hunter Chapter 8 of The Eighth Illinois by W. T. Good. This is recorded to celebrate the eighth anniversary of LibriVox. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 8. Courage Knows No Color The will to do brave deeds to neither climb nor color owes its birth. Courageous souls are ever white as God's effulgent ray, which touched them into life. The 8th Illinois Volunteer Infantry, which went to the front, enlisted with the ardor of patriots, born of the desire to fight for the country that had given them freedom and protection, to show that they too could fight for the cause of liberty, and finally in aid of the suffering victims of the tyranny of Spain. The colored soldiers of Illinois went forth, not to war against the Spanish soldiers, but against an enemy more dreaded and more decimating to the ranks of the American soldiers who fought in Cuba. Their ready response in the very face of death was in itself an evidence of heroism, which should win the gratitude of every citizen of the state and country. They showed that the same spirit, quickened sense of patriotism and loyalty to the flag, inspires men of all colors and conditions. When the brave soldiers of the Eighth went to war against Yellow Jack in Cuba, there was uppermost in their minds the one thing or thought to show their white liberators that they could offer their life blood as willingly as did the soldiers in the Civil War. The regiment went to Cuba with as much peril ahead as was encountered by the Ninth and Tenth Colored Cavalrymen and the Twenty Fourth and Twenty Fifth Infantries Colored which dashed up the heights of San Juan, and nobly helped carry the day. These colored troops, who did more to elevate the race in the estimation of the world than any other event in its history, encountered a storm of bullets, but the Eighth Illinois had the fatal germs of fever to combat, and great hardships to endure. Illinois will receive a great share of credit given by historians of the future to the colored troops in the war with Spain. The Eighth Illinois only lacked the opportunity to make for Illinois as glorious a record as the cavalry and infantry troops achieved at Santiago. Its name will be enshrined, nevertheless, with the deeds of those daring men, and will sustain the record for unflinching duty and hardihood for which the pace was set by the famous 54th Massachusetts Regiment of the Civil War. Illinois had companies of colored soldiers in the 29th United States Colored Troops, which fought in the Civil War, but the departure of the 8th Illinois for the front marked the representation of the Prairie State for the first time in any war by a full-colored regiment in the government service, or any other state. The 8th was recruited mostly from Chicago, and it also represented all sections of the state, especially in the populous section of the southern part. The Ninth Battalion Chicago, which performed faithful service for the state for years, was the nucleus of the 8th Illinois Regiment. The first apportionment of regiments from the state militia to be called out under the call for 125,000 volunteers did not include the colored boys, but when the first call came to the state, the colored regiment was already in formation, and prepared to answer the call to the front. With amazing rapidity the companies were created and filled to the necessary complement. But the impatient men were compelled to wait for the second call for volunteers, and were the first to be brought into the field under that call. They were prompt to respond. There were in the regiment when it left Chicago 1,500 men, from whom the full strength was selected. Companies A, B, C, D, E, and F were recruited in Chicago and made up from the old 9th Battalion. The remaining companies were enlisted from Bloomington, Springfield, Quincy, Litchfield, Mound City, and Cairo. The departure of the regiment from Chicago saw an outpouring of the entire colored population of the city to see their friends and relatives off to the front. The six companies from Chicago took cars to Springfield, where they went into the field under tents and were encamped beside the Ninth Illinois, which was the other regiment called out under the Second Proclamation. The regiment was in the state fairgrounds nearly two weeks before it was mustered into the Federal Service. On July 13th the oath was taken to defend the flag and obey their superior officers. The muster roll showed 1,195 men and 76 officers. Called to Cuba 
the illinois colored soldiers went to cuba in response to an emergency call news came through a cable to governor tanner from the colonel commanding the first regiment illinois volunteers he implored governor tanner to do all he could to call the first regiment from cuba and thus avert a calamity governor tanner immediately called colonel marshall of the eighth and his officers to a conference and asked if they were willing to go to the front they made a quick response that they were both willing and ready thereupon the governor sent the following telegram springfield illinois august four h c corbin adjutant general washington d c i called the officers of the eighth illinois colored in conference and they are unanimously and enthusiastically in favor of being sent to relieve the first illinois at santiago washington august five governor tanner springfield illinois the secretary appreciates very much the offer of the eighth illinois volunteer infantry for duty in santiago and has directed that the regiment be sent there on steamer yale leaving new york next tuesday the main trouble with our troops now in cuba is that they are suffering from exhaustion and exposure incident to one of the most trying campaigns to which soldiers have ever been subjected h c corbin adjutant general that settled the question following close upon that came the message from the war department ordering the eighth illinois regiment to be in new york city in time to take the steamer yale which left tuesday for santiago this did not leave much time for preparation and as soon as the cars arrived the men were loaded and the start was made the boys felt repaid for all the dangers they were daring by the demonstrations along the route from springfield to new york the regimental clerk wrote back quote, i suppose you know of our trip from springfield to new york the people white and black were very kind to us all along the route when passing through greenfield chillicothe and athens ohio our train was halted by citizens and splendid lunches were given to us without money and without price along with the lunches came kind words of encouragement and beautiful flowers these manifestations of regard made us feel that we were having a part of our reward in advance those good people can never know how their actions inspired us and strengthened us for the hardships that we have seen since that trip End quote. they arrived in new york two men short private george wall and private charles ambrose of company f captain w b ackers they accidentally fell off the train and were too badly injured to proceed august eleven they left new york city for santiago de cuba taking passage on the steamer yale they did not have a picnic on the way over by any means the quartermaster of each company not having a good place to cook for his men could not give them the food they needed they suffered greatly for water all that was furnished was very warm a poor makeshift for a thirsty man they used to kick about chicago water but they would have given a good deal for a drink of lake water on the yale some of the boys paid some waiters twenty-five cents for a drink of ice water the cooler was in the dining room but under heavy guard one man paid one dollar for three cups of coffee they had a very smooth voyage steaming about fifteen or twenty knots an hour for the next two days there was nothing of especial interest being out on the open sea with nothing in sight but the sky above and the blue sea below saturday afternoon they sighted san salvador sunday noon the beautiful verdant hills of cuba burst upon the view and for the rest of the day the cuban coast was in full view in santiago harbor all enjoyed the sight of land and the prospects of a quick landing the reception which was royal is thus described by one of the company officers quote, we dropped anchor in santiago bay just as the sun was setting we are now in waters historic for evermore above us sullen and rugged frowns the moro now dismantled all around us is the now placid water upon whose bosom took place the naval battle which sealed the fate of the spanish government in the western world from the highest point of the moro an american sentinel with the stars and stripes waving cheered our boys and our band responded by playing the star-spangled banner 
it was an inspiring sight which can never be effaced from my memory. The flagstaff and upper deck of the Spanish cruiser, Reina Mercedes, was in full view just inside of the bay, where she was sunk. A little further in, and in full view, could be seen the flagstaff of the Merrimack. Among such surroundings we rested for the night. The next forenoon the lighters came out of the bay to take us up to Santiago. It took quite a half day to transfer the regiment and supplies. About three o'clock we entered the channel. Again the American sentinel from the heights above waved the stars and stripes and cheered as we passed in. The band responded by playing America. We disembarked at Santiago about five o'clock Tuesday, August 16. The first night's experience in Cuba was at Santiago. The men camped in a graveyard. As soon as they surveyed the ground, their admiration for Uncle Sam's boys rose beyond expression. It was a mystery as to how all the United States soldiers ever landed. The place was full of blockhouses, trenches, breastworks, etc., built by the Spaniards, and they really looked impregnable. We found the Cubans to be hard bargain drivers. They were worse than the Spaniards, for they charged double price for everything. Colonel Marshall had a Cuban woman make him a pitcher of coffee. He furnished the coffee, and she furnished the water and the fire. She charged him fifty cents. August the 8th came one of the first honors of the 8th. Colonel Marshall was appointed governor of San Luis. At first great anxiety was manifested on all sides for the health of the colored soldiers. The fever which had so decimated the ranks of the first regiment was certain to attack the newcomers. Fortunately, the rainy season was nearly over, and the eighth suffered but little. End quote. Colonel Marshall's letter. Quote, Our regiment is getting along nicely, and as for discipline and proficiency, I will stake it against any other volunteer regiment that was ever mustered, although reports have gone out to the contrary. There was no truth in the report that we were lawless and undisciplined. No regiment ever acted better than the 8th Illinois, and when the Inspector General arrived from Santiago to investigate the regiment, we were surprised, for we knew nothing of the report until then, and the investigation proved to be a libel. I assure you that the officers and men are on their guard, since we recognize the fact that the colored officers are on trial." The men have proved for years that they are made of all wool and a yard wide. Our success is theirs and that of the whole race. If we fail, the whole race will have to shoulder the burden. We have a good many sick. The morning report showed 161, 90% malarial fever. We have lost five men since we left New York by death. Two died last week. The climate is very hard on the men. We have fared no better than other regiments that preceded us, but the deaths have been fewer. One regiment now, the Ninth Immunes, colored from New Orleans, 1,000 strong, that arrived since we came, has over 80% of its men sick. Talk about immunes. There is no such thing. They are in a bad plight. They will not average 15 men to the company for duty. I am glad to know that we are not forgotten. We should not be, for we are facing a monster more fatal than Spanish bullets in a climate that is filled with fever, with no nourishments for the sick but rice and canned soups. Chickens are one dollar apiece, eggs are seventy-five cents per dozen, fresh meats we never see. Bacon and hardtack every meal, poor water and no ice. How I'd like to see the Armour Avenue ice man tonight! The money raised should be used in buying nourishments for the sick. Then, if there is any left, forward here to buy some things that would not keep or stand the trip without spoiling. Our surgeons are worked very hard, but they are doing all they can for the sick. I visit the hospital every day and speak encouragingly to each man. I have had excellent health myself, but I may be taken down any day, because it looks like every man must get his share of it. We were very lucky that we were sent away from Santiago. It was death to stay there. You had to eat your dinner under a mosquito bar to keep the flies out of your food. The stench was worse than the Chicago River at the stockyards. 
one of the most perplexing problems which threatened the colored soldiers was the question of officers. In the regular service the officers on the commission staff were all white. It had always been contended that while the colored soldiers were brave, they would fight best under white officers, but this the colored soldiers would not admit, and several volunteer companies in different states resigned rather than accept white officers. When the eighth was mustered into the service, the experiment was given a trial, for every officer from corporal to colonel was colored. What the ultimate result will be remains to be seen, but thus far reports have been favorable. The men of the eighth realize that they are on trial, and they act accordingly. Dr. Curtis, first lieutenant and company surgeon, wrote home, quote, We appreciate the interest which all Chicago people manifest in our boys, who are now patriot exiles from their great state. None of our friends needs have any fear about the eighth. She is all right. The reputation of the regiment is safe from the general commanding the division down. All regard the eighth as an exceptional regiment. Our boys perform every duty assigned to them with promptness and in a manner that has uniformity and has solicited favorable comment from the general. Colonel Marshall is held in high esteem by all the officers and men. He is a good commander and has his regiment well in hand. We have had no trouble in maintaining discipline. The statement heretofore made that colored officers could not command colored soldiers will never be made again. If it is, our only reply will be to point to the eighth, and to examine her records as kept in the imperishable archives of the War Department. This will show that there was as little trouble in maintaining discipline in the eighth regiment as in any regiment in the government service, regular or volunteer. At times we all feel like being at home, but we enlisted for two years, and each soldier in our ranks resolutely says, My services the government wants for that length of time. I will answer call every morning for two years. Nay, more, after that, if Uncle Sam should need a well-disciplined regiment to protect his interests in our new territories, whether Cuba, Puerto Rico, or Manila, all that he needs to do is to call the eighth and will answer. We realize the fact that we are making history for our race, and we are willing to make the sacrifice. God knows I would give a month's salary to see my wife and children today but sacrifice is sweetened by the consolation which comes when duty is faithfully done. We propose to make such good soldiers of our men that no American can ever say again that the American Negro is unworthy the uniform of the United States Army, whether it be the ordinary blue of a private grandly and silently walking his post at night, or the colonel with plumed helmet and drawn saber proudly riding at the head of a magnificent regiment. The health of the regiment is fairly good. Malarial fever is the principal sickness. End quote. Marrying Cuban Girls The usual good nature of the colored boys is shown in Cuba as well as at home. They are adapting themselves to circumstances. Unable to bask in the sunshine of their home girls, they are playing Romeo to Cuban Juliets. Several of the eighth have taken Cuban wives and still there are more to follow. A letter from Harry McCard, Hospital Steward. Afro-American Cuban wedding, which occurred Thanksgiving Day. The crowning happiness came to two boys in Company F about two weeks ago, when they were married to two beautiful senoritas of the pale-face and long-haired variety. The wedding, which was a double one, took place in a small grass-roofed house, and was quite as pretty as it was odd. Neither of the grooms could speak or understand a complete sentence in the language of the brides, who in turn could hardly speak a word of English. The services of an interpreter, of course, were required, and after the boys were married, they were well married, for the city mayor, the city judge, and the chief of police all took a hand in the ceremony. Two new firesides have been set up, and the young people seem to be living very happily indeed. I know several more who are preparing for the same important step, strange as it may seem. Harry McCard One of the boys pleads. One of the boys pleads his company guilty of foraging for chicken and shoat. He says that while he did not want to complain, 
he thought it was only fair to say they had seen trouble sometimes in the commissary department. They were especially anxious for the sick boys, who suffered considerably for food. While they were waiting for improvements in supplies, it was generally conceded that the pig or chicken that had more curiosity than good judgment never lived to repeat the experiment. Assigned to Duty The soldiers began active provost duty as soon as they reached Cuba. The regiment landed at Santiago Wharf, marched about a mile from town through deep mud and water, and camped overnight. The next day the 1st Battalion, under command of Lieutenant Colonel Johnson, boarded the train for San Luis, arriving at 4.30, and camped around the depot. August 19th, 2nd and 3rd Battalions arrived in San Luis, with Colonel Marshall in command, camping about one mile from town with three companies of the 1st Battalion, A, B, and C. August 24th, two companies of the 2nd Battalion, C and F, with Major Jackson in command, marched about thirty miles from San Luis to Palma, and were stationed to do duty at that place. Captain R. P. Root had command of Company E, while Captain W. B. Ackers had Company F. Colonel Marshall, with the major part of the regiment, remained at San Luis. All were expected to remain there until called home. It is a much more desirable place than the campgrounds at Santiago. In the first report of the latter place, Colonel Marshall said, quote, I arrived here with 1,195 enlisted men and 76 officers. We have eight men sick. We camped on the battlefield about two miles out. Dead Spanish soldiers are being buried and burned on the hill about a quarter of a mile from us. Others are buried all over the place. It has rained ever since we arrived. At San Luis, conditions are completely changed. The town is well governed, and a thorough renovation of the city has resulted from the reforms instituted by the soldiers. At first the mud and filth was intolerable, but that soon gave place to the order and cleanliness under the direction of the authorities. Chloride of lime was used extensively, and all garbage was burned. The health of the men improved rapidly, and the death rate has been remarkably low." End quote. A good report of the garrison work of the regiment is given by a New York correspondent of a New York paper. He said, quote, On arriving here I found the 8th Illinois, a colored regiment officered by colored men entirely. So much has been said concerning colored men under colored officers, that they would not obey them. I was curious to know how the experiment would work. I secured a pass from Colonel Wood to pass the lines. Arriving at the camp, I asked to be taken to the colonel's tent. I found him an affable, pleasing military gentleman, unaffected by the grave responsibilities resting upon him, and void of that arrogance assumed by the average white officer. He detailed a sergeant of Company A, a graduate of the Chicago High School and member of the senior class of the Northwestern Law School, to accompany me through the camp. The cleanliness of the hospital tents especially attracted my attention. The surgeons in their snow-white jackets were flitting here and there, caring for the invalids, administering with their own hands medicines which it was the duty of the nurses to do, something I did not see done by white surgeons on board the transports. The kitchen arrangements were the best I have seen since the war began. Each company has a large porcelain vessel, in which boiled water is kept for drinking purposes. Every possible sanitary precaution has been taken by the thoughtful officers to avoid disease, and it is safe to say that there are fewer men sick in this than any other regiment in the volunteer army. The guardhouse contained seven men who had visited the canteen too often or frequently. In the tents of more than half the men could be found a Bible, and regardless of what may have been said to the contrary, the men of the 8th Illinois, as a rule, are as orderly and gentlemanly as any regiment in the service. A dress parade that evening, which was ordered in honor of an English army officer visiting the camp, the men presented a splendid appearance. They have mastered the intricacies of the drill. Their even military movement is a thing of beauty." Each soldier prides himself on keeping his uniform and equipment bright. The Englishman was surprised when the captain showed him that not a speck of dirt adhered to his white gloves, 
which he passed over, and in the muzzle of a soldier's gun. The Young Men's Christian Association of Chicago has spread a tent here, in which the boys congregate to write home, read the daily papers, and play games, no cards. They are all healthy and happy. The man who thinks the Negro will not obey officers of his race has but to visit the camps of the 8th Illinois. There being no prejudice here on account of a man's color, the Negro soldier is treated the same as other soldiers are. In fact, there seems to be a preference on the part of the white women for the boys. Some of them are magnificent specimens of manhood. And if the provost guard isn't very strict, a few of the 8th Illinois boys will be left in Cuba as the husbands of planters' daughters. End quote. Glimpse of the Future it is generally conceded that some of the 8th Illinois boys are in Cuba to stay. The country suits them so far as climate is concerned, and the civil and political advantages are certain to attract aspiring and capable colored men. Word has already come that colored soldiers are making investments. Captain Waller and Captain Ockers have closed a deal for a coffee farm. One of the enthusiastic soldiers home on a furlough says, quote, the right kind of a man can make a fortune on this island by George. The natives use the real mahogany wood for kindling fires. The Cuban don't know the value of the stuff. A man could make a fortune off that alone. Now about the school question. There are no schools at present. The government is making preparation to start the schools in the near future. The religion is strictly Catholic. I like the country fine, and in my estimation it is just the place for the colored man. There is no discrimination in Cuba. Everybody looks alike. Many express themselves as wanting to stay here if they get mustered out here. When Uncle Sam establishes a government in Cuba, it will be the place for young lawyers, doctors, and professors. They will have a great field before them. Our politicians will have a chance to display some of their ability, and our ministers need not complain. Colored carpenters, blacksmiths, bricklayers, in fact all mechanics, can find employment. End quote. When the men of the 8th Illinois come marching home, they will be greeted like soldiers who went forth to battle and returned victoriously. They bore hardships like soldiers, and although now and then there were murmurs, the great body of them readily resigned themselves to the unavoidable hardships in the field. The evident decision of the government to keep the 8th Illinois in Cuba on garrison duty this winter is proof of its good behavior and soldierly qualities. The Chicago Evening Post End of Chapter 8 of The 8th Illinois by W. T. Good. Eight Days in New Orleans, Chapter 8, by Albert J. Pickett. This is recorded to celebrate the eighth anniversary of LibriVox. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Eight Days in New Orleans, Chapter 8, The Roads in the Environs, The Town of Carleton, The Woodyards, River Bottoms, etc., of the various delightful rides in the environs of the city, none affords so much interest as the route to Carrollton. You reach that place on a railroad, commencing on the upper part of the second municipality, and running a third of the way through the suburbs of Lafayette, the remainder passing over a wide and lovely plain, with the Mississippi River on your left and the deep and dismal swamp on your right. It is impossible to conceive a more interesting level than this. For as far as the eye can reach, objects of both nature and art are most agreeably presented. The road first passes a splendid country seat, resembling in appearance our imperfect ideas of a French chateau, surrounded with shrubbery of the greenest shade, with orange trees covered with buds and blossoms, whose fragrance embalms the air, and burthened with golden globes which richly glitter in the sun. And next you see, spread out upon this beautiful plain, heads of cattle and sheep, grazing upon the soft green sward, which none but the alluvial bottoms of the noble Mississippi can afford in such inviting varieties. Further on, you enter a pecan grove, resembling some of the oaks in our forest, 
but every tree alike, all of the same size, bearing aloft the nutritious nuts which make them so celebrated. The road passes by many handsome seats and villas, the style of which at once indicates the taste and wealth of the inmates. While enjoying this interesting ride, my mind suddenly fell back upon Orleans, and was at once wrapped in thoughts of futurity, and hundred years hence, where now browse those innocent cattle in undisturbed silence, where now grow the green grass, the vine, and the fig tree, will then be occupied by churches, towers, hotels, and theatres. What place is this? It is a part of New Orleans, the Queen City of America. Carrollton is a small place, but contains some fine residences, and there is a large public garden, tastefully laid out, belonging to the railroad company. The sale of wood seems to be the principal employment of the inhabitants. Rafts containing one hundred large logs, about fifty feet long, almost entirely of ash, pinned together, are floated down from all parts of the world above Orleans, from as high up as Missouri. While winding their way through the tortuous currents of the river, these raftsmen may be considered the most independent set of people that navigate the great watery thoroughfare. All boats and crafts avoid them, and they have nothing to fear. A small hut of the most temporary character, made of boards, and sometimes the bottom of an old yawl, turned up, is all the covering these amphibious and nondescript watermen have. Upon landing, the raft is sold to the proprietor of the woodyard. A log at a time is hauled upon the levee by large chains attached to a stationary windlass. It is then sawed into blocks four feet long, bolted up, and put in cords, which are sold for four dollars. At one of the wood yards, thirty hands were employed, and they sold fifteen thousand dollars worth of wood per year. I must ask pardon for so often recurring to Mr. Calhoun's great inland sea. It is to me the most interesting of all objects. I sat upon the levee at Carrollton. I saw it in all its might and majesty, nothing interposing to intercept the view. I thought of the countless numbers of rills, of the many creeks, of the numerous lakes, and of the untold rivers, rising in different regions and latitudes thousands of miles apart, combining every variety of minerals known to the continent, here passing by me, confined in one vast and deep channel, lashing its banks with violence, and pressing onward and onward its mighty waters to the briny sea. I cannot say, to its ocean home, for it has none. It finds no resting place in the gulf like other rivers, but the sea groans and gives way to its immensity, and we find its discolored current far within the tropics. The reader of this number, being well acquainted with the low, marshy, dismal character of the several mouths of the Mississippi, will doubtless be surprised at being informed that there is a mountain there near four hundred feet high. He has only to reflect that the river from Natchez to the Belize is usually from three to four hundred feet deep. Across the bar, there is only eighteen feet water. Beyond the bar, just in the ocean, the gulf is unfathomable. So then, the river, in going into the sea, has to pass over a mountain, which, it is strange, has not been washed away. For the river, as before observed, is not arrested on its onward course by the ocean to much extent. The levee at Carrollton is considerably higher than the plain upon which reposes the town. This great work, that has occupied the labor, time, and enterprise of Louisiana for years, appears to afford a permanent and durable protection from the floods of the river. It commences at Fort Plaquemines and extends to Baton Rouge, the distance of 163 miles, on the east side of the river. On the west side, it extends as high up as Arkansas, it will average four feet high and fifteen feet wide, and follows the river in its winding course. A visitor, seeing no ditch from which the earth is taken to erect this artificial dike, is at first at a loss to know where the soil was obtained to make it. On the margin of the river, a continual deposit is forming, called bature. This is drawn back from the river and makes the levee. It soon becomes soil, and has given rise to much litigation, for ownership is exercised over it when formed. The levee has not given way in a long time to do any extensive damage. Near this place, in 1816, 
the river rising to an unprecedented height, broke through and inundated much of Orleans, but Governor Clairborne had a vessel sunk in the crevice, which stopped it. End of Chapter 8 of Eight Days in New Orleans by Albert J. Pickett Read by David Lawrence in Central Florida, April 2013《Couplet sur l'heureuse journée du 18 Fructidor, en 5, by P. Delorme. This is recorded to celebrate the 8th anniversary of LibriVox. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. — Mémorable journée du 18 Fructivore, tu seras buriné en caractère d'or, chantons les tamini, concert balgeusery, accourez tous ici pour fêter nos amis. Chantons du directoire les étonnants succès, il s'est couvert de gloire en sauvant les Français. Chantons les tamini sans poudre ni fusil. La main au sac saisie, les piches grues sont pris. La baguette électrique de trois grands magistrats a d'un coup énergique frappé les scélérats. Bientôt tout est fini par les conseils unis, les traîtres sont bannis, chantons les tamini. Au diable aïe la clique des noirs conspirateurs, vive la république et ses libérateurs Chantons les tamini, concert bageux et riz, vont arriver ici grâce à nos vrais amis. Vive du directoire les membres révérés, qu'au temple de mémoire leur nom soit consacré. Fêtons nos trois amis sans tumulte et sans bruit, de jour et non de nuit, chantons les tamini. De la guerre intestine, éteignons les flambeaux. Ô oh, Père Vierge divine, arbore tes rameaux de tes charmeux épris, ici comme à Paris, tes sincères amis diront les Tamini. End of Couplet sur l'heureuse journée du 18 Fructivore en 5 by P. Delorme, sung by Ezwa in Belgium in June 2013. This is the eighth lecture of General Dynamics, Principle of Relativity by Max Planck. This is recorded to celebrate the eighth anniversary of LibriVox. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. In the lecture of yesterday, we saw, by means of examples, that all continuous reversible processes of nature may be represented as consequences of the principles of least action, and that the whole course of such a process is uniquely determined as soon as we know, besides the actions which are exerted upon the system from without, the kinetic potential h is a function of the generalized coordinates and their differential coefficients with respect to time. The determination of this function remains then as a special problem, and we recognize here a rich field for further theories and hypotheses. It is my purpose to discuss with you today an hypothesis which represents a magnificent attempt to establish quite generally the dependency of the kinetic potential h upon the velocities and which is commonly designated as the principle of relativity. The gist of this principle is, it is in no wise possible to detect the motion of a body relative to empty space. In fact, there is absolutely no physical sense in speaking of such a motion. If therefore two observers move with uniform but different velocities, then each of the two with exactly the same right may assert that with respect to empty space he is at rest and there are no physical methods of measurement as enabling us to decide in favor of one or the other. The principle of relativity in its generalized form is a very recent development. The preparatory steps were taken 
by H. A. Lorentz, it was first generally formulated by Albert Einstein, and was developed into a finished mathematical system by H. Minkowski. However, traces of it extend quite far back into the past, and therefore it seems desirable first to say something concerning the history of its development. The principle of relativity has been recognized in mechanics since the time of Galileo and Newton. It is contained in the form of the simple equations of motion of a material point, since these contain only the acceleration and not the velocity of the point. If, therefore, we refer the motion of the point first to the coordinates x, y, z, and again to the coordinates x prime, y prime, z prime of a second system, whose axes are directed parallel to the first, and which moves with velocity nu in the direction of the positive x-axis, x prime equals x minus nu t, y prime equals y z prime equals z and the form of the equations of motion is not changed in the slightest nothing short of the assumption of the general validity of the relativity principle in mechanics can justify the inclusion by physics of the copernican cosmical system since through it the independence of all processes upon the earth of the progressive motion of the earth is secured if one were obliged to take account of this motion, I should have, for example, to admit that the piece of chalk in my hand possesses an enormous kinetic energy corresponding to a velocity of something like 30 kilometers per second. It was without doubt his conviction of the absolute validity of the principle of relativity which guided Heinrich Hertz in the establishment of his fundamental equations for the electrodynamics of moving bodies. The electrodynamics of Hertz is in fact wholly built upon the principle of relativity. It recognizes no absolute motion with regard to empty space. It speaks only of motions of material bodies relative to one another. In accordance with the theory of Hertz, all electrodynamic processes occur in material bodies. If these move, then the electrodynamic processes occurring therein move with them. To speak of an independent state of motion of a medium outside material bodies, such as the ether, has just as little sense in the theory of Hertz as in the modern theory of relativity. But the theory of Hertz has led to various contradictions with experience. I will refer here to the most important of these. Fiso brought into parallelism a bundle of rays originating in a light source L by means of a lens and then brought it into focus by means of a second lens upon a screen S. In the path of the parallel light rays between the two lenses he placed a tube system of such sort that a transparent liquid could be passed through it, and in such a manner that in one half the upper the light rays would pass in the direction of flow of the liquid, while in the other half the lower the light rays would pass in the opposite direction. If now a liquid or gas flow through the tube system with velocity nu, then, in accordance with the theory of Hertz, since light must be a process in the substance, the light waves must be transported with the velocity of the liquid. The velocity of light relative to L and S is therefore in the upper part Q sub zero plus nu and the lower part Q sub zero minus nu. If Q sub zero denote the velocity of light relative to the liquid, the difference of these two velocities to nu should be observable at s through a corresponding interference of the lower and upper light rays and quite independently of the nature of the flowing substance experiment did not confirm this conclusion moreover it showed in gases generally no trace of the expected action i e light is propagated in a flowing gas in the same manner as in a gas at rest on the other hand, in the case of liquids, an effect was certainly indicated, but notably smaller in amount than demanded by the theory of Hertz. Instead of the expected velocity difference to nu, the difference to nu times 
1 minus 1 over n squared only was observed, where n is the refractive index of the liquid. The factor 1 minus 1 over n squared is called the Fresnel coefficient. There is contained for n equals 1 in this expression the result obtained in the case of gases. It follows from the experiment of Fizeau that as regards electrodynamic processes in a gas the motion of the gas is practically immaterial. If therefore one holds that electrodynamic processes require for their propagation a substantial carrier, a special medium, then it must be concluded that this medium, the ether, remains at rest when the gas moves in an arbitrary manner. This interpretation forms the basis of the electrodynamics of Lorentz, involving an absolutely quiescent ether. In accordance with this theory, electrodynamic phenomena have only indirectly to do with the motion of matter. Primarily all electrodynamical actions are propagated in ether at rest. Matter influences this propagation only in a secondary way so far as it is the cause of exciting in greater or less degree resonant vibrations in its smallest parts by means of the electrodynamic waves passing through it. Now, since the refractive properties of substances are also influenced through the resonant vibrations of its smallest particles, there results from this theory a definite connection between the refractive index and the coefficient of Fresnel. And the connection is, as calculation shows, exactly that demanded by measurements. So far, therefore, the theory of Lorentz is confirmed through experience, and the principle of relativity is divested of its general significance. The principle of relativity was immediately confronted by a new difficulty. The theory of a quiescent ether admits the idea of an absolute velocity of a body, namely the velocity relative to the ether. Therefore, in accordance with this theory of two observers A and B who are in empty space and who move relatively to each other with the uniform velocity nu, it would be at best possible for one rightly to assert that he is at rest relative to the ether. If we assume, for example, that at the moment at which the two observers meet and an instantaneous optical signal, a flash, is made by each, then an infinitely thin spherical wave spreads out from the place of its origin in all directions through empty space. If, therefore, the observer A remain at the center of the sphere, the observer B will not remain at the center, and, as judged by the observer B, the light in his own direction of motion must travel with the velocity c minus nu more slowly than in the opposite direction with the velocity c plus nu or then in a perpendicular direction with the velocity square root of quantity c squared minus nu squared under suitable conditions the observer b should be able to detect and measure this sort of effect this elementary consideration led to the celebrated attempt of Michelson to measure the motion of the earth relative to the ether. A parallel beam of rays proceeding from L falls upon a transparent plane parallel to plate P inclined at 45 degrees by which it is in part transmitted and in part reflected. The transmitted and reflected beams are brought into interference by reflection from suitable metallic mirrors S1 and S2, which are removed by the same distance L from P. If now the earth with the whole apparatus moves in the direction of PS sub 1 with the velocity nu, then the time which the light needs in order to go from P to S sub 1 and back is L divided by the quantity C minus nu plus L divided by the quantity C plus nu equals 2L divided by C multiplied by the quantity 1 plus nu squared over C squared plus so on and so on close bracket. On the other hand, the time which the light needs in order to pass from P to S sub 2 and back to P again is 
L divided by the square root of the quantity C squared minus nu squared plus L divided by the square root of the quantity C squared minus nu squared equals 2L divided by C multiplied by the quantity open bracket 1 plus 1 half nu squared divided by C squared plus dot 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 close bracket. If now the whole apparatus be turned through a right angle, a noticeable displacement of the interference bands should result since the time for the passage over the path PS sub 2 is now longer. No trace was observed of the marked effect to be expected. Now, how will it be possible to bring into line this result, established by repeated tests with all the facilities of modern experimental art? E. Cohn has attempted to find the necessary compensation in a certain influence of the air in which the rays are propagated. But for anyone who bears in mind the great results of the atomic theory of dispersion, and who does not renounce the simple explanation which this theory gives for the dependence of the refractive index upon the color without introducing something else in its place, the idea that a moving absolutely transparent medium whose refractive index is absolutely equal to one shall yet have a notable influence upon the velocity of propagation of light, as the theory of cone demands, is not possible of assumption for this theory distinguishes essentially a transparent medium whose refractive index is equal to one from a perfect vacuum for the former the velocity of propagation of light in the direction of the velocity nu of the medium with relation to an observer at rest is q equals c plus nu squared divided by c for a vacuum on the other hand q equals c in the former medium, Cohn's theory of the Michelson experiment predicts no effect, but on the other hand, the Michelson experiment showed give a positive effect in a vacuum. In opposition to E. Cohn, H. A. Lorentz and Fitzgerald ascribe the necessary compensation to a contraction of the whole optical apparatus in the direction of the Earth's motion of the order of magnitude v squared divided by c squared. This assumption allows better of the introduction again of the principle of relativity, but it can first completely satisfy this principle when it appears not as necessary hypothesis made to fit the present special case, but as a consequence of a much more general postulate. We have to thank Albert Einstein for the framing of this postulate and H. Minkowski for its further mathematical development. Above all, the general principle of relativity demands the renunciation of the assumption which led H. A. Lorentz to the framing of his theory of a quiescent ether, the assumption of a substantial carrier of electromagnetic waves. For when such a carrier is present, one must assume a definite velocity of a ponderable body as definable with respect to it, and this is exactly that which is excluded by the relativity principle. Thus the ether drops out of the theory, and with it the possibility of mechanical explanation of electrodynamic processes, i.e. of referring them to motions. The latter difficulty, however, does not signify here so much, since it was already known before, that no mechanical theory founded upon the continuous motions of the ether permits of being completely carried through. In place of the so-called free ether, there is now substituted the absolute vacuum in which electromagnetic energy is independently propagated like ponderable atoms. I believe it follows as a consequence that no physical properties can be consistently ascribed to the absolute vacuum. The dielectric constant and the magnetic permeability of a vacuum have no absolute meaning, only relative. If an electrodynamic process were to occur in a ponderable medium as in a vacuum, then it would have absolutely no sense to distinguish between field strength and induction. In fact, one can ascribe to the vacuum any arbitrary value of the dielectric constant, as is indicated by the various systems of units. But how is it now with regard to the velocity of propagation of light? 
This is also not to be regarded as a property of the vacuum, but as a property of electromagnetic energy which is present in the vacuum. Where there is no energy, there can exist no velocity of propagation. With the complete elimination of the ether, the opportunity is now present for the framing of the principle of relativity. Obviously, we must, as a simple consideration shows, introduce something radically new. In order that the moving observer B mentioned above shall not see the light signal given by him traveling more slowly in his own direction of motion with the velocity C minus nu than in the opposite direction with the velocity C plus nu, it is necessary that he shall not identify the instant of time at which the light had covered the distance C minus nu in the direction of his own motion with the instant of time at which the light has covered the distance C plus nu in the opposite direction, but that he regard the latter instant of time as later. In other words, the observer B measures time differently from observer A. This is a priori quite permissible, for the relativity principle only demands that neither of the two observers shall come into contradiction with himself. However, the possibility is left open that the specifications of times of both observers may be mutually contradictory. It need scarcely be emphasized that this new conception of the idea of time makes the most serious demands upon the capacity of abstraction and the projective power of the physicist. It surpasses in boldness everything previously suggested in speculative natural phenomenon and even in the philosophical theories of knowledge non-euclidean geometry is child's play in comparison and moreover the principle of relativity unlike non-euclidean geometry which only comes seriously into consideration in pure mathematics undoubtedly possesses a real physical significance the revolution introduced in, by this principle into the physical conceptions of the world is only to be compared in extent and depth with that brought about by the introduction of the Copernican system of the universe. Since it is difficult, on account of our habitual notions concerning the idea of absolute time, to protect ourselves without special carefully considered rules against logical mistakes in the necessary processes of thought, we shall adopt the mathematical method of treatment. Let us consider, then, an electrodynamic process in a pure vacuum. First, from the standpoint of an observer A, secondly, from the standpoint of an observer B who moves relatively to observer A with a velocity nu in the direction of the x-axis, then if A employ the system of reference x, y, z, t, and B the system of reference x prime, y prime, z prime, t prime, our first problem is to find the relations among the primed and unprimed quantities. Above all, it is to be noticed that since both systems of reference, the primed and unprimed, are to be like directed, the equations of transformations between the corresponding quantities in the two systems must be so established that it is possible through a transformation of exactly the same kind to pass from the first system to the second and conversely from the second back to the first system. It follows immediately from this that the velocity of light C prime in a vacuum for the observer B is exactly the same as that for observer A. Thus, if C prime and C are different, C prime is greater than C. Say, it would follow that if one passes from one observer A to another observer B who moves with respect to A with uniform velocity, then he would find the velocity of propagation of light for B greater than that for A. This conclusion must likewise hold quite in general independently of the direction in which B moves with respect to A, because all directions in space are equivalent for the observer A. On the same grounds, in passing from B to A, C must be greater than C prime, for all directions in space for the observer B are now equivalent. Since the two inequalities contradict, therefore C prime must be equal to C. 
Of course, this important result may be generalized immediately so that the totality of the quantities independent of the motion, such as the velocity of light in a vacuum, the constant of gravitation between the two bodies at rest, every isolated electric charge, and the entropy of any physical system possess the same values for both observers. On the other hand, this law does not hold for quantities such as energy, volume, temperature, etc. For these quantities depend also on the velocity, and a body which is at rest for A is for B a moving body. We inquire now with regard to the form of the equations of transformation between the unprimed and the primed coordinates. For this purpose, let us consider returning to the previous example, the propagation, as it appears in the two observers A and B, of an instantaneous signal creating an infinitely thin light wave, which at the instant at which the observers meet begins to spread out from the common origin of coordinates. For the observer A, the wave travels out as a spherical wave. x squared plus y squared plus z squared minus c squared t squared equals zero. For the second observer b, the same wave also travels as a spherical wave with the same velocity, x prime squared plus y prime squared plus z prime squared minus c squared t prime squared equals zero. For the first observer has no advantage over the second observer. B can exactly, with the same right as A, assert that he is at rest at the center of the spherical wave, and for B, after unit time, the wave appears with B in the center and A off-center, while its appearance for the observer A after unit time appears with A in the center and B off-center. The equations of transformation must therefore fulfill the condition that the two last equations which represent the same physical process are compatible with each other, and furthermore, the passage from the unprimed to the prime quantities must in no wise be distinguished from the reverse passage from the prime to the unprime quantities. In order to satisfy these conditions, we generalize the equations of transformation set up at the beginning of this lecture for the old mechanical principle of relativity in the following manner. X prime equals kappa times the quantity x minus nu t. Y prime equals lambda y. Z prime equals mu z t prime equals nu t plus rho times x. Here, nu denotes as formerly the velocity of the observer b relative to a and the constants kappa, lambda, mu, nu, and rho are yet to be determined. We must have x equals kappa prime multiplied by the quantity x prime minus nu prime t prime, y equals lambda prime y prime, z equals mu prime z prime, t equals nu prime t prime plus rho prime x prime. It is now easy to see that lambda and lambda prime must both equal 1. For if, for example, lambda be greater than 1, then lambda prime must also be greater than 1, for the two transformations are equivalent with regards to the y-axis. In particular, it is impossible that lambda and lambda prime depend upon the direction of motion of the other observer. But now, since, in accordance with what precedes, lambda equals 1 divided by lambda prime. Each of the two inequalities contradict, and therefore lambda equals lambda prime equals 1. Likewise, mu equals mu prime equals 1. The condition for identity of the two spherical waves then demands that the expression x squared plus y squared plus z squared minus c squared t squared become, through the transformations of coordinates identical with the expression, x prime squared plus y prime squared plus z prime squared minus c squared t prime squared. And from this, the equations of transformations follow without ambiguity 
x prime equals kappa times the quantity x minus nu t y prime equals y z prime equals z and t prime equals kappa multiplied by the quantity t minus nu x divided by c squared wherein kappa equals c divided by the square root of the quantity c squared minus nu squared conversely x equals kappa multiplied by the quantity x prime plus nu t prime y equals y prime z equals z prime and t equals kappa multiplied by the quantity t prime plus vx prime divided by c squared these equations generally permit the passage from the system of reference of one observer to that of the other thanks to lorentz and the principle of relativity asserts that all processes of nature occur in accordance with the same laws and with the same constants for both observers thanks to albert einstein mathematically considered the equations of transformations correspond to a rotation in the four-dimensional system of reference x y z and time through the imaginary angle arctangent i times nu divided by c that's from minkowski accordingly the principle of relativity simply teaches that there is in the four-dimensional system of space and time no special characteristic direction and any doubts concerning the general validity of the principle are of exactly the same kind as those concerning the existence of the antipodians upon the other side of the earth we will first make some applications of the principle of relativity to processes we have already treated above that the result of the michelson experiment is in agreement with the principle of relativity is immediately evident for in accordance with the relativity principle the influence of a uniform motion of the earth upon processes on the earth can under no conditions be detected we consider now the Fizeau experiment with the flowing liquid. If the velocity of propagation of light in the liquid at rest be again q sub zero, then in accordance with the relativity principle, q sub zero is also the velocity of the propagation of light in the flowing liquid for an observer who moves with the liquid. In case we disregard the dispersion of the liquid, for the color of the light is different for the moving observer. If we call this observer B and the velocity of the liquid as above nu, we may employ immediately the above formulae in the calculation of the velocity of propagation of light in the flowing liquid judged by an observer A at the screen S. We have only to put the derivative dx prime by dt prime equals x prime equals q sub zero to seek the corresponding value of the derivative dx by dt equals x dot for this obviously gives the velocity sought now it follows directly from the equations of transformations that dx by dt equals x dot which in turn equals the fraction quantity x dot prime plus nu divided by the quantity one plus nu x dot prime divided by c squared and therefore through appropriate substitution the velocity sought in the upper tube after neglecting the higher powers in nu divided by c and nu divided by q sub zero is x dot equals the quantity q sub zero plus nu all divided by one plus the fraction nu times q sub zero divided by c squared equals q naught plus nu times the quantity one minus q sub zero squared divided by c squared close bracket and the corresponding velocity in the lower tube is q sub zero minus nu multiplied by the quantity one minus the fraction q sub zero squared divided by c squared close bracket the difference of the two velocities is two times nu multiplied by the quantity one minus q sub zero squared over c squared close bracket which equals two nu multiplied by the quantity one minus one over n squared close bracket which is the fresnel coefficient in agreement with the measurements of Fizeau. 
The significance of the principle of relativity extends not only to optical and other electrodynamic phenomena, but also to all processes of ordinary mechanics. But the familiar expression one half m q squared for the kinetic energy of a mass point moving with the velocity q is incompatible with this principle. But, on the other hand, since all mechanics as well as the rest of physics is governed by the principle of least action, the significance of the relativity principle extends at bottom only to the particular form which it prescribes for the kinetic potential h, and this form, though I will not stop to prove it, is characterized by the simple law that the expression h times dt for every space element of a physical system is an invariant so it equals h prime times dt prime with respect to the passage from one observer a to the other observer b or what is the same thing the expression h divided by the quantity square root of c squared minus q squared is in this passage an invariant equaling h prime divided by the square root of the quantity c squared minus q prime squared let us now make some applications of this very general law first to the dynamics of a single mass point in a vacuum whose state is determined by its velocity q let us call the kinetic potential of the mass point for q equals zero h naught and consider now the point at an instant when its velocity is q for an observer b who moves with the velocity q with respect to the observer a q prime equals zero at this instant and therefore h prime equals h naught but now since in general h divided by the square root of the quantity c squared minus q squared equals h prime divided by the quantity square root of c squared minus q prime squared we have after substitution h equals the square root of two terms one minus the second term being the fraction q squared over c squared and this square root is multiplied by h naught this equals the square root again of two terms of one minus the second term being the fraction x dot squared plus y dot squared plus z dot squared in the numerator divided by c squared in the denominator and this square root is multiplied by h sub zero with this value of h the lagrangian equations of motion of the previous lecture are applicable in accordance with an equation from a previous lecture the kinetic energy of the mass point amounts to e equals x dot times the partial derivative of h with respect to x dot plus y dot times the partial derivative of h with respect to y dot plus z dot times the partial derivative of h with respect to z dot subtract h equals q times the partial derivative of h with respect to q minus h and all this equals negative h sub zero divided by the square root of the quantity 1 minus q squared over c squared and the momentum 2 g equals the partial derivative of h with respect to q equals negative q h naught divided by c multiplied by the square root of the quantity c squared minus q squared g over q is called the transverse mass m sub t and dg by dq is the longitudinal mass m sub l of the point accordingly m sub t equals negative h naught divided by the product c times the square root of the quantity c squared minus q squared m sub l equals negative c times h naught divided by the quantity c squared minus q squared which is raised to the three halves for q equals zero we have m sub t equals m sub l equals m sub zero which equals negative h sub zero over c squared it is apparent if one replaces in the above expressions the constant h naught by the constant m naught that the momentum is g equals m sub zero q divided by the quantity square root of one minus q squared over c squared
and the transverse mass m sub t equals m naught divided by the square root of the quantity 1 minus q squared over c squared and the longitudinal mass m sub l equals m naught divided by the quantity 1 minus q squared over c squared all raised to the power of 3 halves and finally that the kinetic energy is e equals m naught c squared divided by the square root of the quantity 1 minus q squared over c squared which equals m naught c squared plus 1 half m naught q squared plus dot 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 the familiar value of ordinary mechanics, one half m naught q squared, appears here therefore only as an approximate value. These equations have been experimentally tested and confirmed through measurements of A. H. Bucherer and E. Hupka upon the magnetic deflection of electrons. A further example of the invariance of H times dt will be taken from electrodynamics. Let us consider in any given medium any electromagnetic field. For any volume element V of the medium, the law holds that V times dt is invariant in the passage from the one to the other observer. It follows from this that H divided by V is invariant, i.e. the kinetic potential of a unit volume or the space density of kinetic potential is invariant. Hence the following relation exists. ED minus HB equals e prime d prime minus h prime b prime wherein e and h denote the field strengths and d and b the corresponding inductions obviously a corresponding law for the space energy density e d plus h b will not hold a third example is selected from thermodynamics if we take the velocity q of a moving body the volume v and the temperature t as independent variables then as i have shown in the previous lecture we shall have for the pressure p and the entropy s the following relations the partial derivative of the kinetic potential h with respect to volume v equals p and the partial derivative of h with respect to t temperature equals s entropy now since v divided by the square root of c squared minus q squared is invariant and s likewise invariant it follows from the invariance of h divided by the square root of c squared minus q squared that p is invariant and also that t divided by the square root of c squared minus q squared is invariant and hence that p equals p prime and t uh, divided by the square root of c squared minus q squared equals t prime divided by the square root of c squared minus q prime squared the two observers a and b would estimate that the pressure of a body is the same but the temperature of the body is different a special case of this example is supplied when the body considered furnishes a black body radiation the black body radiation is the only physical system whose dynamics for quasi stationary processes is known with absolute accuracy that the black body radiation possesses inertia was first pointed out by f hasenhorl for black body radiation at rest the energy e sub zero equals a times t to the power four times v is given by the stefan boltzmann law and the entropy s naught equals the integral d e naught divided by t equals four thirds a times t cubed v and the pressure p naught equals a divided by three multiplied by t to the power of four and therefore in accordance with the above relations the kinetic potential is h naught equals a t to the fourth times v all divided by three let us imagine now a black body radiation moving with the velocity q with respect to the observer a and introduce an observer b who is at rest q equals zero with reference to the black body radiation then h divided by the square root of c squared minus q squared equals h prime divided by the square root of c squared minus q prime squared equals h prime sub zero divided by c.
wherein h prime sub zero equals a times t prime to the power of four times v prime all divided by three taking account of the above general relations between t prime and t v prime and v this gives for the moving black body radiation the kinetic potential h equals a times t to the fourth times v divided by three times the quantity one minus q squared over c squared quantity squared from which all the remaining thermodynamics quantities the pressure p the energy E, the momentum G, the longitudinal and transverse masses M, L, and M, T of the moving black body radiation are uniquely determined. Colleagues, ladies, and gentlemen, I have arrived at the conclusion of my lectures. I have endeavored to bring before you in bold outline those characteristic advances in the present system of physics which, in my opinion, are the most important. Another in my place would perhaps have made another and better choice, and at another time it is quite likely that I myself should have done so. The principle of relativity holds not only for processes in physics, but also for the physicist himself, in that a fixed system of physics exists in reality only for a given physicist and for a given time. But, as in the theory of relativity, there exists invariance in the system of physics, ideas and laws which retain their meaning for all investigators and for all times, and to discover these invariants is always the real endeavor of physical research. We shall work further in this direction in order to leave behind for our successors, where possible, lasting results. For if, while engaged in body and mind and patient and often modest individual endeavor, one thought strengthens and supports us, it is this, that we in physics work not for the day and not for immediate results, so to speak, but for all eternity. I thank you heartily for the encouragement which you have given me. I thank you no less for the patience with which you have followed my lectures to the end, and I trust that it may be possible for many among you to furnish in the direction indicated much valuable service to our beloved science. End of the eighth lecture of Max Planck, entitled General Dynamics, Principle of Relativity. Read by Paul King, pjk.scripts.mit.edu forward slash pkj. Prologue and Epilogue of King Henry the Eighth by William Shakespeare. This is recorded to celebrate the eighth anniversary of LibriVox. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. King Henry the Eighth by William Shakespeare. The Prologue. I come no more to make you laugh. Things now that bear a weighty and a serious brow, sad, high, and working, full of state and woe, such noble scenes as draw the eye to flow we now present. Those that can pity here may, if they think it well, let fall a tear. The subject will deserve it. Such as give their money out of hope they may believe, may here find truth too. Those that come to see only a show or two, and so agree the play may pass, if they be still in willing, I'll undertake may see away their shilling richly in two short hours. Only they that come to hear a merry body play, a noise of targets, or to see a fellow in a long motley coat guarded with yellow, will be deceived. For, gentle hearers, no, to rank our chosen truth with such a show as fool and fight is, besides forfeiting our own brains, and the opinion that we bring to make that only true we now intend, will leave us never an understanding friend. Therefore, for goodness' sake, and as you are known the first and happiest hearers of the town, be sad as we would make ye. Think ye see the very persons of our noble story as they were living. Think you see them great, and followed with the general throng and sweat of thousand friends. Then in a moment see how soon this mightiness meets misery. And if you can be merry then, I'll say a man may weep upon his wedding day. Epilogue 
"'Tis ten to one this play can never please all that are here. "'Some come to take their ease and sleep an act or two. "'But those we fear we have frighted with our trumpets. "'So, tis clear, they'll say tis naught. "'Others to hear the city abused extremely, "'and to cry, that's witty, which we have not done neither. "'That I fear all the expected good we're like to hear "'for this play at this time "'is only in the merciful construction of good women, "'for such a one we showed them. If they smile and say twill do, I know within a while all the best men are ours, for tis ill hap if they hold when their ladies bid em clap. End of the prologue and epilogue of King Henry the Eighth by William Shakespeare. Read by Laurie Ann Walden. Achter Kosmos Vortrag von Alexander von Humboldt this is recorded to celebrate the 8th anniversary of LibriVox. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Achte Vorlesung Die Verteilung der Wärme auf dem Erdkörper begründet das Problem der Klimatologie. Mit Unrecht hat man früher die Modifikationen der Temperatur, bald schützenden Bergzügen, bald der Erhöhung der Erdoberfläche, bald der Wirkung periodischer Windströme zugeschrieben. Die merkwürdigen Abweichungen der Klimate, welche man in großen Länderstrecken zwischen denselben Breitengraden und in derselben Höhe über dem Meeresspiegel wahrnimmt, rühren offenbar nicht her von dem kleinlichen Einflusse individueller Örtlichkeiten, sondern von ausgedehnteren tellurischen Verhältnissen. Sie sind allgemeinen Gesetzen unterworfen, welche durch die Gestalt der Kontinentalmassen, durch ihre Umrisse, den Zustand ihrer Oberfläche, besonders aber durch ihre Stellungs- und Größenverhältnisse zu den benachbarten Meeren bestimmt sind. Herr Professor Karl Ritter hat in seinem vortrefflichen Werke der allgemeinen vergleichenden Geographie sehr genügend dargetan, wie die Natur der Oberfläche in der innigsten Verbindung steht, nicht nur mit der räumlichen Verschiedenheit der Produkte, mit dem Ackerbau und dem Handelsverkehr der Völker, sondern auch mit ihrem ganzen moralischen und politischen Zustande. Wie nun die Bildung der Kontinente entschieden einwirkt auf die Kultur, so ist auch der Einfluss auf das Klima unverkennbar. Unser Europa verdankt sein milderes Klima seiner Position gegen das nahe Meer und seiner gegliederten Gestaltung. Europa ist der westlichste Teil des alten Kontinents und hat also den großen, kältemindernden Atlantischen Ozean im Westen. Zwischen den Meridianen, in denen Europa sich hinstreckt, fällt die Äquatorialzone nicht in das Becken des Ozeans, wie südlich von dem, eben deshalb kälteren Asien. Das sandbedeckte Afrika ist so gelegen, dass Europa von den Luftschichten erwärmt wird, welche, über Afrika aufsteigend, sich von dem Äquator gegen den Nordpol ergießen. Auch erstreckt dieser Weltteil sich weit weniger gegen den Nordpol und liegt überdies dem größten Busen eisfreien Meerwassers gegenüber, den man in der ganzen Polarzone kennt. Auffallend bemerkbar ist, abgesehen von den Breitengraden, das Klima des westlichen und östlichen Europa. Die milde Temperatur des glücklichen Italien, des viel eingeschnittenen Griechenlandes, verändert sich, wird kälter und kälter, je weiter gegen Osten der minder geteilte Kontinent sich dem kompakteren Asien nähert, das da, wo es nicht gewissermaßen durch Flüsse aufgeschlossen ist, auf seinen weiten Steppen auch der Kulturverbreitung hemmende Grenzen gesetzt hat. Zu interessanten Bemerkungen veranlassen die Betrachtungen über die Flexibilität der menschlichen Organisation, welche die verschiedenartigsten klimatischen Verhältnisse zu ertragen fähig ist. Fröhliche Eskimo leben unter den Polarkreisen in niedrigen Erdhütten, deren Fenster aus Eis bestehen, und verfolgen stundenlang ihre Beschäftigungen im Freien, bei einer Temperatur von minus 50 Grad Celsius. Captain Perry hat mit eigens dazu vorgerichteten Alkoholthermometern monatelang hintereinander in der Nähe der Hudson's und Baffins Bay diesen Grad der Kälte beobachtet und aus seinen mündlichen Mitteilungen weiß ich, dass in mäßig warmer Bekleidung er, sowohl als seine Begleiter, bei minus 37 Grad Raumurkälte sich im Freien ohne Unbequemlichkeit bewegen konnten, 
freilich aber nur, wenn nicht durch Winde stets neue erkältende Luftschichten herbeigeführt wurden. Welch ein Kontrast von diesen eisigen Klimaten bis zum Roten Meere, an dessen Ufern die Nähe eines dürren Kontinents wohl beinahe die höchste Temperatur hervorbringt, welche man beobachtet hat. Captain Tucky, derselbe, welcher die Mündung des Niger erforschte, fand am Roten Meere den Stand des Thermometers meist über 28 Grad Reaumur und um 9 Uhr nachmittags im Schatten stets 32 Grad Reaumur. Zu Mursuk in der Oasis von Fetzan fanden mein unglücklicher Freund Ritchie und Lyon, welcher nachmals den Captain Perry auf einer Nordpolexpedition begleitete, eine Temperatur von 38 bis 43 Grad Reaumur. Man kann sich auf die Genauigkeit dieser Angabe verlassen, da Ritchie sehr wohl zu beobachten verstand und mit Instrumenten versehen war, welche Arago, Gay-Lussac und ich mit großer Vorsicht hatten arbeiten lassen. Jedoch kann man nicht annehmen, dass diese Temperatur in der eigentlichen Luftwärme gewesen sei. Vielmehr muss man sie dem in der Luft schwebenden Wärme strahlenden Sande zuschreiben, dessen erhitzte Teile sich gegenseitig anstrahlend, wie auf das Auge des Menschen, so auch auf die Kugel des Thermometers wirken und eine Wärme hervorbringen, welche teils der Luft, teils dieser Ausstrahlung zuzuschreiben ist. Als eine Folge der Lebensfunktion bewahrt aber in sich der Mensch eine andere Quelle der Wärme, die in den verschiedenartigsten Verhältnissen sich tätig erweist. Die innere Temperatur des Menschen, die Wärme seines Blutes, beträgt 30 Grad Reaumur, mit einer Abweichung, die bei veränderten Umständen nicht über ein halb bis drei Viertel Grad Reaumur beträgt. John Davy, der Bruder des berühmteren Sir Humphrey Davy, hat auf seiner Reise nach Ceylon die mannigfaltigsten Beobachtungen in dieser Hinsicht angestellt und bei den verschiedenen indischen Kasten war die Blutwärme gleich groß, sie mochten sich nun bloß von Pflanzen oder nur von Fleisch ernähren. Selbst im pathologischen Zustande, während der größten Fieberhitze, hat man die Kugel des Thermometers unter der Zungenwurzel kaum um drei bis vier Grad Reaumur variieren sehen. Auch ist die Blutwärme aller Säugetiere, der Löwen, Panther etc., der des Menschen sehr ähnlich. Und auch die Vögel, denen man sonst ein viel heißeres Blut zuschrieb, weichen nur um 4 bis 5 Grad Reaumur höhere Temperatur davon ab. Auffallend ist die Bemerkung, dass die Tauben ein um 2 bis 3 Grad Reaumur wärmeres Blut haben als die Papageien. Auch die übermäßigsten Grade der künstlichen Wärme, denen einzelne Menschen sich versuchsweise ausgesetzt, haben keine sehr merkliche Veränderung hervorgebracht. Als Fordes, Banks und Solander sich einer Hitze aussetzten, bei der Eier in wenig Minuten gar gesotten wurden und die ihren Puls auf 144 Schläge in einer Minute steigerte, hatte ihre tierische Wärme nicht um ein Halbgrad zugenommen. Dieselben Gelehrten wiederholten später diese Versuche in Gemeinschaft mit Captain Phipps, dem nochmaligen Lord Mulgrave, der in der Folge eine Reise gegen den Nordpol machte und steigerte durch heiße Wasserdämpfe die Hitze in einem Zimmer bis auf 102,5 Grad Reaumur. Das Wasser siedete, Fleisch kochte und ihre Uhrketten glühten und sie selbst waren doch imstande, in hölzernen Schuhen, diese Temperatur zehn Minuten zu ertragen. Ganz unmöglich würde es aber sein, ähnliche Versuche in tropfbaren Flüssigkeiten anzustellen, weil in ihnen die schützende Ausdünstung wegfiele und durch ihre Schwere die Flüssigkeiten in die Poren eindringen müssten, um die feinsten Spitzen der Nerven sehr schmerzhaft zu affisieren. Man hat neuere, sehr genaue Versuche darüber angestellt, welchen Grad der Hitze Wasser haben könne, um ohne sich zu verbrennen die Hand hineinzutauchen. 40,5 Grad Reaumur ist für diesen Punkt erkannt worden, der unter verschiedenen Abweichungen keine Abweichung von 2 Grad Reaumur zulässt. In Mursuk atmet man also eine Luft, welche diese Temperatur übersteigt und überhaupt ist es auffallend, dass die Reizbarkeit der Teile des Halses minder groß sein muss, indem es Menschen gibt, welche Kaffee trinken können, der bis auf 45 Grad Reaumur heiß ist. Diese Flexibilität gegen die verschiedenen Grade der Wärme ist aber den Menschen nicht allein eigen, auch Tiere teilen dieselbe, wenn auch nicht in demselben Maße, wie Hunde und Pferde davon ein Beispiel geben. 
Bei allen Rassen der Menschen ist sich diese Biegsamkeit aber keineswegs gleich, und es scheint fast, als wenn sie mit der Kultur zunehmend wäre. Es ist gefährlich für die Eingeborenen Amerikas, sich, an den Bergen aufsteigend, einer Klimaverschiedenheit auszusetzen, die für einen Weißen ganz unschädlich ist. Die menschlichen Leyes de los Indios verbieten daher ganz ausdrücklich, die Indier durch gewisse Täler zu schicken. Aber freilich sind diese Täler auch von einer Tiefe, dass der Pick von Teneriffa darin stehen könnte, ohne sie auszufüllen. Eine der größten Schwierigkeiten, welche sich den Missionen entgegensetzt, ist die unbegreifliche Sterblichkeit, welche in den neuen Ansiedelungen einzureißen pflegt, wenn die Eingeborenen aus ihren dichten Waldungen hervorgehend zuerst den Sonnenstrahlen einer baumlosen Steppe ausgesetzt werden. Wir gehen nun zur Betrachtung der organischen Teile unseres Erdbodens über. Alle Erscheinungen, welche die Atmosphäre und der Ozean uns erkennen ließen, waren gewaltsam und stürmisch, in ihrem Wechsel anscheinend keinem Gesetze unterworfen. Im Bereiche der organischen Entwicklung entdecken wir Gesetze und Regeln, die Welt der Pflanzen insbesondere enthüllt das stille innere Treiben der Natur, die seit Jahrhunderten dieselben Organe entfaltet und noch keinen Frühling ohne Blumen ließ. Die geografische Verbreitung der Pflanzen ist abhängig von den Klimaten. So auch hat der Druck der Atmosphäre einen auffallenden Einfluss auf die Gestalt und das Leben der Gewächse. Dies Leben ist gleichsam nach außen gerichtet. Die Pflanzen leben hauptsächlich an der Oberfläche, daher ihre Abhängigkeit von dem umgebenden Medium. Eine Art Hautrespiration ist die wichtigste Lebenfunktion der Gewächse und diese Respiration, insofern sie verdampfen, aushauchen von Flüssigkeit ist, hängt vom Druck des Luftkreises ab. Daher sind die Alpengewächse aromatischer, daher sind sie behaarter, mit zahlreichen Ausdünstungsgefäßen bedeckt. Nicht die größere Wärme verhindert ihr Gedeihen in der Ebene, sondern weil die Respiration ihrer äußeren Integumente durch den vermehrten Barometerdruck gestört wird und sie den Lichtreiz entbehren, der auf den höheren Gebirgen so viel lebhafter einwirkt. Die Vegetation der südlichen Erdhälfte, die eine pelagische, eine Wasserhemisphäre genannt werden kann, ist auffallend verschieden von der der nördlichen. Die Schmalheit der gegen Süden pyramidalisch sich verengenden Kontinente begründet ein wahres Inselklima, kühle Sommer und milde Winter. So wachsen Palmen und Farrenkräuter dem Pole näher, wie zum Beispiel auf Van Diemen's Land, das einen mit Genf korrespondierenden Breitengrad haben wird. Zur Charakteristik der Pflanzen gehört es überhaupt, dass nicht alle über den Erdball gleichmäßig verteilt sind, sondern dass jeder Form ein bestimmter Wohnplatz angewiesen ist. Gewisse Familien könnte man nordische, andere wieder tropische nennen, wobei jedoch nicht zu erkennen ist, dass die Grenzen irgend scharf gezogen, sondern sehr ineinander übergehend sind. Die Andromeden, Erizeen, Amantazeen werden häufiger gegen Norden, wogegen andere Pflanzenformen abnehmen und wie die Malvazeen, Leguminosen mit den zahlreichen Kassien und Mimosen, die Rubiazeen, zu denen die wichtige Kinchona officinalis gehört, sich gegen den Äquator hin verbreiten. Auch in Hinsicht auf die Längengrade herrscht eine große Verschiedenheit. Die Vegetation von Nordamerika hat wenig Ähnlichkeit mit der europäischen, und einzelne Pflanzentypen, die sich bei uns in großer Menge finden, scheinen der westlichen Hemisphäre gänzlich zu fehlen. So habe ich unter 5.000 bis 6.000 untersuchten Pflanzen kaum ein bis zwei Formen unserer allverbreiteten Ambelaten und Kruziferen gefunden. Unter den niederen Pflanzenformen gibt es zwar mehrere, welche dem alten und neuen Kontinente gemeinschaftlich zukommen, wie zum Beispiel unter den Moosen sogar dieselbe Spezies sich vorfinden. Aber schon unter den Gräsern ist dies selten der Fall und wenn man an der Magellanschen Meerenge den europäischen gleiche Pflanzentypen zu erkennen glaubte, so hat sich ergeben, dass es ähnliche, aber doch ganz bestimmt zu unterscheidende Spezies sind. Die Rhododendron Razen, welche auf der östlichen Halbkugel mit ihrem prangenden Rot die Schneegrenze der Alpen selbst den Schneegürtel des Himalaya ebenso bestimmt bezeichnen als Schmücken, finden auf dem neuen Kontinente einen Ersatz in den mit ähnlichem Farbenreiz leuchtenden Befarien. 
Über das erste Aufkeimen der organischen Materie herrscht eine große Ungewissheit. Unendlich viel Versuche hat man gemacht über das Entstehen der sogenannten priestlichen Materie, der Infusorien, Oszillatorien, Lamelliten etc., und es hat noch nicht einmal bestimmt werden können, ob diese Uranfänge sich in eine vegetabilische und animalische Masse scheiden lassen oder ob die animalische aus einer großen Anhäufung der vegetabilischen entstehe. Wir erkennen die ersten Pflanzenanfänge in dem sogenannten roten Schnee des Polareises, welcher, aus jenen nördlichen Regionen zu uns gebracht, bei einer Temperatur von 60 bis 70 Grad Reaumur in England und Frankreich ausgehalten hat und dessen Fortpflanzung ich selbst beobachtet habe. Es ist dies eine unendlich kleine Art von Pilzen, früher Uredo, vom großen Robert Brown aber Tremella nivalis genannt, deren rote Farbe von Keimkörnern herrührt, welche, indem sie platzen, vier bis fünf kleine Sporen auf dem Schnee ausstreuen. Wie nun diese auf dem ewigen Polareise wurzeln, so vegetieren andere Pflanzenanfänge, Usneen und Konferven, mitten in den heißen Quellen von 60 bis 70 Grad Reumur. Es gibt kaum einen größeren Kontrast als zwischen diesen mikroskopischen Gegenständen, diesen Anfängen der vegetabilen und animalen Natur und den Riesenprodukten der Tropenwelt, unter denen die Palmen Beispiele des höchsten Pflanzenwuchses gewähren. Die Wachspalmen, welche wir auf dem Andesrücken zwischen Ibage und Karthago in der Montagne de Quindiu entdeckt haben, Tiaraxilon andicola, erreicht eine Höhe von 160 bis 180 Fuß. Die dem Tannengeschlechte verwandte Araucaria excelsa auf den Norfolk-Inseln ist sogar 240 Fuß hoch. Und Dr. Douglas, welche den Captain Franklin auf seiner Landreise gegen den Nordpol begleitete, beschreibt das Riesenexemplar des Pinus canadensis, welchen er an den Quellen des Columbia-Flusses entdeckt hat, in einer Breite, die mit der von Deutschland übereinkommt und dessen ungeheure Höhe er 260 Fuß gemessen hat. Die einzelnen Zapfen des Baumes sind eineinhalb Fuß lang und der Durchmesser, nicht Umfang, des Stammes beträgt 15 Fuß. Bemerkenswert ist es, dass diese ausgezeichneten Formen den Monocotylodonen und den Zapfenbäumen angehören, welche offenbar dem Palmengeschlechte einigermaßen verwandt sind. Beispiele einer merkwürdigen Ausdehnung in die Breite bietet vor allem, noch außer dem kolossalen Drachenbaum Dracanea Draco auf Orotavia, 45 Fuß Umfang, die von Golbery gemessene Adansonia digitata, Boabab, an der Küste von Senegal. Der riesenhafte Baum von 34 Fuß Durchmesser bei 60 Fuß Höhe ist zum Teil ausgehöhlt und dient zum politischen Versammlungssaal einer ganzen kleinen Völkerschaft. Ein ähnlicher Kontrast, wie im Allgemeinen die mikroskopische Kleinheit und die riesenmäßige Größe einiger Gewächse darbietet, findet auch statt in Rücksicht auf die Größe und das Verhältnis der Teile. Die größte bekannte Blüte trägt die Rafflesia, deren Blume einen Durchmesser von dreieinhalb Fuß hat und deren Kronenblätter drei Viertel Zoll dick sind. Dr. Arnold, der Begleiter des Sir Raffles, des Gouverneurs von Ben Coolen, hat diese kolossale Blume, deren Gewicht 15 Kilogramm beträgt, zuerst auf Java entdeckt. Diese Blüte gehört einer parasitischen Pflanze an, welche keine Blätter trägt und sich um die Wurzeln der Zissusarten schlingt. Sie prangt mit der schönsten roten Farbe und hat einen wunderbar auffallenden Geruch nach gekochtem Rindfleisch. An den schattigen Ufern des Magdalenenflusses habe ich eine rankende Aristolochia gefunden, deren Blume von vier Fuß Umfang sich die kleinen Indianer bei ihren Spielen über die Scheitel ziehen. Die Zahl der auf dem Erdboden verbreiteten Pflanzen ist natürlich unbekannt. Marys Ausgabe des linnäischen Systems enthält, die Kryptogamen mitgerechnet, nur 10.000 Spezies. Wildenow hat bereits die Zahl von 20.000 Arten angegeben. Neuere Untersuchungen haben gezeigt, wie tief diese Schätzung der beschriebenen und in den Herbarien aufbewahrten Arten unter der Wahrheit zurückgeblieben ist. Das größte Herbarium auf der Welt hat Herr Lambert in England zusammengebracht, der 35.000 Spezies besitzt, 
unter diesen 30.000 Phanerogamen. De Candol findet, dass man in den Schriften der Botaniker und in europäischen Herbarien zusammen über 60.000 Pflanzenarten antreffen würde. Wenn man bedenkt, dass allein in den botanischen Gärten, unter denen der hiesige, der Stolz unserer Hauptstadt, von allen in Europa der reichste ist, zusammen gewiss über 16.000 Phanerogamen kultiviert werden, so ist man geneigt, Herrn de Candols Angabe noch für zu gering zu halten. Von meiner Reise allein habe ich über 3000 neue Spezies zurückgebracht. Wie bedeutend ist dies Ergebnis im Vergleich mit den überhaupt bekannten 60.000 Arten? Bei unserer völligen Unbekanntschaft mit dem Inneren von Südamerika, Mato Grosso, Paraguay, Buenos Aires, aller Länder zwischen dem Orinoco und dem Amazonenfluss, mit Inner- und Ostasien, Tibet, dem nördlichen Abhange des Himalaya, China, Malaka, mit Afrika, in dem uns Clapperton schön bewässerte Landstriche aufschließt, drängt sich unwillkürlich der Gedanke auf, dass wir noch nicht den dritten, ja wahrscheinlich nicht den fünften Teil der auf der Erde existierenden Gewächse kennen. Diese Betrachtungen bewahren gleichsam den alten Mythos des Zendavesta, als habe die schaffende Urkraft aus dem heiligen Stierblut 120.000 Pflanzengestalten hervorgerufen. Ende des achten Kosmosvortrages von Alexander von Humboldt Gelesen von Avai. Gib Acht von Sidonie grünwald zerkowitz This is recorded to celebrate the 8th anniversary of LibriVox. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Gib Acht Unsere Freundschaft ist ein Brücklein, ohne Brüstung, Schmal und Schwank. Drunter stürzt der liebe Wildbach, drein mein Herz vom Brücklein sank. Angstvoll reich ich dir die Hände, gib nun Acht auf jeden Schritt. Trägt das Brücklein dich, trägt's mich auch, fällst hinein du, fall ich mit. End of Gib Acht von Sidonie grünwald zerkowitz Red by Ellie in April 2013「The Serpent with Eight Heads」by B. H. Chamberlain This is recorded to celebrate the eighth anniversary of LibriVox. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Did you ever hear the story of the eight-headed serpent? If not, I will tell it to you. It is rather a long one, and we must go a good way back to get to the beginning of it. In fact, we must go back to the beginning of the world. After the world had been created, it became the property of a very powerful fairy. And when this fairy was about to die, he divided it between his two boys and his girl. The girl, called Emma, was given the son, the eldest boy, called Susano, was given the sea, and the second boy, whose name I forget, was given the moon. Well, the moon boy behaved himself properly, and you can still see his jolly round face on a clear night when the moon is full. But Susano was very angry and disappointed at having nothing but the cold wet sea to live in. So up he rushed into the sky, burst into the beautiful room inside the sun, where his sister was sitting with her maidens, weaving gold and silver dresses, broke their spindles, trampled upon their work, and, in short, did all the mischief he could, and frightened the poor maids to death. As for Emma, she ran away as fast as she could, and hid herself in a cave on the side of a mountain full of rocks and crags. When she had got into the cave and had shut the door, the whole world became pitch dark, for she was the fairy who ruled the sun, and could make it shine or not as she chose. In fact, some people say that the light of the sun is really nothing else than the brightness of her own bright eyes. Anyhow, there was great trouble over her disappearance. What was to be done to make the world light again? All sorts of plans were tried. At last, knowing that she was curious, and always liked to see everything that was going on, the other fairies got up a dance outside the door of the cave. When Emma heard the noise of the dancing and singing and laughing, she could not help opening the door a tiny bit, in order to peep through the chink at the fun the other fairies were having. This was just what they had been watching for. Look here, 
cried they. Look at this new fairy more beautiful than yourself. And therewith they thrust forward a mirror. Emma did not know that the face in the mirror was only the reflection of her own, and more and more curious to know who the new fairy could be, she ventured outside the door, where she was caught hold of by the other fairies, who piled up the entrance of the cave with big rocks, so that no one could ever go into it again. Seeing that she had been tricked into coming out of the cave, and that there was no use in sulking any longer, Emma agreed to go back to the sun and shine upon the world as before provided her brother were punished and sent away in disgrace. For really he was not safe to live with. This was done. Sousa was beaten to within an inch of his life, and expelled from the society of the other fairies, with orders never to show himself again. So poor Sousa, having been turned out of fairyland, was obliged to come down to the earth. While walking one day on the bank of a river, he happened to see an old man and an old woman with their arms round their young daughter, and crying bitterly. "'What is the matter?' asked Sousa. "'Oh,' said they, their voice choked with sobs, "'we used to have eight daughters. But in a marsh near our hut there lives a huge eight-headed serpent, who comes out once every year and eats one of them up.' We have now only one daughter left, and today is the day when the serpent will come to eat her, and then we shall have none. Please, good sir, can you not do something to help us? Of course, answered Sousa. It will be quite easy. Do not be sad any longer. I am a fairy, and I will save your daughter. So he told them to brew some beer, and showed them how to make a fence with eight gates in it and a wooden stand inside each gate, and a large vat of beer on each stand. This they did, and just as all had been arranged in the way Sousa had bidden them, the serpent came. So huge was he, that his body trained over eight hills and eight valleys as he wriggled along. But as he had eight heads, he also had eight noses, which made him able to smell eight times as quickly as any other creature. So smelling the beer from afar off, he at once glided towards it, went inside the fence, dipped one of his heads into each of the eight vats, and drank and drank and drank, till he got quite tipsy. Then all his heads dropped down fast asleep, and Sousa, jumping up from the hole where he had lain hidden, drew his sword and cut them all off. He cut the body to pieces too. But, strange to say, when cutting the tail, the blade of his sword snapped. It had struck against something hard. As the serpent was now dead, there was no danger in going up to it and finding out what the hard thing was. It turned out to be itself a sword, all set with precious stones, the most beautiful sword you ever saw. Sousa took the sword and married the beautiful young girl, and he was very kind to her although he had been so rude to his elder sister. They spent the rest of their lives in a beautiful palace, which was built on purpose for them, and the old father and mother lived there too. When the old father and mother and Sousa and his wife had all died, the sword was handed down to their children and grandchildren, and it now belongs to the emperor of Japan, who looks upon it as one of his most precious treasures. End of the Serpent with Eight Heads by B. H. Chamberlain Read by Amy Graymore August 8th From Book of Meditations and Thoughts for the Day For Every Day in the Year By James Allen This is recorded to celebrate the 8th anniversary of LibriVox. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information... Or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Algie Pug. August 8th. Thought for the Morning. Man is made or unmade by himself. In the armory of thought, he forges the weapons by which he destroys himself. He also fashions the tools with which he builds for himself heavenly mansions of joy and strength and peace. By the right choice and true application of thought, man ascends to the divine perfection. By the abuse and wrong application of thought, he descends below the level of the beast. 
Between these two extremes are all the grades of character, and man is their maker and master. As a being of power, intelligence, and love, and the lord of his own thoughts, man holds the key to every situation. Meditation for the day To become possessed of a knowledge of the law of love, to enter into conscious harmony with it, is to become immortal, invincible, indestructible. It is because of the effort of the soul to realise this law that men come again and again to live, to suffer, and to die, and, when realised, suffering ceases, personality is dispersed, and the fleshly life and death are destroyed, for consciousness becomes one with the eternal. The law is absolutely impersonal, and its highest manifested expression is that of service. When the purified heart has realised truth, it is then called upon to make the last, the greatest and holiest sacrifice, the sacrifice of the well-earned enjoyment of truth. It is by virtue of this sacrifice that the divinely emancipated soul comes to dwell amongst the lowliest and least, and to be esteemed the servant of all mankind. The spirit of love is alone singled out as worthy to receive the unstinted worship of posterity. Thought for the Evening Whatsoever you harbour in the inmost chambers of your heart will, sooner or later, by the inevitable law of reaction, shape itself in your outward life. Every soul attracts its own, and nothing can possibly come to it that does not belong to it. To realise this is to recognise the universality of divine law. If thou wouldst right the world, and banish all its evils and its woes, make its wild places bloom, and its drear deserts blossom as the rose, then write thyself. End of August 8th From Book of Meditations and Thoughts for the Day, for Every Day in the Year By James Allen Bunyan's Last Sermon Preached 1688 by John Bunyan. This is recorded to celebrate the eighth anniversary of LibriVox. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Algie Pug. Bunyan's Last Sermon, preached July 1688. Which were born not of blood, nor by the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. John 1, 13 The words have a dependence on what goes before, and therefore I must direct you to them for the right understanding of it. You have it thus. He came to his own, but his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them which believe on his name which were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, but of God. In the words before, you have two things. First, some of his own rejecting him when he offered himself to them. Secondly, some of his own receiving him and making him welcome. Those that reject him he also passes by, but those that receive him he gives them power to become the sons of God. Now, lest any one should look upon it as good luck or fortune, says he. They were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. They that did not receive him, they were only born of flesh and blood, but those that receive him, they have God to their father. They receive the doctrine of Christ with a vehement desire. First, I will show you what he means by blood. They that believe are born to it, as an heir is to an inheritance. They are born of God, not of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God, not of blood, that is, not by generation, not born to the kingdom of heaven by the flesh, not because I am the son of a godly man or woman. That is meant by blood. Acts 17.26 
he is made of one blood all nations but when he says here not of blood he rejects all carnal privileges they did boast of they boasted they were abraham's seed no no says he it is not of blood think not to say you have abraham to your father you must be born of god if you go to the kingdom of heaven secondly nor of the will of the flesh what must we understand by that it is taken for those vehement inclinations that are in man to all manner of looseness fulfilling the desires of the flesh that must not be understood here men are made the children of god by fulfilling their lustful desires it must be understood here in the best sense there is not only in carnal men a will to be vile but there is in them a will to be saved also a will to go to heaven also but this it will not do it will not privilege a man in the things of the kingdom of god natural desires after the things of another world they are not an argument to prove a man shall go to heaven whenever he dies i am not a free willer i do abhor it yet there is not the wickedest man but he desires some time or other to be saved he will read some time or other or it may be pray but this will not do it is not in him that wills nor in him that runs but in god that shows mercy there is willing and running and yet to no purpose romans nine sixteen israel which followed after the law of righteousness have not obtained it here i do not understand as if the apostle had denied a virtuous course of life to be the way to heaven but that a man without grace though he have natural gifts yet he shall not obtain privilege to go to heaven and be the son of god though a man without grace may have a will to be saved yet he cannot have that will god's way nature it cannot know anything but the things of nature the things of god knows no man but by the spirit of god unless the spirit of god be in you it will leave you on this side the gates of heaven not of blood nor of the will of the flesh nor of the will of man but of god it may be some may have a will a desire that ishmael may be saved know this it will not save thy child if it were our will i would have you all go to heaven how many are there in the world that pray for their children and cry for them and ready to die and this will not do god's will is the rule of all it is only through jesus christ which were born not of flesh not of the will of man but of god now i come to the doctrine men that believe in jesus christ to the effectual receiving of jesus christ they are born to it he does not say they shall be born to it but they are born to it born of god unto god and the things of god before they receive god to eternal salvation except a man be born again he cannot see the kingdom of god now unless he be born of god he cannot see it suppose the kingdom of god be what it will he cannot see it before he be begotten of god suppose it be the gospel he cannot see it before he be brought into a state of regeneration believing is the consequence of the new birth not of blood nor of the will of man but of god first i will give you a clear description of it under one similitude or two a child before it be born into the world is in the dark dungeon of its mother's womb so a child of god before he be born again is in the dark dungeon of sin sees nothing of the kingdom of god therefore it is called a new birth the same soul has love one way in its carnal condition another way when it is born again secondly as it is compared to a birth resembling a child in his mother's womb so it is compared to a man being raised out of the grave and to be born again is to be raised out of the grave of sin awake thou that sleepest and arise from the dead and christ shall give thee life to be raised from the grave of sin is to be begotten and born revelations one five 
There is a famous instance of Christ. He is the first begotten from the dead. He is the first born from the dead, under which our regeneration alludeth. That is, if you will be born again by seeking those things that are above, then there is a similitude betwixt Christ's resurrection and the new birth, which were born, which were restored out of this dark world, and translated out of the kingdom of this dark world, into the kingdom of his dear Son, and made us live a new life. This is to be born again, and he that is delivered from the mother's womb, it is the help of the mother. So he that is born of God, it is by the Spirit of God. I must give you a few consequences of new birth. First of all, a child, you know, is incident to cry as soon as it comes into the world, for if there be no noise, they say, it is dead. You that are born of God, and Christians, if you be not criers, there is no spiritual life in you. If you be born of God, you are crying ones. As soon as he had raised you out of the dark dungeon of sin, you cannot but cry to God, What must I do to be saved? As soon as ever God had touched the jailer, he cries out, Men and brethren, what must I do to be saved? Oh, how many prayerless professors are there in London that never pray? Coffee houses will not let you pray. Trades will not let you pray. Looking glasses will not let you pray. But if you were born of God, you would. Secondly, it is not only natural for a child to cry, but it must crave the breast. It cannot live without the breast. Therefore Peter makes it the true trial of a newborn babe. The newborn babe desires the sincere milk of the word, that he may grow thereby. If you be born of God, make it manifest by desiring the breast of God. Do you long for the milk of promises? A man lives one way when he is in the world, another way when he is brought unto Jesus Christ. Isaiah chapter 66 They shall suck and be satisfied. If you be born again, there is no satisfaction till you get the milk of God's word into your souls. Isaiah 66, 11. To suck and be satisfied with the breasts of consolation. Oh, what is a promise to a carnal man? A whorehouse, it may be, is more sweet to him. But if you be born again, you cannot live without the milk of God's word. What is a woman's breast to a horse? But what is it to a child? There is its comfort night and day. There is its succour night and day. Oh, how loath is he it should be taken from him. Minding heavenly things, says a carnal man, is but vanity. But to a child of God, there is his comfort. Thirdly, a child that is newly born, if it have not other comforts to keep it warm than it had in its mother's womb, it dies. It must have something got for its succour. So Christ had swaddling clothes prepared for him. So those that are born again, they must have some promise of Christ to keep them alive. Those that are in a carnal state, they warm themselves with other things. But those that are born again, they cannot live without some promise of Christ to keep them alive, as he did to the poor infant in Ezekiel 17. I covered thee with embroidered gold. And when women are with child, what fine things will they prepare for their child? Oh, but what fine things has Christ prepared to wrap all in that are born again? Oh, what wrappings of gold has Christ prepared for all that are born again? Women will dress their children, that everyone may see how fine they are. So he, in Ezekiel 16.11, I decked thee also with ornaments, and I also put bracelets upon thine hands, and a chain upon thy neck, and I put a jewel upon thy forehead, and earrings in thine ears, and a beautiful crown upon thine head. And, says he in the thirteenth verse, thou didst prosper to a kingdom. This is to set out nothing in the world but the righteousness of Christ, and the graces of the Spirit, without which a newborn babe cannot live, 
unless he have the golden righteousness of Christ. Fourthly, a child, when it is in its mother's lap, the mother takes great delight to have that which shall be for its comfort. So it is with God's children. They shall be kept on his knees. Isaiah 66.11 They shall suck and be satisfied with the breasts of her consolation. Verse 13 As one whom his mother comforteth, so will I comfort you. There is a similitude in these things that nobody knows of but those that are born again. Fifthly, there is usually some similitude betwixt the father and the child. It may be the child looks like its father. So those that are born again, they have a new similitude. They have the image of Jesus Christ. Galatians 4 Every one that is born of God has something of the features of heaven upon him. Men love those children that are likest them most usually. So does God his children. Therefore they are called the children of God. But others do not look like him. Therefore they are called Sodomites. Christ described children of the devil by their features. The children of the devil, his works they will do. All works of unrighteousness, they are the devil's works. If you are earthly, you have borne the image of the earthly. If heavenly, you have borne the image of the heavenly. Sixthly, when a man has a child, he trains him up to his own liking. He learns the customs of his father's house. So are those that are born of God. They have learned the custom of the true church of God. There they learn to cry, My father and my God. They are brought up in God's house. They learn the method and form of God's house for regulating their lives in this world. Seventhly, children, it is natural for them to depend upon their father for what they want. If they want a pair of shoes, they go and tell him. If they want bread, they go and tell him. So should the children of God do. Do you want spiritual bread? Go tell God of it. Do you want strength of grace? Ask it of God. Do you want strength against Satan's temptations? Go and tell God of it. When the devil tempts you, run home and tell your heavenly Father, Go, pour out your complaints to God. This is natural to children. If any wrong them, they go and tell their Father. So do those that are born of God, when they meet with temptations, go and tell God of them. The first use is this to make a strict inquiry whether you be born of God or not. Examine by those things I laid down before of a child of nature and a child of grace. Are you brought out of the dark dungeon of this world into Christ? Have you learned to cry, My Father? Jeremiah 3.16 And I said, Thou shalt call me thy Father. All God's children are criers. Can you be quiet without you have a belly full of the milk of God's word? Can you be satisfied without you have peace with God? Pray you consider it, and be serious with yourselves, if you have not these marks. You will fall short of the kingdom of God. You shall never have an interest there. There is no intruding. They will say, Lord, Lord, open to us. And he will say, I know you not. No child of God, no heavenly inheritance. We sometimes give something to those that are not our children, but not our lands. Oh, do not flatter yourselves with a portion among the sons, unless you live like sons. When we see a king's son play with a beggar, this is unbecoming. So if you be the king's children, live like the king's children. If you be risen with Christ, set your affections on things above, and not on things below. When you come together, talk of what your father promised you. You should all love your father's will, and be content and pleased with the exercises you meet with in the world. If you are the children of God, live together lovingly. If the world quarrel with you, it is no matter, but it is sad if you quarrel together. If this be amongst you, it is a sign of ill-breeding, it is not according to rules you have in the word of God. 
Dost thou see a soul that has the image of God in him? Love him, love him. Say, this man and I must go to heaven one day. Serve one another, do good for one another, and if any wrong you, pray to God to right you, and love the brotherhood. Lastly, if you be the children of God, learn that lesson. Gird up the loins of your mind as obedient children, not fashioning yourself according to your former conversation, but be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Consider that the holy God is your Father, and let this oblige you to live like the children of God, that you may look your Father in the face with comfort another day. End of Bunyan's Last Sermon Preached 1688 By John Bunyan Eight Lectures by Shami Bibi Kananda Delivered in New York City in the winter of 1895 and 1896 Chapter 5 We Help Ourselves, Not the World Pages 28 through 31 This is recorded to celebrate the 8th anniversary of LibriVox. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. We help ourselves, not the world. Our duty to others means helping others, doing good to the world. Why should we do good to the world? Apparently, to help the world, but really, to help ourselves. We should always try to help the world. That should be the highest motive power in us. But when we analyze it properly, we shall find that this world does not require our help. This world was not made that you or I should come and help it. I once read a sermon in which was said, All this beautiful world is very good, because it gives us time and opportunity to help others. Apparently it was a very beautiful sentiment, but in one sense it was a curse. For is it not a blasphemy to say that the world needs our help? We cannot deny that there is much misery in it. To go out and help others is, therefore, the highest motive power we have. Although in the long run, we shall find that it is only helping ourselves. As a boy, I had some white mice. They were kept in a little box and had little wheels made for them. And when the mice tried to cross the wheels, the wheels turned and turned, and the mice never got anywhere. So with the world, and our helping it. The only help is that you get exercise. This world is neither good nor evil. Each man manufactures a world for himself. If a blind man begins to think of it, it is either as soft or hard or cold or hot. We are a mass of happiness or misery. We have seen that hundreds of times in our lives. As a rule, the young are optimistic and the old pessimistic. The young have all life before them, and the old are complaining. Their day is gone. Hundreds of desires, which they cannot fulfill, are struggling in their brain. Life is at an end for them. Both are foolish. This life is neither good nor evil. It is according to the different states of mind in which we look at the world. The most practical man would neither call it good nor evil. Fire by itself is neither good nor evil. When it keeps us warm, we say, how beautiful is fire. When it burns our fingers, we blame the fire. Still, it was neither good nor bad. As we use it, it produces that feeling of good or bad. And so is this world. It is perfect. By perfection is meant that it is perfectly fitted to meet its ends. We can all be perfectly sure that it will go on and need not bother our heads wanting to help it. Yet we must do good. It is the highest motive power we have, knowing all the time it is a privilege to help. 
do not stand on a pedestal and take five cents and say here my poor man but be grateful that the poor man is there so that by giving to him you are able to help yourself it is not the receiver that is blessed but the giver be thankful that you are allowed to exercise your power of benevolence and mercy in the world and thus become pure and perfect all good acts tend to make us pure and perfect what can we do at best build a hospital make roads or erect charity asylums we may organize a charity and collect two or three millions of dollars build a hospital with one with the second give balls and drink champagne and of the third let the officers steal half and the rest may finally reach the poor but what are these one mighty wind in five minutes can break it all up what shall we do then one volcanic eruption can sweep away all our roads and hospitals and cities and buildings let us give up all this foolish talk of doing good to the world it is not waiting for your or my help yet we must work and constantly do good because it is a blessing to ourselves that is the only way we can become perfect no beggar ever owed a single cent to us we owe everything to him because he has allowed us to exercise our powers of pity and charity on him it is entirely wrong to think that we have done or can do good to the world or have helped such and such people it is a foolish thought and all foolish thoughts bring misery we think we have helped someone and expect him to thank us and because he does not unhappiness comes to us why expect anything if we were really unattached we shall escape all this pain of vain expectation and could do good work in the world never will unhappiness or misery come through work done without attachment this world will go on with its happiness and misery through eternity there was a poor man who wanted some money and somehow he had heard that if he could get hold of a ghost or some spirit he could command him to bring money or anything he liked so he was very anxious to get hold of a ghost he went about searching for a man who would give him a ghost and at last he found a sage with great powers and besought this sage to help him the sage asked him what he would do with a ghost i want a ghost to work for me teach me how to get hold of one sir i desire it very much replied the man but the sage said don't disturb yourself go home the next day the man went again to the sage and began to weep and pray give me a ghost i must have a ghost sir to help me at last the sage was disgusted and said take this charm repeat this magic word and a ghost will come and whatever you say to this ghost he will do but beware they are terrible beings and must be kept continually busy if you fail to give him work he will take your life the man replied that's easy i can give him work for all his life then he went to a forest and after long repetition of the magic word a huge ghost appeared before him with big teeth and said i am a ghost i have been conquered by your magic but you must keep me constantly employed the moment you stop i will kill you the man said build me a palace and the ghost said it is done the palace is built bring me money said the man here is your money said the ghost cut this forest down and build a city in its place that is done said the ghost anything more now the man began to be frightened and said i can give him nothing more to do he does everything in a trice the ghost said give me something to do or i will eat you up the poor man could find no further occupation for him and was frightened so he ran and ran and at last reached the sage and said 
Oh, sir, protect my life. The sage asked him what was the matter, and the man replied, I have nothing to give the ghost to do. Everything I tell him to do, he does in a moment, and he threatens to eat me up if I do not give him work. Just then the ghost arrived, saying, I'll eat you up, I'll eat you up, and he would have swallowed the man. The man began to shake and begged the sage to save his life. The sage said, I will find you a way out. Look at that dog with a curly tail. Draw your sword quickly and cut the tail off and give it to the ghost to straighten out. The man cut off the dog's tail and gave it to the ghost, saying, Straighten that out for me. The ghost took it and slowly and carefully straightened it out. But as soon as he let go, it instantly curled up again. Once more he laboriously straightened it out, only to find it again curled up as soon as he attempted to let go of it. Again he patiently straightened it out, but as soon as he let it go, it curled up again. So he went on for days and days, until he was exhausted, and said, I was never in such trouble before in my life. I am an old veteran ghost, but never before was I in such trouble. I will make compromise with you, he said to the man. You let me off, and I will let you keep all I have given you, and will promise not to harm you. The man was much pleased and accepted the offer gladly. This world is that dog's curly tail, and people have been striving to straighten it out for hundreds of years. But when they let go, it curls up again. How can it be otherwise? One must first know how to work without attachment. Then he will not be a fanatic. When we know that this world is like a dog's curly tail and will never straighten, we shall not become fanatics. They can never do real work. If there were no fanaticism in the world, it would make much more progress than it does now. It is all silly nonsense to think that fanaticism makes for the progress of mankind. It is, instead, a retarding block by making hatred and anger and causing people to fight each other and making them unsympathetic. Whatever we do or possess, we think the best in the world, and those things we do not possess are of no value. So always remember this curly tail of the dog whenever you have a tendency to become a fanatic. You need not worry or make yourself sleepless. The world will go on. When you have avoided fanaticism, then alone will you work well. It is the level-headed man, the calm man, of good judgment and cool nerves, of great sympathy and love, who does good work. The fanatic has no sympathy. End of Eight Lectures by Shami Bibikananda Delivered in New York City, 1895-1896 Chapter 5 We Help Ourselves, Not the World Pages 28 through 31. The Address of Oscar Nieb from The Chicago Martyrs, The Famous Speeches of the Eight Anarchists in Judge Gary's Court, October 7th, 8th, 9th, 1886, and Reasons for Pardoning Fielden, Nieb, and Schwab by John P. Altgeld, ex-governor of Illinois. This is recorded to celebrate the 8th anniversary of LibriVox. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Address of Oscar Neeb Your Honor, I have found out during the last few days what law is. Before, I didn't know. I did not know before that I was convicted because I knew Spees and Fielden and Parsons. I have met these gentlemen. I have presided in a mass meeting, as the evidence against me shows, held in the Turner Hall, at which meeting your honor was invited to appear. The judges, 
the preachers the newspaper men and everybody in fact were invited to appear at that meeting for the purpose of discussing anarchism and socialism i was at that hall i am well known among the working men of this city and i was elected chairman of that meeting none of the representatives of the capitalistic system came forward to speak to discuss the questions of labor and anarchism or socialism with laboring men no they couldn't stand it i was chairman of that meeting i don't deny it i also on one occasion had the honor to be marshal of a labor demonstration in this city and i never saw a more respectable lot of men than on that day they marched like soldiers and i am proud that i was marshal of those men they were the toilers and the working men of this city the men marched through the streets to protest against the wrongs of society and i was marshal of them if that is a crime then i have found out as a native free-born american of what i have been guilty i always supposed i had a right to express my opinion as the chairman of a peaceable meeting and to be marshal of a labor demonstration was it a crime to be marshal of that demonstration i am convicted for that on the morning of the fifth of may your honor on the road to my business i heard that august spees and michael schwab were arrested i was in the yeast business i peddled my yeast through the southern part of the city i was informed that they were arrested that was the first time i learned that there had been a mass meeting held at the haymarket the day before after i was done with my business and drove home i stopped at the arbiter zeitung to see what was going on and i met there mrs parsons and mrs holmes and a couple of boys of the arbiter zeitung they explained to me that the men were arrested just as i was going to speak to mrs parsons about it up rushed a lot of pirates called detectives of chicago men you could see the rum and ignorance in their faces mostly picked up from among the ruffians of the streets of chicago i never saw a rougher set well i don't wish to make any further remarks about these honorable pirates mayor harrison was with these pirates he came in and he says who is the manager of this paper here the two boys couldn't speak english and i knew harrison so i said harrison what is it well he says i want to have this thing stopped there won't be any more inflammable articles allowed in this paper said i mr harrison i will sit here and read the articles and see that there won't be anything inflammatory in this day's issue our compositors were not arrested at that time so harrison said to me i will go to the house and send mr hand over here i knew him and both of us together revised all the articles printed in the paper that day a few minutes later harrison went out and our whole set of compositors was coming down the stairs and another lot of ruffians came up the steps and mrs holmes and mrs parsons were sitting at the desk writing and a man whom you could see was a noble democratic officer said what are you doing there mrs holmes is a lady in my eyes and she said i am corresponding with my brother he is the editor of a labor paper as she said that he snatched the lady and she protested as an american woman and as she protested he said shut up you bitch or i will knock you down i repeat the same words here and i have a right to as the noble officers of chicago have used this language that is one of your men mr grinnell just like you you have insulted ladies when you have not dared to insult gentlemen mrs parsons was called the same name by the officers they called her a black bitch and wanted to knock her down and they said they would not let us publish any paper they would take the types and material and throw them out the window we are a stock company a company chartered by the state of illinois for the publication of a labor paper and labor literature our charter states it 
when i heard they wanted to destroy the property of the laboring men of the city of chicago who had paid their money to have the paper published i said as long as i stand i shall publish that paper and took charge of it i suppose grinnell thought that after oscar neeb was indicted for murder the arbiter zeitung would go down but it didn't happen that way and mr firthman too pointing to the assistant state's attorney he is a scoundrel and i tell it to you to your face there is only one man that acted as a gentleman and he is mr ingham but you three have not inside of two weeks i had enough money from the toilers from hired girls from men who would take their last cent out of their pockets to re-establish the paper and to buy a press of our own i could not publish the paper sooner because the honorable detectives and mr grinnell followed us up and no printing house would print our paper because of the threats of these men and we had to have our own press we published our own paper after we had a press purchased with the money contributed by the working men of the city that is the crime i have committed getting men to try and establish a working man's paper that stands today and i am proud of it they have not got one press simply they have two presses today and they belong to the working men of this city from the date of the first issue to the present day your honor we have gained four thousand subscribers to our daily paper there are the gentlemen sitting over there from the free press and stadt zeitung they know it the germans of this city are condemning these actions i say that it is a verdict against germans and i as an american must say that i never saw anything like that these are the crimes i have committed after the fourth of may before the fourth of may i committed some other crimes my business brought me in connection with the bakers i saw that the bakers in this city were treated like dogs the baker bosses treated their dogs better than they treated their men i said to myself these men have to be organized in organization there is strength and i helped to organize them that is a great crime the men are now working ten hours a day instead of fourteen and sixteen hours and instead of being compelled to eat slops like the dogs and sleep on the stairways or in the barn they can sleep and work whenever they please i have helped to establish that your honor that is another crime and i committed a greater crime than that i saw in the morning when i drove away with my team that the beer brewers of the city of chicago went to work at four o'clock in the morning they came home at seven and eight o'clock at night they never saw their families or their children by daylight i said to myself if you organize these men they can live like men you can help to make good citizens of them and everyone said they are down low they are drunkards i went to work and organized them i rented a hall and issued an appeal for them and got them to come and i organized the men on saturday may first or may second i was conferring with the beer brewer bosses of chicago and we had a meeting i was the chairman of the committee and i asked the beer brewer bosses to reduce the hours of labor down to ten hours a day and they did it on the monday after i committed that great crime that was saturday i was in session with the beer brewers the whole day in the evening i took my supper and went to the north side turner hall where the union men over eight hundred strong were and i don't know anything about mccormick's or what spees had done or said i entered the hall i went to the platform and presented the union with a document signed by every beer brewer of chicago guaranteeing ten hours labor and sixty-five dollars wages 
fifteen dollars more wages per month and no sunday work to give the men a chance to go to church as many of them are good christians there are a good many christians among them so in that way i was aiding christianity helping the men to go to church after the meeting i left the hall and stepped into the front saloon and there were circulars lying there called the revenge circular i picked up a couple of them from a table and folded them together and put them in my pocket not having a chance to read them because everybody wanted to treat me they all thought it was by my efforts that they got fifteen dollars a month more wages and ten hours a day why i didn't have a chance to read the circulars from there i went to another saloon across the street and the president of the beer brewers union was there he asked me to walk with him and on the way home we went into heine's saloon he was talking to heine about the mccormick affair and i picked up a circular and read it and heine asked me can you give me one i gave him one and he laid it back on the counter that is my statement you can believe it or not but heine didn't testify any other way mr grinnell indicted me for murder that is the whole story in short of what i had to do with this haymarket affair so you see i had nothing to do with it and didn't know anything about it the next day i read in the paper that attorney walker certainly an honorable man was in the saloon it was kind of dangerous for him evidently for he subsequently denied being there however that may have been i was there and your honor i committed another crime i saw that the grocery clerks and other clerks of this city worked until ten and eleven o'clock in the evening i issued a call and rented a hall and paid for the handbills and called them together and today they are working only until seven o'clock in the evening and no sunday work that is a great crime i have committed in your sight i saved for the men from four to five hours a day i have saved the bakers from six to eight hours work a day and that gives them time for education we socialists are great believers that the laboring men should educate themselves not to be ignoramuses as some people express themselves as ignorant anarchists are we are great friends of education and a reduction of the hours of labor a reduction of the hours of labor was my principal aim and i have done some good work to bring it about i have been in the labor movement since eighteen sixty five i have seen how the police have trodden on the constitution of this country and crushed the labor organizations i have seen from year to year how they were trodden down where they were shot down where they were driven into their holes like rats as mr grinnell said to the jury but they will come out remember that within three years before the beginning of the french revolution when laws had been stretched like rubber that the rubber stretched too long and broke a result which cost a good many states attorneys and a good many honorable men their necks we socialists hope such times may never come again we do everything in our power to prevent it such as reducing the hours of labor and increasing wages but you capitalists won't allow this to be done you use your power to perpetuate a system by which you make your money for yourselves and keep the wage workers poor you make them ignorant and miserable and you are responsible for it you won't let the toilers live a decent life we want to educate the masses and keep them back from destroying life and property but we are not able to hold the masses when starvation brings them out of their holes like rats i have walked along the streets of this city and i have seen the rats come from their holes by the hundreds in the basements where men pay five and ten cents for lodgings i have seen the miserable wretches there in the day begging for a piece of bread and in the night they lie there in the air that was difficult to breathe 
I have been in there at ten, twelve, and two o'clock at night, and when those rats are let out of their holes and get desperate, I would not like to be near them. The time will come that you will see them. You rich men don't want the poor educated. You don't want anybody to be educated. You want to keep them down in the mud so you can squeeze the last drop of blood out of their bones. We asked the capitalists once at a meeting to discuss the question of labor, and Mr. Gary was invited, and each one of them was invited, and nobody appeared. They didn't want to discuss the question. They didn't care for it. What is the next question? No discussion, more Gatling guns, more militia, and 300 more police. For what? To catch the thieves? I read the daily papers and see that burglaries are taking place all over the city, but I don't see that they catch any. There are some 1,200-odd policemen in the city of Chicago, and every day so many burglaries. Maybe they need them to make a case sometimes, and they don't arrest them. But when it comes to arresting a poor working man, they are all there. On May 9th, when I came home, my wife, who is delicate, told me that the patrol wagon with 25 police came to search my house. I must be a very dangerous man to require so many police. They searched the whole house, and they found a revolver, that is a deadly weapon and a dangerous weapon. I don't think anybody have revolvers but anarchists and socialists and labor agitators. They found a red flag, too, a flag of that size, about a foot square, that my little boy played with and my wife used at a masquerade ball. My wife told me that when the police, these honorable men who protect law and order, got on the wagon, they waved that flag and hollered and hurrahed just like a lot of wild Indians, and they were wild Indians in those days. They searched hundreds of houses, and money was stolen, and watches were stolen, and nobody knew whether they were stolen by the police or not. Nobody but Captain Shack. He knows it. His gang was one of the worst in this city. You need not laugh about it, Captain Shack. You are one of them. You are an anarchist, as you understand it. You are all anarchists in this sense of the word, I must say. Well, these are all the crimes I have committed. They found a revolver in my house and a red flag there. I organized trades unions. I was for reduction of the hours of labor and the education of the laboring men and the re-establishment of the Arbiter Zeitung, the working man's newspaper. There is no evidence to show that I was connected with the bomb-throwing, or that I was near it, or anything of that kind. So, I will ask you to hang me too, for I think it is more honorable to die suddenly than to be killed by inches. I have a family and children and if they know their father is dead, they will bury him. They can go to the grave and kneel down by the side of it. But they can't go to the penitentiary and see their father, who was convicted for a crime that he hadn't anything to do with. That is all I have got to say. Your Honor, I am sorry I am not to be hung with the rest of the men. End of Address of Oscar Neeb from the Chicago Martyrs, the famous speeches of the eight anarchists in Judge Gary's court, October 7th, 8th, 9th, 1886, and Reasons for Pardoning Fielden, Neeb, and Schwab by John P. Altgeld, ex-governor of Illinois, read by Sue Anderson.